If the appeal has opposition, the board will then hear from those parties. After the opposition presents its testimony, the appellant will have a period for rebuttal. Under the BZA rules, the appellant has 10 minutes for presentation if no opposition is present. In contested cases, BZA rules allow for 15 minutes for each side to present its testimony. Should the appellant wish to provide rebuttal testimony, the appellant should reserve some portion of the allotted 15 minutes. At the conclusion of each hearing, the board will deliberate and then vote on the case. The board is vested with the power to act on these cases under the provisions of the Metropolitan Zoning Code codified at 17.40.180. All section numbers that we refer to come from the Metropolitan Zoning Code, which applies to the entire jurisdiction of the Metropolitan Government. The Zoning Code was adopted by the Metro Council and became effective on January 1, 1998. I will introduce the entire Zoning Code and make it part of today's record. The Metro Code requires a record of these proceedings. Because BZA meetings are recorded for Metro Channel 3, it is imperative that anyone addressing the board come forward and speak into the microphone. All speakers should identify themselves by name, address, and then make their desired presentation. The Metro Code requires four members of our seven-member board to establish a quorum. The Code also requires at least four affirmative votes to grant an appeal. In the event that only four members are present and the appeal fails to receive four affirmative vote votes, the appeal will be re-advertised for the next available public hearing. In the event that five or more members are present and the appeal fails to receive four affirmative votes, the case will remain on the board's agenda for the next 30 days. Applications that fail to receive four affirmative votes within 30 days of the public hearing shall be, shall be deemed denied by operation of law. Pursuant to board rules, an agreed party may appeal board decisions to the Chancery Court within 60 days of the hearing date. Additionally, an agreed party may file a motion for a rehearing within 60 days of the original hearing date pursuant to the terms of the BZA rules and regulations. After that time elapses, the board's decision becomes final and no further action may be taken. If your appeal is granted, you are required to obtain the permit for which you have applied. A permit must be obtained within two years for the board approval to remain valid. It should also be noted that if false or misleading testimony is presented to the board, any board approval may be revoked at a later date based upon a show cause hearing before the Board of Zoning Appeals. Mr. Chairman, I submit that all cases have been filed in proper order, all appellants have been notified by certified mail, and all legal notice requirements have been fulfilled. Mr. Herbert, before we get started, I just wanted to have a special kind of uh, comment. Um, we are meeting today, uh, as we normally do on the first and third Thursdays of the month. Our Jewish friends in Nashville are celebrating a new year, so Shana Tova to all my Jewish friends out there. And I'm actually slightly annoyed that we are meeting today on a major Jewish holiday. I know we normally meet the first and third Thursdays, and I would like to personally apologize to, we had an applicant last time that was supposed to be here because we deferred his case, but he couldn't because of Rosh Hashanah, so um, I would just like to have that for the record. Okay, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Okay, we have one preliminary announcement. We have case 2017-236. It involves 103A Cherokee, and that case has been deferred to October the 5th. So if you're here on the case involving 103A Cherokee, the case has been deferred to October the 5th. At this point, uh, I will call for any elected officials that would like to come up and speak uh, on their case. Um, I think I saw Councilman Glover in the audience. Councilman, would you like to come forward? Yes, thank 
Councilman Glover, good to see you. Welcome good, back. Good to see you. I, I tell you, uh, I was just telling some other colleagues out here, I've been in the council for six years, and I think I've been down here well, during that six-year time up until the last few weeks, maybe four times, but thanks to some moves that we made, uh, I'm down here just about every time now. And so hopefully we're going to try and make some corrections to where uh, I love being with you guys, and I appreciate what you do. We'll but put you on the frequent flyer list yeah, like uh, uh, <laughs> Councilman Withers and Councilman Sledge. Absolutely. Uh, here to talk about two things. Uh, first of all, my bill that you have up today, 254, which is on consent. Uh, I appreciate the staff. I appreciate the uh, um, the uh, Elmington and all of the parties involved, myself included, uh, working in a collective manner that will best serve my district. So I'm fully supportive of what staff is recommending and the. Uh, Remind the, us again which case this is. Uh, it's 254. I'm sorry. It's okay. the um, um, Elmington properties. Uh, the, it's a it's an apartment complex yes. out on Otter Grill Okay. Okay. So it's it's a variance on a sidewalk. I'm sorry. Two, two fifty. No, two fifty. Mm -hmm. Pretty sure. Right. I mean, two fifty four. Yep. That's yep. It. It's okay. exactly. Very yep. good. Uh, so anyway, I, I'm fully supportive of, of what the staff has uh, uh, worked with, uh, along with uh, um, the uh, developer there, and so I think it's going to be a good thing for, for my district, and I appreciate that. Councilman Swope, I, I'd like to speak just briefly to you, if I may. Councilman Swope is out of the country today, and so he reached out to me. I know a letter has been sent to each one of you uh, on the committee uh, expressing his desires, and I just merely want to say I support that. I think it's a, it's a good move, and I hope that you will follow what the councilman is recommending to to you and uh, again as always I, I understand that what you do takes a lot of your time and uh, a lot of diligence and a lot of preparation before you come in uh, but as a, a as a council member I really appreciate the work you guys do and chairman thank you very much thank you any questions for the councilman and councilman swopes uh, uh, case is 202 um, the no yes I'm sorry I didn't make, yeah, sorry about that the restaurant yes any questions for the councilman Thank you for being here. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Councilman. Thank you. I think I saw Councilman Withers in the audience. Councilman, would you like to come up? Thank you, and good afternoon, members of the Board of Zoning Appeals. Uh, I am Councilmember Brett Withers. I represent uh, District 6 and Lower East Nashville. I have a case before you today, which I believe is on consent, and I think that's uh, great. I do support the appeal. That is case number 2017-245 for uh, an addition to an existing outbuilding for uh, a parcel on Eastland Avenue. Um, you know, Eastland Avenue is what I call East Nashville's answer to Belmont Boulevard. We have a a lot of really grand homes that sit on really, really large lots uh, in that vicinity, and um, uh, those property owners have uh, were early adopters of the conservation overlay to protect a lot of those structures in that area, and they take a lot of great pride in, in their buildings. Uh, in this particular case, one of those property owners is seeking to make an addition to an existing outbuilding. The existing outbuilding happens to sit really close to the alley, which is how they were historically built. Um, but they are seeking to make an addition to that, to make that into livable space, and um, I fully support that and, uh, and, and appreciate the architect reaching out to me a while back and making herself available uh, for the neighborhood associations if they had any questions, and they did not. So just appreciate the advance work uh, on that from the architect and the property owners and wishing the best in their project, and, and I do support their appeal. Thank you thank, so much. Thank you. Any questions for Councilman Withers? Okay. Thank you for being here. Thank you. Mr. Herbert. And I think I saw and I think I saw Councilman Syracuse in the audience, Councilman. Hello everybody. Good afternoon. Thank you. Uh, I know that the public hearing is already closed on case 156. I simply just wanted to come here and reiterate my vehement opposition to this variance request. The, uh, they're asking for to develop almost in the entirety of the floodway buffer, and I think that is completely uh, uh, not appropriate. Thank you very much. Okay. Thank you. And I see Council Lady Kathleen Murphy. Mm -hmm. Council Lady Murphy. Uh, see, Councilman Leonardo, please step forward, Councilman. You slipped in behind me. Good 
Good afternoon. I'm Councilman Nick Leonardo of the first um, Councilmatic District here, and we have a case number 2017-240 on page five of uh, your agenda. This is a, a short-term rental case where the applicant failed to get a, uh, a permit, and uh, we have quite a few of my constituents here that are going to speak on this. I have received reports at this particular location of, of folks playing uh, basketball in their <laughs> underwear and smoking marijuana and the like, um, and that's not something that I don't think any neighborhood uh, would like to see. Um, you know, we have pending legislation that's coming up uh, at the, the next council meeting here at the 1st of October, 608, um, and it's the, the legislative intent is very clear. We're trying to rein these things in. And, uh, you know, as a quasi-judicial body, uh, we would ask for you guys to, to take notice of that legislative intent and try to rein, uh, try to rein this in. Um, this is, again, I've not been contacted uh, whatsoever uh, by the applicant in this, uh, you know, requesting this short-term rental. And I would just submit to you that, you know, if I were to build an addition on my home or I didn't get some setbacks right or something, and if I came in here and said, oh, I'm sorry, ignorantus lex, or I had no idea, uh, that doesn't mean that I just get a, a free pass, you know? So, I mean, you know, we have laws and, and they're in place for a reason, and so I would ask that this penalty be enforced. Um, and obviously, um, this is not a type one owner occupied, so uh, if you look at 608, I mean, it's very, very clear that at some point, uh, the type twos are definitely gonna be phased out, and this will be phased out, so it's not gonna be a continue to be uh, any sort of business venture uh, that they can, it looks like they're going to be able to move forward on with the pending legislation. So I would ask that uh, that you deny the relief that is being requested by the applicant, and I would like to thank each of you for your service to this uh, commission and board. Thank you very much. Any questions for the councilman? Yes. Oh, no, oh. That, from us, that means from us. Oh, okay. You will call your case when it comes. Okay. You, you was talking well, about Ma'am, uh, ma'am, I'm sorry, you can't speak now. Yeah. Okay. No. Okay, well, we're, okay, we're done. Um, if the councilman wants to talk somewhere else with uh, an applicant, he's welcome to, but that's up to him. Thank you. All right. Thank you. And I see Council Lady Murphy back here. Council Lady Murphy has three motions for rehearing that she is going to present to the board. So, Council Lady. Great. Thank you, Bill. Um, thank you, Commission, for hearing me on this. I've got three cases that I wanted to request a rehearing on. Um, the first one is the easiest. I had emailed um, John Michael and asked, um, I was not clear enough in my email asking for a deferral of the case for 2017-215. This is a setback from the requirements in an MULA district for a ground sign. This is a rezoning that I rezone this property um, kind of towards the beginning of my term. Uh, I have already spoken with the applicant and I think we could probably work something out. Had we had those discussions before the case came before you, um, I might not have this opposition. And so I'm just asking to reset that hearing, give us a little more time to talk about this and work it out. I think we can come to an agreement, but I'd like to go ahead and ask for a rehearing on that because I asked for what I thought I was asking was for a deferral so I could work those those issues out. So that's my first one. What, I'm sorry, what number is that? Kathleen? So it is case number 2017-215. It's dealing with with the side setback requirements in the MULA district to in install a ground sign. And, and like I said, they're here today. We've spoken, um, we've just been a little swamped on the council. So I'm just asking if y'all will replace that on your next agenda so we can have time to work out those details because I think we can. No, this, this, is this is simply a motion to rehear if the motion is granted, it will be reset for a different case, a different date, um, and probably will have to be re-advertised, and we'll have a rehearing. If the motion is denied, then there will be no rehearing. There's no need to go any further with it. So this is simply a motion to rehear the case. Okay. I might submit that if if the other side is here at this point, if the council is finished, that they probably should be given some opportunity to yeah. to speak. Because okay. I'm not prepared today, but. 
would be prepared at the next hearing to show that with the zoning, the, the straight rezoning that I granted them, um, the hardship that I think was presented to y'all was basically the, the road frontage of the lot, which is an interesting shape of a lot, but the road frontage creates a deeper setback than that they were seeking relief from, but also they chose that zoning bucket to, to have it rezoned to, um, and maybe if the building was not built the way that they chose to build it, maybe they wouldn't have needed the side setback. Those are the type of things that I'd like to sit down and discuss with them um, before at a rehearing. So I'm happy if y'all want to hear from them as well. I can sure. hit my other ones yeah, and then go hear. from there. Let's, let's hear. So the other two, um, I, I w when we spoke earlier, I was going to take them separately, but they have, they're the same reasons for rehearing, and y'all considered them together and heard from them together. It is case 2017-161 and 2017-170. Remind us what exactly that case is. Mm -hmm. One of them is dealing, they're both dealing with the letters, um, and I think that the variances, there's part of the record that was not clear about the variances. Uh, what but the first what's the address and what kind of building is it? The address is going to be 4708 and 4710 Charlotte Avenue. One is for an event center that is also connected to the other property that is um, a restaurant. And they were seeking parking variances and they were seeking wall height variances. And, and they, they gave up the parking variance. They I'm were not granted a parking variance. Right, it's not clear in the record about that the parking variances have been taken care of. That's something that I asked them numerous times before the hearing to keep me updated and show and prove to me that they had gotten into an agreement somewhere else regarding the parking variances and things. They went radio silence. The last I heard from them was four days before you heard from them at the BZA where they presented at my neighborhood association, Sylvan Park Neighborhood Association, and they said that they were deferring this case. They told the neighbors they were deferring the case. They told me they were deferring the case. Um, I sent an email to uh, John Michael saying they said that they're not going to need all the variances, um, and John Michael re responded back, and I have that email saying that he would let me know if we knew more. Again, it was my understanding that they were being deferred. They appeared before you that day. Um, I, I watched the video, and they said that the Neighborhood Association didn't have a problem with it. They stated that the Nation's Neighborhood Association didn't have a problem with it. I've spoken with Council Lady Roberts, who reached out to her zoning committee. She was not aware that they had met with her zoning committee in the nations and in their minutes and in their what they have sent to me in an email was that they chose not to take a position because they were leaving it up to the Sylvan Park Neighborhood Association. You've received a letter from the Sylvan Park Neighborhood Association requesting this to be reheard as well. So I think that it was a misleading statement that that there was no opposition to these variances when y'all had received emails with opposition from neighbors on the variances. The, I mean, I, I remember the opposition being mostly about the parking, and I don't remember, and, the, and we did not, they didn't ask for, nor did we grant a parking variance, and right. so it's, I, I believe, up to them to satisfy codes before they get an occupancy permit that they have an agreement and with somebody to mm -hmm. provide the parking that's required for them. We did not give them any relief. And so the only thing we did was was approve the wall. The wall. And so the issue with the wall is that they supplied to you elevations and site plans that had not been supplied to me. And the office and staff will tell you that I am always very religious about as soon as I get one of these letters saying that there's a BZA case, I always reply back. And Vanessa in our office has been tasked to always reply back and ask for the file for me. And again, the email from John Michael was, we will keep you up to date with what is in the file and what variances are and are not being requested. I was not up to date on that. There's a difference between, I know the argument was made here to you, showing that other buildings on this street and in this historic section are built up to the um, to the sidewalk. There's a big difference between someone being inside a brick building and and that close to a sidewalk. There's another difference between a cocktail party or a patio party going on with just a brick wall of different very, very, um, elevations and varying materials and being that close to the road and to what hopefully will be a mass transit corridor. And so what I'm asking for is the fact that my neighbors were not given notice that this was being heard because we were told that they were deferring it. I did not hear a clear 
answer from staff and I will take full responsibility that I probably should have called back every hour on the hour until I got a clear answer that it was being deferred. I do, I'll, I'll take that responsibility that I didn't harass the staff because I know that they have plenty of other jobs to do. But at this point in time, since there has been misleading statements given to you about the opposition and support of two neighborhood associations and the fact that they knew that I was opposed to the wall and the parking and that was not stated to you, it was, I think, implied to you very clearly that there was no opposition, then I'm asking you to rehear it. Questions for Council Lady Murphy? Um, if, if we can back up to the, the first one you mentioned, 215. Yes, um, sir. What, what, are, what is the alleged uh, cause for the rehearing again? So it's my understanding their hardship that they were requesting or, or using for the variance was topography. Um, and I don't think that, that the topography necessarily is there. I think it might be something that we can talk and work out, but seeing as that this was just rezoned and they just built a building that may have affected where they could and could not put this sign, that that's something that maybe should have been discussed when we were rezoning and done an SP rather than otherwise. I'm not, I don't feel comfortable signing off on something or, or supporting or opposing when I don't think that the topography was a, a valid variance at that time. I do think that when I sit down with that developer and we have spoken and this week has been a council week, I think that we can probably work out an agreement and I might be fine with it and we pull it from the agenda. But at this time I'm asking for a rehearing because I had asked for what I thought was a deferral and it was, and John Michael did not understand that when I said, do you think we can defer this? there was no response back that there would be a deferral. Well, I, okay, I, I'm, I'm not sure, I'm not a lawyer, as I look at my lawyer. Uh, I'm not sure, uh, we have to, we have to have uh, a reason, and, and I think I hear what you're saying, but if, uh, and I don't have all the facts of that case in front of me at the moment, but it seems to me that if, if we found a hardship, then that's uh, a finding of fact that this board found. And unless we were lied to or were giving misinformation about, uh, about which we found our facts upon, did you follow that? I did follow that. Uh, I'm, not, and I'm not sure that we, we are in a position to the rules, the BZA rules um, to which this board is bound, of course, um, it specifically addresses post-hearing requests for rehearing, um, and it says no such request to grant a rehearing shall be considered unless new evidence is submitted which could not have reasonably been presented at the previous hearing. The request must be in writing and it must recite with specificity the new evidence and the reasons for the request. So along the lines of what you were saying, if there is something that is being presented today that could not reasonably have been presented at the meeting at which the decision was made, then the request could be granted. If there's not new evidence today, then the request, okay. uh, part of the rules, shall not okay. and, be and, 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 and for the And for the council person and the board, I'm not expressing an opinion on any of this. I, I just wanted to clarify that because I'm, I'm trying to get, find my well, footing here. Based on what the lawyer said, do you have a question for the council person? Do, do, do you think or do you have evidence of the, that we were given? Is there new evidence that we should have gotten that we could have gotten or that is or there, is there evidence that we were given wrong evidence? I think the new evidence that needs to be further examined and discussed between the the applicant and myself is that they had requested an MULA rezoning straight rezone, which I rarely give, but just as a side comment. Um, and the new evidence would be that this is a self, this potentially is a self-imposed hardship that the variance would not be given if it's a self-imposed hardship. They built the building in a way that then required where they want to put their sign to be in a location. Maybe had they built the building on the, just throwing out left and right because we're all looking oriented differently. Had the building been built on the left side of the property, would they have needed this variance? 
I don't know. That's something I would like to sit down and talk to them. But the new evidence that I guess I would be presenting to you today is that there was not proper notice to to me and, and my to my constituents because we were under the impression that I requested a deferral. And then secondly, this is potentially a self-imposed uh, hardship, and I believe that that's one of the reasons under um, under the correct me if I'm wrong, but six causes or six justifications for a variance. One of them is that it cannot be self-imposed. And so I would like to work with the developer to clarify that it is not self-imposed because right now my my inclination and new evidence to you would be that it is self-imposed. I'm trying to remember the case. Is this a triangle-shaped lot? It is a triangle-shaped lot. Um, next to a railroad track, and I think that's part of the, their topography um, hardship question. But again, what if they flip their site plan? Would they have needed the side the side setback um, variance? What if they had built their building in a different shape? Um, you know, I th I feel like that maybe that's something that could have been brought up before we did a straight rezone. Um, but you know, this is this is something that probably could have been thought out. And, and maybe it could have just cost more to build the, bu the building the other way, which is, I think, one of the other six reasons on a not granting a variance is a, si uh, is a financial issue. I think this is something that I'll probably be able to work out with and feel comfortable with after I meet with the developer. But it did not come onto my radar until late, um, and they did not reach out to me prior to it. I asked for what I thought I was asking for, a deferral, and probably had that deferral been communicated to you, communicated to the developer, I wouldn't be here today asking for a grant ends. It, they would be going through today and I would be writing a letter of support. So what I'm simply asking you on this one is I think that I presented some potential new evidence here that was not considered. And so I'm simply asking for a two week deferral so I can work that out with the developer. Um, and and if we can't work it out, then y'all can make the, the, the um, decision from there. Any other questions? Have the permits been issued? Do you, would you know? <coughs> I, I don't know. 215, 215 has not been issued. <coughs> okay. I think so fairness would dictate that the other side, the applicant in each of these cases should be given the okay. opportunity Who to speak. Who first, Mr. Herbert, should come forward? Uh, so um, any of the applicants on the case, um, Y'all please come forward. In which case, tell us which case you're so representing. This is going to be 2017-215, two, the, the ground sign that we were just speaking of. Okay. Uh, Will Tyner, Commercial Realty Services, 5000 Crossing Circle, Mount Juliet. Um, we've had a good working relationship with the councilwoman. Uh, like we said, we got a, a, a rezone passed uh, last year. Um, and want to continue to work um, with her uh, on this project. Um, you know, I do feel like we did go through the process that's asked of us um, to get this variance. Um, we do believe there was a hardship um, and a legitimate hardship and, and that this body agreed with that. Um, we stand ready to continue to work with Kathleen and, and come up with a solution. Um, I guess our preference would be to honor the variance that was, that was um, granted. Uh, we would work with her and, and see if we can come up with another solution. Um, I'm not sure what, what procedural options we have if we can't come up with another do you know, solution. Do you know what date your hearing was held on? It's two weeks ago. Two weeks ago. Our uh, last Joe, meeting. So, yeah. I mean, I, I just asked our attorney. I mean, I, it sounds like that there's a 60-day window to ask for a rehearing, and so it seems to me that in this case it might be appropriate for you all to talk and see if you can't work something out in the next two weeks, and, and if both if, if you can't and there's still a problem, then then you can come back and ask for a rehearing then. At least you know that you've, you're at a complete impasse and otherwise you already have a variance that's been approved and, and you know, that, that's something that we would have to address whether or not we rehear it or if, you know, you come up with something that doesn't need a variance, then you're good to go. Um, or you maybe advertise and present us a, with an alternative plan, but it, it seems like on this one, with both sides willing to talk, it, it would be best just to let this one go for a couple of weeks and 
then because you're still within your window to I ask think, for that. So what I think I'm hearing you say is that I could defer my request for a rehearing so we no, could work that you, out. Exactly. Well, I would say you have, you have 60 work? days and it's only been two weeks and so yes. you would still have that opportunity okay. at the next meeting to ask for a rehearing uh, within the window of that and that would be the best way to handle that it, from Let's my opinion. That. Can, can I just ask a procedural that? question? If that were to happen and for whatever reason we could not work something out, would we have to go through the process again or would we, we hear the, the... I think the it, rules it say that I would then be the applicant challenging that and pay for the, the cost of it all, which I'm happy to incur. Assuming that we that we voted to rehear the case, and right? That right. We reopened it. We, we would still have to. We would still have vote as a body re vote to hear the case. Yes. And would, at that point in time, would we have to redo public notice and all that, or would that? Yes. I would do that. I would if be we, doing that. Okay. Yeah. If we agreed to rehear it. So, what do we think about? Um, you're suggesting. I don't, I don't, it, I mean, I, I think it's, if, they, if they're amenable to it, then there's nothing before. Do we need any sort of motion then for this? No. I'm willing to withdraw this or defer my request for a rehearing on this one for two weeks. Okay, wonderful. We hope that you all can work something out. If not, be back here. Yeah. Thank you. Can I say one thing? Yes. Yeah. Please Carl, identify yourself. Yeah, Carl Bell, A1 Science. We have not applied for the permit that the lady asked. We were on our way to and when we got the email okay. from Mr. Herbert. So, so yeah, just see what you can work so out. I'll Thank you. Such time I appreciate it. Hopefully we can work out some placement. Just Absolutely. For everybody. Thank you. It's a great district over there. Lots of construction. Okay. Next case. Thank you. This is the um, event space. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Jamie Holland on behalf of the owners in case 2017-161 and 2017-170. BZA Rule 10 says 10A1, any aggrieved party may, within 60 days, request a rehearing. To qualify as an aggrieved party, the courts of the state of Tennessee have held that to be aggrieved, a party must be able to show at least a special interest in the agency's final decision. Number two, no such request to grant a hearing shall be considered unless new evidence submitted, which could not have been reasonably presented. According to the council member's letter of September 12th, community groups were not made aware of the August 17th hearing date and were impressed that the hearing was to be held in late September or early October. We met with two neighborhood associations on a variance. The Nations on July 23rd, the Seven Park neighborhood on August 14th. And in that August 14th meeting, as a part of our presentation, we indeed told everyone when the BZA meeting was. It, were you part of, you were present at that meeting? I was present at that meeting, yes. The initial setting of this case was July 20. On July 17, Seven emails came in all on the same day, objecting to the parking variance. So there were two variance requests, one for parking and one for an obstruction and a setback. And the parking variance request was withdrawn. And on July 31st, at the Planning and Zoning Committee of the Nation's Neighborhood Association, there was no opposition. There was no opposition expressed on August 14th. We deferred from July 20 to August 3rd to get on to the nation's planning and zoning committee meeting. While that was happening, we didn't know when the Sylvan Park Neighborhood Association would be meeting. So we deferred it again so we could have the meeting prior to coming to the BZA. The second point in her September 12 meeting says the BZA order attached to this letter fails to mention whether or not a variance from parking requirements was granted confusing concerned parties. That's an interpretation problem. That's not new evidence. My clients are not required under law or otherwise to interpret the BZA orders for Ms. Murphy. And the point being about, well, we didn't send her site plans. They were a part of our presentation. And as far as the setback in, you know, setback obstruction as a part of the presentation, the code requires you gotta have a variance if it's within 10 feet of the sidewalk setback. As a part of our presentation, it shows that the walls are outside 
10 feet of the setback. That was a ruling of the zoning administrator. We came here to make sure it was all clear. So uh, it's a little bit outrageous to hear some of the things that I've heard today, but we would vehemently oppose any request for a rehearing. My clients have already suffered damages as a result because of a part of the due diligence with their construction lender. This September 12 letter has canceled a closing. It's not an insignificant matter to us. Thank you. Any questions? Okay. Chairman, if I may, sure. um, I have here an email that I dated that is from to John Michael on August 15th. Um, basically, I'm saying the, the first part of it was Dan Cook insinuated he will not be seeking the parking variance and only the, vault, the wall variance. Are you all aware of this? John Michael wrote back. I only know that they have been working to meet the zoning requirements for parking by reaching off-site parking agreements. I will not be surprised if they succeed in that effort. Naturally, uh, once we know anything, we'll pass that along. It was never passed along to me in another email that I've searched my emails from. The nation's neighborhood uh, zoning and uh, their planning and zoning committee that Council Lady Roberts was not aware that this, when I initially spoke to her and asked her about this, she was not aware that they had gone before them. Um, they say, informal request for a restaurant slash event center on Charlotte. Biggest issue is parking, moving ahead, and will be open in the spring. Not necessarily in our district, but we will work with Sylvan Park to make a decision. I asked Mary Carolyn, uh, Council Lady Roberts, to email her, her chair and find out what happened in the meeting if they were there. The reply back from Matt Siegel, who I think is, I guess her chair, one of the co-chairs of that committee for her, says they did meet with us. It ended up being purely informational as we voted to not take a vote. We decided to do so because they said they were meeting with Sylvan Park Neighborhood Association and we wanted to be deferential to that. I will remind you, you have a letter from the Sylvan Park Neighborhood Association asking for this to be reheard. There was also some discussion about how comfortable we felt weighing in. Technically, if using the neighborhood maps on Nashville.gov from the Mayor's Office of Neighborhoods, the north side of Charlotte to the interstate is nation's neighborhood turf. Although, as we are all aware, it is not our council district. I will say that there was a sense of support as long as the parking issues were resolved via shared use agreements or otherwise prior to the appeal. The wall height was not non-controversial. Our crew liked that it was an adapted reuse, so on and so forth. Then they, they talk about the land use table and, and evidently they've had issues with bankrupt, uh, banquet halls. I think those two things right there tell you, and I did not, um, unless I've got Sylvan Park neighbors here that I didn't see because I, I told them we'd probably be fine today. The neighbors that I have spoken to um, that were there in that meeting have reminded me that my memory was correct, that there, it was said it was being deferred four days later on the Thursday that you heard it. I asked, I've double checked our minutes. It is not reflected in the minutes that it was my Sylvan Park minutes, if I can find them in a second, um, that they would be, um, whether it was gonna be deferred or not. But my memory and the memory of my neighbors are that it was said it was going to be deferred. And I'll remind you that in y'all's same, same rules as, as Mr. Holland um, has quoted, it says under procedure 7C2, the witnesses appearing before the board in public hearing shall not be required to testify under oath, but all witnesses shall be made aware if it is determined that false information has been presented to the board, the board has a right to reconsider their decision. I've watched the video. Mr. Holland and his client sat here and said there was no opposition. Mr. Michael sat, was here as well that day and said there was no opposition. I would contend that Mr. Michael knew that I was opposed and I, will, I know for a fact that Mr. Holland's client knew I opposed. I don't remember him being there at the Sylvan Park meeting that night, but I know that I voiced my opinion in opposition that night, and I believe that sitting here and telling you that they were not aware of any opposition was a misleading statement to you, and under your rules, you can rehear that case based upon that. And I guess when, when the letters I'm hearing you, or the information I'm hearing though, it, I mean, I heard several times 
well, you have no opposition to the wall. The wall is okay, and that's all we voted on was right. the wall. Right. The Sylvan. So the, I guess I'm not sure. The initial, the initial issue and emails that we sent were regarding that parking. I hadn't seen the elevations at that right. time for the wall or new specifications of it then, and so I couldn't share it with neighbors to say whether they had um, an issue or opposition to the wall. Had that information been provided to us then, we probably would have sent you letters saying we've got safety concerns. It's a public safety issue to have one thin brick wall and and maybe some wrought iron or something between you and a cocktail party um, when you're driving down the street where well, we've had plenty of accidents in those intersections well, um, or mass transit coming through there. And I think what, whether we oppose the wall or not in two weeks or whether if you grant this rehearing, the fact of the matter is is that there was misleading statements here that we had no opposition when it was clearly, I feel like, demonstrated to the applicant and to the staff that there was opposition. And I, I'll remind you, I've got Sylvan Park Neighborhood Association backing me up and asking for a rehearing, and I ask that you grant that to me. If you want to, I hate using and asking for councilmatic courtesy, but if you'll give that courtesy to the neighbors who were under the impression that this was being deferred, because that's what they were told at their neighborhood association meeting. Questions? Okay. I have a question, but I do want to say, since John is not here, I, he does work very hard. We all see that, and I'm sure it was just a mistake, an honest mistake on his part, and just wanted to stick up for him since he's not no, here and, to No, and I did not speak. mean that as, I mean, I know he gets these emails from us a lot, um, but I know that the applicants knew there was there was opposition, and I mean, they stated I, otherwise. I, 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 I'm just, you know, we got a really, you know, a, a long day, and this was a little bit sprung on us, and and I'm trying to process it all. And when I, we, uh, part of my thinking on it is that, you know, it was on our agenda three times. I mean, it, I remember this this being on our agenda, and you know, and and I know it's on our agenda three times because when I do my research, I was like, oh, okay, I've done, I've already done it, but I've got to read it again <laughs> to remember what it's about. And I can remember thinking when it was done, well, I'm, I'm glad that one's finished and I know it was deferred a couple of times for all these things to happen and and so I'm I mean I know these are really active neighborhoods and so it's a little shocking and you you are uh, a, an amazing council lady very in tune with what's going on and 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 come to us often with um, with uh, word from your your district and so I'm, it's just a little uh, confusing as to why this is coming up a month after we, you know, heard the case. And uh, and again, and but, you but said that at the meeting. You said these are active neighborhood associations. We're surprised we're not hearing from them, or we would have heard from them. And you would have. I would have sent out another but, email saying it's up this week. You well, know, but, but I mean, we didn't even get in. letters. I mean, the only letters we got were about the parking. And so, and I guess I still haven't, you know, I mean, a, you know, I tell you, I mean, when I first heard just a general concept of a wall, I thought, oh, I don't know about that, but, you know, I go to um, ML Rose and sit closer to the street than the wall's going to be, and there's not a wall to protect me, <laughs> and I think, you know, um, mm -hmm. and so, I mean, I guess I, I'm just not, I'm not sure, you know, it, I mean, and, and I, I even saw that, I mean, we'd ask about a, an elevation, and they had something presented, but it also was in the business journal, you know, the day before saying, hey, we're, it's going to be at the BCA Thursday, so we'd seen a color picture of it, and so I guess I'm just not, I mean, I, I, get, I get that there was, and there's a difference of opinion about what was said, that, um, that some folks thought that it wasn't going to be there, but, you know, like I said, it, it seems like that those letters would have been in our file a month and a half earlier when we first got the case saying, hey, we're really concerned about this, and they're just weren't, they just weren't there. They would have been if we had been given that information about the wall ahead of time. I asked for that information in conversations and things, and never, I mean, I never received elevations on a wall. Had I seen them, you know, we would have discussed it at the Neighborhood Association. But again, in my email to John Michael saying, are they only going after the wall variants? Can I get that more information? But that's I never all they got did that. go after. I, mean, I didn't, did but I didn't get the information about the wall variants, meaning the elevations, the pictures, what it looks like. Right. And I think at the end of the day, 
right now the message is going to be sent if y'all deny this request for a hearing the message is going to be sent to my neighbors that it's okay for a developer to come up here and say there was no opposition when we didn't get an accurate information and we were told at the neighborhood association we're deferring this and we'll be continuing to work with you when that wasn't the case at the neighborhood association that's not what they said they said they're deferring it to work with us and that's not what they said here what day so, did the, i mean i guess what day did they say that because so the date that was let me pull out my so this was originally on the july 20th bza hearing I quickly had emailed some neighbors and said, please write, a, you know, they're trying to do zero parking here because again, we'll, we'll deal with the wall when we need to deal with the wall kind of concept in my mind of let's just get some quick emails out. Um, August 3rd is when you'll deferred it to the 17th. Um, the August 7, the August 14th, which is a Monday, um, the Sylvan Park Neighborhood Association meets the second Monday of every month, and they um, and that is where Mr. Cook had said that they were deferring the case, both cases, on Thursday. And at that meeting, I stated that I had opposition to the case. Um, on the 15th, the next day is when I emailed John Michael to confirm the variances, and I was told that I would be notified when he knows more, which. Again, I guess I need to start calling and harassing and taking more time to just sit down here in their office when they have other things to do and get constant updates on the case, which isn't fair to the staff because they've got other things they've got to do. And then boom, four days, you know, from the 14th to the 17th, somehow um, the applicants have changed their variances and just didn't feel like it was necessary to update the neighborhood association, the councilwoman, or or make sure that we were aware of it. They change, change the variances just by dropping the parking? Or? They, at, the, at that meeting, they weren't clear that they were getting rid of the variances. Again, my email to John Michael was they insinuated that they'll only be going after the wall. Is this true? Right, Are I mean, you aware of It's not uncommon this? for folks to come and have three variances and two will go away because they've right. either worked it out or they know they're right. not, you know, they know it's, that's not into, going to happen today or what, what for whatever reason they you know it's that it's very mm -hmm. common that we have variances that just get dropped but I guess I, I and there were questions asked about the wall and the project and all of this at my neighborhood association meeting but at the end of the day they the applicant sat here and told you there was no opposition to these variances at all or the variance at all and I'm here to tell you that the neighborhood association still had questions and concerns and would have been here to oppose it. I would have been here to oppose it had we been properly notified and not, and so, had we been told, yep, we're still going on Thursday and four days from now instead of we're going to be deferring these. So I'm asking you to give my constituents the rehearing so that they were under the impression that this was being deferred. Any other questions of either person? I don't know if Mr. Holland has a response. Thank you. It's truly incredible that on a meeting I got my client to set up on August 14th at the Sylvan Park Neighborhood Association meeting, which is held at 7 o'clock at the Cone School. I didn't just remember that on my way over here. I was there. Ms. Murphy was there. She came and approached me and asked me why I was there. And I joked with her that I was there about short-term rentals. There was that, no- That's why I don't remember you being there. I will restate that. I do remember you telling me you were there for short-term rentals, not for your client. That is correct. I stand corrected. We, we still haven't heard any evidence, new evidence that would trigger. Did you, but Mr. Holland, what I want to know, did we hear, did the Neighborhood Association believe the case was being deferred? No, we told them when the BZA case would be. We told them it would be on Thursday. And we, the reason we didn't say we're taking parking away at this time, because we were 95% right. to get them. And between the time of the Sylvan Park Neighborhood Association and, and the BZA meeting, we met the requirements. And so we w withdrew. And those will, pursuant to the applicable ordinance, you know, we have to bring those down, those agreements down. They have to be a certain form, have certain contents. And before the issuance of any permit, they have to be signed off on. 
and filed with the Register of Deeds. So we, we've done everything and more, in our opinion, to go meet with two neighborhood associations on some variances. And, you know, as far as whether or not, we, we didn't consider it a big issue for the nations due to its location, but we met with their planning and zoning committee anyway, because that's the way, once I reached out to them, that's the way we were directed to handle it. They and asked us to do that. Tell me more about, I understand there's been a closing that's been delayed. Or that's missed. right. And would you tell me a little more about that, please? Well, as a part of the due diligence of the bank, we needed to produce certain documents, you know, the last being the August 23rd order. And, you know, then her letter dated September 12th, you know, we turned that over to the bank and they terminated the closing on that basis. Because it's, it's now up in the air of whether or not any permits are going to be issued. There's uncertainty. And that's a significant event. Any other questions? Okay. Um, Mr. Herbert, what's next? The board needs to vote on Council Lady Murphy's motion to rehear. Either you grant it or you deny it. Okay. Just to clarify, excuse the interruption, the motion needs to be made by a um, member of the board who voted in the majority. To rehear. It. To be about, and, well, no, it, to, a request for rehearing shall be acted upon one way or the other by a motion made by a member of the board who voted in the majority. So in order for it to be a valid vote, it would need to be made by. I think everyone voted for it. I don't, I don't recall. Okay, but. The ones that were here. Somebody that originally yes. Somebody that originally voted to grant the variance would need to make the motion okay. either to yes. grant the Understand request that. for re rehearing or deny the request for rehearing. So, discussion, board members. Well, don't we need to know who is able well, to make the motion? Yeah. Who are the, do we know who's the one that's not eligible to? It was last meeting, so who wasn't here? I was here part of the time. It was remember? the eight, um, August 17th. Meeting. Well, that was the 17th. I was here. I, was like, I, believe, I believe you were here, and I know you, David was here. You I don't remember who else talked. Oh, Sorry. Cynthia, did you possibly leave early? I, I don't remember. I didn't remember it when they were talking about it. So, so <laughs> that only deals with the motion, but everyone's eligible to vote. Is that correct? That is correct. Okay. So... The ones that are positive that they are, were here, they're the only ones that can make the motion. So, discussion. Well, um, as everyone knows, this town is absolutely gone nuts. Everything's happening here. People are covered up, council's covered up, attorneys are covered up. We sat here and I always wondered why I wanted to be on this board. <laughs> <laughs> but I respect the council, appreciate the council, and I submit that I also know the opposition right there. And nothing against you, but I'm for, I make a motion that we grant the rehearing. Okay, the motion's been made for the rehearing. Is there a second? Well, I will second it just to move it along. So here we go. Is there any discussion? Motion's been made properly seconded. I think I'd, I'd like for our, just just so we're clear because this, this is, you know, I've been on this board not six years and I've never experienced this situation. Um, and so sometimes when that happens, just in, I'm, I'll ask and this isn't, to say one way or the other how I think about it, but will you ask uh, ask our attorney just to tell us, you know, what, what the criteria is that we should be thinking about um, with it, this? Sure. In determining whether or not to grant the request, you need to determine whether or not any information that was presented today um, could not reasonably have been presented at the last meeting. So it's not that there has to be new information available to you today. And there has to be new information available to you that could not have been reasonably couldn't have been presented at the last meeting. Those are the two main criteria in granting a motion or request for rehearing. And what's the issue with 
It, it, Council Lady Murphy is correct. There is a separate rule, um, separate from the post hearing request, that says that if um, the board determines that information that was, let me back, let me read it exactly. If the board determines that false information has been presented, the board has the right to reconsider their decision. So you either need to determine that there was um, false information that was presented to you, or you need to determine that there is new information that could not have been presented at the time. Does that make sense, the, the two? Okay. Any more discussion? Well, okay. Although, let me, let me clarify one thing. Um, under procedure, it says if you determine that there's false information, the board has the right to reconsider your decision. So I don't, I don't know if that would actually merit a whole, an entire new um, hearing I think for new information to be presented. I, I would need to look into that. I can't give you an answer. I mean, because that's under a different rule, says so you have the right to reconsider but, it. But, but it reconsider, doesn't. I would assume that would be being rehearing. It, I mean, it just wouldn't matter. I just don't know that it, if, if that means that there would be an entirely new um, hearing with you know both sides presenting evidence. I, I can't give you an exact answer to that without looking into it. I do know that you do have the right to reconsider it. I'm just not exactly certain that that means or doesn't mean an entirely new hearing. I feel that we should have a, if it's granted, we should have a new hearing to hear what the opposition has to say. Sure. I mean, and yeah, I mean, obviously that's what the motion is for, a rehearing, and we would start all over again. I mean, I, I, I get it, and I, I, do, I do, do respect the, the parties involved, and, you know, um, but I, I'm, what I'm, what I'm having trouble with is that it was on our agenda so many times and we just don't have any letters about that wall and that wall is all we dealt with. And so, I mean, if we'd had a stack of letters saying we were concerned about the wall and then we, so I guess I'm trying to think through well, what, what is the impact of, you know, of assuming that, you know, again, we have someone saying something, you know, A and someone saying not A, regardless of how, of the, the true truth to what really happened, would that have changed the impact of, of the wall? I don't know, because it just wasn't, it just wasn't part of that record. So, um, I mean, I, I get the confusion with the communication on the variance of the parking, but it also wasn't there if it was a, you know, if there was misleading test, you know, testimony of the neighborhood saying, hey, you know, um, they told us this. I don't know. I just it, it feels like that it just opens the door to rehear an awful lot of things, and um, you know. And, and I guess I guess I, I I don't feel like I'm all that in tune with what's happening, other than when it's presented to me. But you know, I just knew everything about this one just from reading it in the paper. I mean, it it felt like it was it was well publicized. The part we decided, and that that's what I'm having trouble with, uh, and and. And balancing that with well, the great respect I, I have for the council lady and and the request that's being Oh, well, I think had. what the council lady is saying is she thought it was going to be deferred and to have more time, and that didn't happen. Right, but and I guess it, it yeah, and I, and and, and I, yeah, I understand that. Then it, but it was a month past the original hearing too, so that that was the other thing that. Is I'm struggling with too. It's like it was on three of our agendas, or at least two of our agendas. I think it was on three. Um, you know, I mean, it, it was it was hot on the plate. You know, so I, I don't know. That, I, that's, I'm just saying that's what I'm struggling with. Uh, total great respect for for the neighborhoods and everybody involved there, but um, that's that's just what I'm thinking. Any more discussion? Okay, all those in favor of the motion to grant the rehearing on this case, signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Well, let's do it by show of hands. Uh, opposed? And in favor? Okay, so motion fails. Do you want? Hey, I'm sorry. We need. We we weren't clear on that vote. Okay. So, who's in favor of the motion? Raise your hand. 
Aye. Okay. You are in favor? Yeah. Okay. And opposed? Okay. Motion still fails. Mr. Herbert. The board utilizes a consent agenda. One board member reviews the record for each case prior to the hearing and identifies cases where the appellants met the criteria for their requested action. If the reviewing board members determine that testimony in the case would not alter the material facts, then the case is recommended to the board for approval. We will enter into the case record those cases that have been recommended and if anyone is here in opposition to one of those cases, please raise your hand and the case will be removed from the consent agenda and heard in its regular order. The cases that we have for the consent agenda are, we have five cases. The first one is case 241 at 804 Cerrito Landing. It's requesting a front setback and we had a letter, an email from Councilman Hager uh, this afternoon in support of this. We're asking if there's anybody in opposition to case 241. This is time you need to speak up. Yeah. In opposition? Yes. Okay, it will be heard at its regular time. Off consent. The next case that we have for the consent agenda is case 245, located at 1417 Eastland Avenue, requesting a rear setback. Is there anybody here in opposition to case 245 on Eastland? Seeing none. The next case that we have is case 248. It's located at 6964 Old Hickory Boulevard, requesting height restrictions for a detached garage. Is there anybody here in opposition to case 248 located at 6964 Old Hickory Boulevard? Seeing none. The next case we have is case 250, located at 1305 2nd Avenue South. Uh, requesting variances from side buffers. Do we have anybody here in opposition to case 250 located at 1305 2nd Avenue South? Mr. Herbert, the council person, Colby Sledge, is opposed to this and uh, has given us a letter, so in deference to him, I think we should hear this normally. We'll pull it off. The last case that we have for the consent agenda is case 254 located at 5636 Old Hickory Boulevard. This is seeking a sidewalk variance. And Mr. Chairman, there are conditions associated with it, that, this that I plaster, passed around to the board and Councilman Glover is in support. Okay. Is there anybody in the audience who is opposed Mr. to- Mr. Herbert. Yes. Is this a opposition? Yes. Okay. We ask if he's aware of the conditions. Are you aware of the conditions that were uh, approved, I mean, agreed upon? No, I'm not. Okay, so let's. Yep. We're going to chat. I'm yes. Here, that's all right. Yep. Okay. We happen to sit right there. Very good. Questions. Perfect. Go chat, and possibly this can go back on consent. And we'll put it off consent here. for right now. Right. Mm -hmm. So we have the cases for the consent agenda presently are case 245, located at 1417 Eastland, and case 248, 6964 Old Decree Boulevard. Do I have a motion, Mr. Chair? Okay. Motion that these are on consent. Is there a second? Second. Okay, motion's been made properly seconded. Any more discussion about the consent agenda? Seeing none, all those in favor of the consent agenda signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Consent okay. agenda passes unanimously. Okay, so if you are here on case 245 or 248, you are free to leave. Thank you. Okay, let's okay, start Okay, we'll move into our <laughs> agenda. And remind us, Mr. Herbert, that we are, this first case, the public hearing is closed and we are just voting. That is correct, Mr. Chairman. Deliberating and voting, I guess. So this first case is case 2017-156. It's Adam Epstein, appellant, and Carol G. Anderson, owner of the property located at 2317 Pennington Bend Road, requesting a variance from setback requirements in the R15 district to construct three single family residences. This is referred to the board under section 17.12.020A. The appellant has alleged that the board is jurisdiction under 17.40.180B. And Mr. Chair, this public hearing is closed. So therefore, we are just in the discussion, deliberation, and voting section. So you remember this case, we talked a lot about floodplain and floodway, and this is in the um, Mr. Syracuse's district. 
So, discussion. So it was brought up that Metro might have a creative solution to this to okay. purchase the property, you know, flooded property. This is the area that flooded very badly in our 2010 flood. And so Councilperson Syracuse was working with the neighbors and all this. So we agreed to have this back, but just not have the public hearing open again. I, we had forgotten to ask him, and I'm not sure if he's still here, but weren't they working on some kind of buyout program, and that's why we deferred it? Yes, but he is not here, and if there were a buyout, Mr. Herbert, I would have thought he would have mentioned it, right? There is a meeting today. I got a letter. Oh, so <laughs> the, the meeting is today, which I don't know what doesn't do us any good. But you want to I'll just pass this around. Mr. King lives in the neighborhood. So I spoke with Councilman Syracuse yesterday, and um, he is aware and agrees that the public hearing is closed on this matter. Um, I have also spoken with council on both sides of this. They also agree that the public hearing is closed in this matter. So it's just a matter of you all need to make a decision. I have to say I had forgotten uh, the details when I was looked at it because since I missed the last meeting I couldn't remember if we had uh, deferred at one meeting and you all had heard it uh, some while I was gone and um, went back and rewatched the tape of the original hearing which I had participated in a month ago and it it seems like that there are two issues um, on the opposition uh, side it's whether or not uh, this should be a legislative solution rather than a uh, individual variance solution because it affects the entire road, not just, and uh, in, in meaning the entire road, not just uh, a few properties within the road. Um, and then the, the appellant is saying that they're gonna be you know, 35 feet from the street because they're asking for a 20 foot variance that, uh, would still have them 35 feet from the street, which I think is closer to the road than the house next door, but probably pretty close to in line with the house two doors down. Um, and I don't know <laughs> what the right answer is on, well, you on know, it. Uh, well, as far as waiting for the legislative uh, remedy, I, I, you know, I, I begrudgingly accepted that and, and the defer, I may have even voted against deferring it, I don't remember. But, uh, I mean, it, if nothing has, I mean, it, I think the impression was that it, you know, something was uh, about to happen. Mm -hmm. But I think at some point we just, we have to respect due process and just move on. Well, I, and, I, and what I meant, David, I run the legislative meaning they're gonna buy it, but but saying if they're, and I think that their, their argument, again, I'm, I, I think it's up for us to consider both, you know, what, what the two compelling arguments are. I think their argument was there's 40 something buildable lots every single one of them would have to have a variance request. And if there are that many, then it should be zoned as, as you know, uh, right. uh, but, and, and the, because I think the question was asked, you know, how many, how many, how many deviations does it take to make it a property not unique, you know? <laughs> right. Um, and, and I don't know that there was an, I mean, you know, there was something said, but it, uh, I, I acknowledge I acknowledge that argument and, and, and I get it, although I, I don't know that uh, just because there are a lot of similar variances, you know, uh, it, it's sort of like everything is everything is weird, therefore none of them are weird. Uh, so I, I don't know that that actually applies, so. Let's go back to why they're asking for this. This is an area that flooded badly. In my opinion, it will flood again badly, sooner rather than later and they want to build on this and you can't build in the flood way at all and floodplain has some issues about how high you could build and how far back you could build. So um, that's to me a hardship. 
you know, the question is, then we got into this policy question whether Metro was gonna buy this out, but what's in front of us is a request for a variance and the people stated their hardship. So are you inclined to think that there's a hardship Yes, ab absolutely. In order to in order so they, to allow them to build. Yes, yes, because this is the only way and the only place that they could build on this lot, and it's obviously not self-imposed. And flood the argument hydrogen. that was, I think, presented that, you know, and and that hey, Metro says we're not, you know, we're going to lower the value to almost nothing. Nothing, that, yeah. That that makes it un. They're by tacitly saying it's unbuildable, but that's not really. Right. True. I mean, but it's still a buildable lot. But none of that's really in front of us. What's in front of us is they have a request to build these houses, and they stated their hardship. We got bogged down in some other things. So, that being said, I move that we approve case 156, uh, requesting a variance from the setback requirements in the R15 district to construct these three family homes, and the hardship being the uh, this is in the floodplain and the floodway. I'll second. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Mr. King. <laughs> Mr. Chairman, I have property down there. I've been subjected to the flood down there. I've watched three, two floods. And uh, I think I just will simply not vote here. So you're accusing yourself. Right. Okay. Um, motion's been made, properly seconded. Any more discussion? All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Oppose. Oh, wait a minute. Okay, so let's go. All those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye and raise your hands. Aye. Opposed. Raise your hands. And then abstention. So, motion passes. Four in favor, two against, one abstention. Mr. King. Next case, Mr. Herbert. Call in the next case. So, um, Mr. Chairman, the next case is, is 202, and uh, Attorney Tom White is representing the uh, appellant here. Mr. White has informed me that he is in a hearing in federal court. He will be here, but he asked that we please kick this one down somewhere further down into the docket to allow him time to get here, and please go to the next case. Okay, we'll heal this or until he walks in the door, and maybe we could pop it back up. Okay. The next case is case 2017-231. This is Todd Grubal, appellant and owner of the property located at 1113 Wagoner Court West, requesting an item A appeal challenging the zoning administrator's denial of a short-term rental permit. Applicant, applicant operated prior to obtaining the legally required permit. Referred to the board under seven, section 17.16.250E, the appellant has alleged that the board would have jurisdiction under section 17.40.180A. Is the appellant here? Oh, yes. Good, thank you. Thank you. Hello. I want to thank you all for being here. And Apologize if I'm a little nervous. Um, not sure how all this really works. Um, I am here today because. Oh, please I, identify yourself and your address oh, for the record. Sorry, uh, I'm Todd Grubaugh. I live at 1113 Wagner Court West here in Nashville. Okay. Um, and yes, I am here today because um, I did, uh, before knowingly how all this really works, uh, start doing an Airbnb. I rented for, uh, I think, about two months or so before. Uh, Really realizing it, um, how all this goes together. Really, really real. So, why Mr. Chairman, I'm sorry, I didn't call for any opposition. We need to know that for the time period. Is there anybody here in opposition to this case? Seeing none, you'll have 10 minutes. I'm okay. sorry to interrupt you. Sorry. So, why didn't you know about our laws that have been on the books for a couple of years? And Who'd you hear about Airbnb from? Um, actually, I was just talking with somebody about it, and they mentioned, hey, did you get a permit for that? And at that point in time, I I guess I just didn't know. It's, it's, yes, it's a newer thing. And somebody said, hey, try this. And you know, so I did. Um, at that point, honestly, once I did find out about it, I had everything together, and I put everything together for the permit. So how'd you find out about it and when? Um, Probably it was maybe 
six or eight weeks into do, into doing it. At that point, that's when I started to put all the stuff together. But how? I mean, you're renting for six weeks, eight weeks, and then all of a sudden, do you see something on the news about Airbnb and regulation here? Do you get something in the mail? What happened? Oh, um, no, I never actually it was just, I was just talking to somebody about it and random conversation. Of and w well, tell me about that conversation. What'd they say? How'd it come up? Uh, well, we were just talking, catching up, and uh, anyways, it was um, a friend who had done it in the past, and she said, well, she brought it up. Did you, hey, did you get your permit? Is, is that right? So I didn't and you said to her? <laughs> and I said no. So I didn't know I had to have I didn't know I had to have that. So that's when I actually And what got did it. she say to you based on that? What's that? What did she say to you when you said I didn't know I had to have it? <laughs> you need to make sure you get it. Get it. You know, make sure you're legitimate and have that done. Um, so how many bookings did you have before that? Um, I think in total I had 30, I think 39 or something about like that. 39, brisk business in eight weeks. Well, I, uh, honestly, I, I mean, I keep my house very clean and I booked up pretty quickly. <laughs> so did, do you have any current listings on Airbnb or any of the online short-term rental sites? No, I do not. I When I, um, the way that it worked was once I found out, I put everything together to do the permit and I actually went over and sat down to, to go through everything. At that point, when I was talking with the gentleman in there, he said, it's basically what he told me was, oh, well, I see that as we looked it up, that you've had it rented in the past, so I'm denying it for the year, um, which is why I came here at that point, um, which we talked, and I believe, I believe we might have spoke, Debbie. Um, I think, um, but anyways, we, I shut everything down right at that point. That's what they said. They're like, shut everything down, do away with it, and, and I did, and I called okay. and put everything. So if a member of the Metro Council were sitting here instead of me, what they would probably <coughs> say to you is, you rented this 30 times and didn't know? Well, nothing, I mean, nothing changes that. It's, it's sort of an entity on its own that, um, as far as any kind of anybody government-wise saying anything, there's not really any connection there. Basically, when it, it's booking, it's it's just booking. That's completely outside of, um, I, I don't know how to say, of, of anybody saying anything about it. Okay. Um, cancellation. So when you found out, I'm sure you, given how healthy your Airbnb business was going, you probably had many people coming in the future. What happened to those people? Well, I, I canceled. I, I called Airbnb and I told them what was going on. I said, I said basically I was advised to stop everything and I sent a message to everybody and said, hey, this is what's going on and this is why I need to, this is why I'm stopping, you know. How many people did they have to cancel or you had to cancel? Uh, it was, uh, there's probably, I would say maybe at least 10. Did you it, have to pay for those cancellations? Um, no, but the way that they have it set up is um, you can just try to help basically if you can look around and see if you can help people find something else or other Airbnbs or the, that sort of thing. But is, so, is, but they was it your job to help people find other? Uh, no, they, they kind of have it set up almost where you can they, to try to solve things amongst yourselves to just to help somebody out. So no, it wasn't necessarily on me, but I did notify everybody as to why and what happened there. Okay. How long have you been in Nashville? Um, I moved here in 2013. At the end of 2013. And you didn't see anything about this stuff on the news or in the papers or anything? Well, I didn't, I guess I didn't realize, I didn't follow, I don't follow a lot of it that closely. Any other questions? And this is your home, right? This owner occupied? Yeah, I do live here. I'm there all the time. Okay. Yeah. Any other questions? Anything else to add? Um, I suppose not at this time. I mean, I have, well, um, I mean, there's obviously I have done this, but, um, you know, without knowing, I just do ask that you would consider it. Um, you know, it is, I don't know if it's a it's more of a joking thing, because I'm sure these, these things come up often, but, you know, although maybe it's a, a petty thing for a lot of people, it does help me specifically, especially financially. That's a huge burden off my shoulders. So, I mean, it, it you know, I, when I did this, I, as soon as I found out, immediately had the intentions of correcting it and doing it the right way. It's just that it caught up later, you know, and it was essentially, and nobody called me or said anything or called me out about it. It was 
I basically went in to do the permit and essentially turned myself in. So, you know, I would ask that you just consider that. Um, okay. Thank you. We're going to close the public yeah. hearing. Uh, Mr. Chairman, the only, yeah, well, yes, the only other thing I'd like to, to ask is that we, I know we have a representative from CODES um, here and just to see if there's um, yes. any information that, that Bob would like well, to share um, about this case. Yes, Bob the Enforcer, come forward. Mr. Osborne. So, um, he is correct. I didn't have any information on this. Um, to my knowledge, he applied on August 5th, and the advertisement was removed roughly that same time. Um, it appears that he was advertising one bedroom in his house, so it, it appears that what he's saying is correct. Thank you. Any questions? Thank you. Okay, discussion. So as more time passes, you know, we would think that people would know. We still get cases every meeting. Oh, I've been renting out my house and I didn't know that there was legislation for years regulating this. What to me is different about this case than others is renting it 30 times. So to me, I think that should be in the consideration of the penalty too. Um, but I guess how do you know, I mean, if you don't know, you don't know, right? I mean, your oh, the tenant's not going to say. And But I think if you are that active in the Airbnb movement, you should have a little bit more kind of knowledge about what our rules are, as opposed to somebody that rents it out once a month. Well, but we've been told that Airbnb doesn't tell, or at one point, I think maybe they've changed that, but they weren't telling anybody. And mostly the people his age, in my opinion, get their news off of Facebook. And I certainly have never seen it on Facebook. I'm on Facebook. So I can see that he may not, truly not have known. Nobody reads the paper except old people like me. <laughs> we love the Tennessean. We have a paper. And the scene. We have a paper, Business I'm asked. Journal. <laughs> well, and, and, I, and I, I mean, I think that there's, I, I, I appreciate the weight that you're putting on it. And I think there's some weight there, but at the same time, you know, if you know, you, you're told you need to come down, if we, I, as far as we know, there's not an environmental court case, so it you know, wasn't necessarily a case of being ratted out and asking for forgiveness. It's a, a, it does appear to be, based on the information we have, of a case of someone recognizing it and then, and then completely doing the right thing. And to me, it's those deviations are, are much more clear, black and white, if there was, you know, if you didn't cancel or if you, you know. But to me, I mean, if you've rented that much, you should be a little bit more attuned to Well, I the think the testimony concept. was it was only, you know, a, a couple of months. But 30 times. I mean, to me, I, that's why I have a problem with this. This is not just somebody well, I, did a few times and <coughs> oops. I, I agree with Chairman in a way. I mean, I, we, we've, I think, been really consistent on uh, our our punishment uh, to ignorance ratio, and, and not just ignorance, but uh, willingness to, to fix the problem and, and address the problem and to, to own the problem. But at the same time, I mean, like, we can't keep doing this. I mean, I think at some point we have to say, you know, and I'm not saying we throw this guy under the bus. No. But if there was <laughs> a Metro right Council here. person that strongly cares about this, they would say, we wrote the laws to say a year for a violation. Right. Now, we allowed you to do something less than a year, but it's basically a year. Yeah. And that's the point to begin with. Sure. That the fine and the punishment is a year. Well, but we don't have any complaints. There have been no drunken brawls there, no property damage, you know, as someone mentioned today, playing ball in their underwear and smoking marijuana. We didn't hear any of that. We hear, we see a beautiful home, and so obviously the notes that the renters made said that he was a caring person, and I'm not bothered by the 39 rentals in that short of a time. Nashville is a hot place, and I can see that you would rent every night if you wanted to, because so many people come here. So well, I guess I'm this, not in the mood to punish him so To harsh. me, this is slightly different. So I actually move that we um, find that the zoning administrator um, did not err in his uh, denial 
of the short-term rental permit um, and that this applicant have to wait three more months to get his permit back. I second that. Okay, motion's been made and seconded. Any discussion? It seems to me, and I, I want to give a lot of weight and respect to your thought, but that is pretty significant, I think, based on what we've been doing. Would you consider uh, 45 days? Would you consider amending your motion? The reason not, the, the council, if the council people were here, they'd be like saying, it's a year, and we are giving them much less than a year, even with three months. I don't disagree. However, it is owner-occupied. It's $63 a night. It's not one of the situations that I think the, this is not the situation that is concerning to neighbors or the council so much mm -hmm. as the non-owner occupied that are really changing our neighborhoods. So I, I just, I want us to be a consistent board. I certainly don't disagree with you, Chairman. I just think in light of the punishment we've done before, yeah. it and seems well, a little and, and I tend to, I, I mean, I, I do agree just for those reasons. And, and I mean, there, there is a, a kernel in the back of my head uh, saying, you know, enough, enough, you know, wh at what point, you know, the, the questions that are being raised, maybe you've gotten to that point a little sooner than I have and, and we'll get there too. But, but again, owner occupied, it's a room, not a home. It's that's being rented uh, from what we can tell. I mean, I, I would be inclined to say, you know, eligible tomorrow, next week. I'm, can, you know, a month is something that, if that's consensus, I think, but to me, much more than that is probably too much for me. I mean, I'm, I'm, okay. I'm with Alma on this one. And okay, well, we have a motion on the floor for three months, which has been made and seconded. Any more discussion before we vote? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Okay, the motion fails four to three. So does anyone else have a motion? Uh, I would make a motion that we find that the zoning administrator did not err and that we wait a period of 30 days before this applicant is allowed to apply. And I second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor. I want to address that. This has been going on. More and more people are starting to come out. Hopefully. We'll get to a point where people realize, gee, we better follow the law. We're going to be shut completely out. So I will go along with a reduction of this thing and let people know if you get caught very in the very near future, we may shut you completely out of it if we can. Yeah, and to me, like I said, this is about, this is different from other cases because he rented it so much, and I would think that you'd be a little bit up to speed if that is a very common occurrence. So we have a motion for 30 days, and it's been properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing no more, all those in favor of the motion, signify by saying aye. 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 Okay, opposed? I'll say no, actually. Okay. Pass it six, Pass to, it one. six to one. See. So what so. this means is in 30 days, <coughs> you can apply to get your permit. Mm -hmm. Doesn't mean you get your permit, you have to still go through the process. Mm -hmm. But in the next 30 days, you are not allowed to post, advertise, and definitely not have anyone in your house. Mm -hmm. And then after that, you are eligible. Okay. okay. Thank you. Yes, um, we want to take a little break. Okay, let's take a five minute break, uh, but in light of the very long agenda, let's please keep it to five. <laughs> Okay, everybody, we're going to call the Board of Zoning Appeals back to order. Mr. Chairman, I've been informed that case number 254 
It is located at 5636 Old Ricky Boulevard. It's a sidewalk variance. It was originally on our consent. We had opposition to it. The parties have met. There is no longer any opposition. And I wondered if you'd like to take a motion to roll it back on yeah, the consent. I'm there is a condition associated with it that we will pin into the record. Okay. Uh, I move that case 254 be put back on consent with the conditions. Sir. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? 254 is passed on consent. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. We will move to the next case. The next case is case 2017-232. It is Regents Bank Appellant and AEW Capital Management owner of the property located at 154th Avenue North, requesting an item A appeal, a challenge challenging the issuance of the building permit in the DTC district to stop construction. This was referred to the board under section 1740.180A. The appellant has alleged that the board would have jurisdiction under 17.40.180A. Uh, Mr. Chairman, this is a sign permit that our department issued. Uh, I know that we have Mr. Calvin, Mr. Lee here uh, in opposition. We've got Mr. Murphy for the appellant. How many people are in support of this in the audience? Raise your hand. In support? And in, in favor of, I guess, the sign, the issuance of the permit for this sign to stay there. I think that's the opposite. We are in support of Regents Bank and their... Okay. Who's in support of Regents Bank's side of this? Raise your hand. Okay. And, okay. So, Mr. Herbert. Comes Mr. Uh, I'm sorry, did, but the owner of the property is appealing a sign on their own property? Yes. And so the owner of the property doesn't have the right to stop someone from building a sign on their property? So perhaps uh, some explanation is warranted. So... <laughs> not, not the first time we've heard a case like this, believe it or not. <laughs> and and so Mr. Murphy of, and... Of course, the most famous skyscraper nickname in Nashville is Batman. This building was affectionately called uh, R2-D2 years ago, but it didn't stick as much as Batman. So. so Mr. Murphy and Mr. Lee will put the meat on the bones, but here's substantially what happened. Um, we work, approached our department requesting a sign permit for this building, a skyline sign. This building is located in the downtown code base zoning district. It is also located within an MDHA redevelopment district. There are two base zonings that our department has no jurisdiction over. The first one is an SP, the second one is the DTC, the downtown code. We, the zoning department and codes, do not administer those two base zonings. They are administered by the planning department. So if there's a conflict between the two, what happens? So, if I can go forward with what happened here. So, this is also, this building is located within an MDHA redevelopment district. MDHA has its own regulations, which we also do not administer. So. There is a sign code that is different from the regular sign code that's, that's applicable throughout the entire county. It's called the downtown sign code. It's only for the downtown area. So it is the codes department responsibility to look at permits applications to determine whether or not it meets the threshold requirements for compliance with the downtown sign code. Is it safe to say, Mr. Herbert, that the downtown sign code is a little more liberal than the rest of the sign code as far as the kind of signs that you could have? I think it is probably more liberal, yes. It is a completely different document. It's a completely why, different... Why do we have a downtown sign code? Why can't the whole city be under one sign code? Well, obviously, the downtown area is different uh, than other places throughout the county, and so the council and the planning departments determined that the signage in the downtown area likewise should be different, different type of character. So we have a different code that's applicable. Our job at zoning is to look at that document and see whether or not applications for signs meet the black letter of the law under that document. We reviewed it and we denied it. 
We said it did not. Oh, wait, wait, wait a minute. So you reviewed this sign that has been proposed, the WeWork sign. Correct. And it was denied by you or in your office. That's correct. So how? Did because it did not meet the requirements of the downtown sign code. Oh, you thought it didn't meet the requirements, is it? We, it was our determination, determination that it did not meet the requirements for the downtown sign code. So we denied it. Now, because it is located within the downtown code base zone district and within a redevelopment district administered by MDHA, there is an appeal process. And that appeal process goes to the MDHA slash planning uh, design review committee. So our denial of the permit was appealed to the MDHA planning design review committee. That committee heard the appeal and approved it. When they approved it, it is their jurisdiction and they said issue the permit we turned around and issued the permit. That was our involvement. So we are here today because? Because the design review committee that we are not part of and that we do not sit on approved their modification to allow this sign to be placed on this building in the location where it presently is. Do we have jurisdiction to hear this case? I guess this is Marbury versus Madison. Once again, it's on our agenda, so I'm assuming we do. So we, I issued the permit in accordance with which the, the design review committee ordered us to do. We issued the permit. Now, this is an appeal, an item A appeal, of our issuance of the permit that we were ordered so to So even do. though MDHA review committee <coughs> said, you know, we approve this, at the end of the day, you issued the permit. That so is we correct. get to overturn you or affirm your decision. So that fits within our item A. That's correct. So, okay. and go ahead. Well, I, I was just gonna ask if you, and th this is making the, the appellant's argument, but it was your argument. I, apparently since you denied it originally saying that what wh why did you deny it originally why would it's in your opinion it uh, did it violate the uh, downtown code signage code i thought you might ask <laughs> um so the downtown sign code has a provision for a skyline signs and it says that a skyline sign cannot the width of the skyline sign cannot exceed 60% of the, of the width of that facade. The plan that we got showed a sign that was 100% of the width of, this, of the facade. So I've got a picture and I'll share this with Mr. Murphy. No. We determined that this, this was the location for the sign on that facade and building. And there's the application. And here's the application. And looking at it, the sign itself was 100% of the facade that we were looking at. So we had to deny it because the downtown code only allows the sign to be 60% of the width of the facade. So we denied it and that was the basis for the appeal. Now, you might ask that there's another sign that appears to be close to 100%. That went through the same design review committee process and not likewise was approved previously. So here, I'll pass that around. Uh, Mr. Herbert, I don't know, maybe this, you're not the appropriate person to ask this, but uh, why is remedy being sought here rather than continuing through the MDHA appeal uh, process? I think that that's a question for Mr. Murphy, who I'm sure is well prepared to answer that for you. So Mr. Herbert, getting back to what you said, you didn't uh, disapprove the permit originally because it was two extra signs, meaning four on top of the building. It just had to do with the width. That's correct. <coughs> and when you all determine the facade it's an, it's an octagonal building, and so you're saying it's an eight-sided building, each side is a facade rather than a square with the corners chopped off, and that was our determination. Okay. Okay, let's go. 
Mr. Murphy. Mr. Chair, Jim Murphy, 1600 Division Street. On behalf of Regions, uh, with me is Frank Schreiner from Regions. Uh, I think his office is at one national place in the building in question, um, which is, I think, 154th Avenue. Um, so I will go through a couple of the issues that Mr. Herbert's raised as a preliminary matter because I think it will help frame the issues a little bit better. Um, I think Mr. Taylor actually has hit upon what ultimately the design review committee decided on the 60% of the facade width, which is they viewed this building as having four facades and the two small blank spaces they treated as one facade for purposes of meeting the 60%. And apparently they had done that previously when Regions got their sign approved several years ago. So Regions sign has been up, I think since 2015. Um, and so that was, in fact, as, as Mr. Herbert pointed out, that was the original basis for the denial of the, of the sign by, by the Coast Department, but there was another basis as well, and that was at the time the Codes Department was presented with the sign, it had not been reviewed by the Design Review Committee. And so that was another reason. It had to get a review by the Design Review Committee before they could issue the permit. So there were two grounds for the denial, of uh, the 60% and the um, fact that the Design Review Committee had not heard the case at the time. So Mr. Uh, Murphy, the other quick question was, why are you in front of us? Well, and Mr. Herbert, Mr. Herbert pointed out, he is the final decision maker. He issues the permit. And so we're appealing the issuance of the permit. MBHA, the Design Review Committee, doesn't issue permits. Only the, only the codes department, through the zoning administrator, issues the permit. And so that's why this board has uh, jurisdiction over this. This is, this this is a weird situation because of the way the downtown code is set up. As Mr. Herbert points out, depending on where you are downtown, the, the signage review is performed either by MDHA's design review committee if you're in a redevelopment district or from a design review committee that the planning commission creates uh, for properties that are not in the redevelopment district. But then they just they they transmit to the codes department their decision and then the zoning administrator has to issue the permits and so that's the basis for this appeal is the issuance of the permit so i guess that the i'm sorry the, the question i have is why was the design review committee right two years ago when they approved the region sign and wrong uh, this summer when they approved the other sign. That's a good question. Which seem to be identical signs. I mean, not identical, they say different things, but right. in terms of how they, the size of the sign and how it fits on the building, it seems to be identical. Okay, that's a good question. We're not appealing that the sign exceeds the 60% of the facade width. That's not the basis for our appeal. Our appeal is based on the fact that there's too much signage on this building under the downtown code. And so that even even though we believe the Re we work sign meets the 60% requirement, we, we think that the design review committee was right on that issue, but they were wrong in how much additional signs signage that they permitted on this building. And so that is a function of what the downtown code provides regarding signage, skyline signage. As Mr. Herbert points out, uh, the downtown code has its own uh, requirements for uh, signage. And this is a picture of the sign taken from one of the uh, units at the uh, Viridian. And so that that's the sign in its current location. There's two, there are actually two signs, one on the, facing the Viridian and one facing the opposite side. And that is the combination of the additional square footage from those two signs with, that's what causes it to exceed the maximum permitted square footage. So you first have to go at how do you determine what is the maximum permitted square footage? Because that's the, that's the question that is at issue here. The way the downtown code does this, and I've provided here kind of a step-by-step, -step, it provides footage based on the street type. It has different types of streets. And both of these streets were, were considered pedestrian streets. And if you'll go to the next page, the next slide, 
Printer's Alley is also designated as a street, or at least a portion of Printer's Alley is designated as a street in the downtown code. And so when you're on that portion of Printer's Alley, that is designated as a street, then you can, then basically you might have three street frontages. If this, if it had been in this situation, because this property fronts on Fourth Commerce and Printers Alley. But the problem for this site is that the portion of Printers Alley highlighted in purple in the downtown code is not designated as a street. It's just an alley. The portion of Printers Alley that's designated as a street is between. Uh, church and union, not between union and commerce. And so what they did when they looked at the permitted signage, they used the test as if this had three street frontages. And the test is 720 uh, square feet of signage, I think is the number of times. If you go to the next slide, I actually put the math on here because I'm so bad at math, I can't keep up with things like that. But it's 720 square footage of signed per allowable street front. And here, there's only two street frontages, not three. And so when you add those two together, you come up with um, a total maximum permitted signage of 1,440 square feet. The current signage on the building that Regions has had up there for two years is 990 square feet. So the two region of the two WeWork signs are an additional 990 square feet. So that causes those signages to exceed the 1440 cap. So that's the basis of our appeal. So if, if there were, if their sign was slightly smaller, you wouldn't be opposed at all to them having one sign instead of two? Correct. That's correct. That's correct. We're, we're all, it's all about size. It's all about size. That's the basis of our challenge is that it's, it's the maximum size. Uh, you know, I think you'll hear from some uh, supporters from the Viridian who would prefer the signage that faces them to go away because it's uh, causing problems uh, for them uh, as far as the light shining in their units at night and things like that. But that would be a, an acceptable solution if it were just one slightly smaller sign. That would meet the requirement. So for that reason, uh, we believe that the decision from the zoning administrator um, approving the building, the signage permit for this WeWork sign, the two WeWork signs should be reversed. And so why, why was this not obvious to the MDHA design review board? I don't, I do not, I can't answer that question. I think because they read it as printer's alley and didn't look at the map which said printer's alley, it d differentiated how you treated printer's alley uh, on one side of um, church and the other. Why do you think Printer's Alley got chopped up like that? And if you read, ways? if you read the the text of the downtown code, it talks about the portion of Printer's Alley that has um, retail on the ground floor, and that really is the uh, and and retail restaurants or other uses that enter and exit on the ground floor, and that's what happens more up between that and between segment, church and commerce. But, that between church and commerce. So if you read the text, it makes sense. Okay. So that's the basis for our appeal. I told you we would try to be quick, so. Is there anyone else that you want to speak out in favor on your yeah, side? There, well, there are some neighbors here, and we'll step back and let them come okay. and, and speak. Hear and from then, some neighbors. And then I'll reserve a couple minutes for uh, rebuttal, just. Absolutely. <coughs> Thank you. Okay. Please state your name for the record and your address. Good afternoon, commissioners. My name is uh, Brenda Sanderson. I live at 415 Church Street, which is also the Viridian. Um, we're here to support, I have a couple of other residents from the Viridian here as well. I'm also, let me mention that I'm also the president of the Viridian HOA. Um, we are here to support the removal of the sign. And the reason being is our, our argument of why it needs to go, it comes very simply from the downtown code. There is a, there is a section 
on page 104, 17.37 of the Downtown Code that reads, large electronic or illuminated signs shall not adversely impact residential or hotel users. This is a picture from my bedroom, sitting on my bed. And I have some other copies I'd be glad to share with you. And there's other residents. This, this affects everyone on the east side of the building, particularly upper floors. I believe that someone and their, and their zeal to approve the sign totally disregarded the impact it would have on residents. We have more vertical communities in downtown Nashville, and we're going to be getting more. So when we talk about signs on buildings, there needs to be, it needs to be looked at, is this sign going to impact the well-being of residents? We residents of Meridian have been there 10 years. We're not the new kid on the block. And I, more than anybody, you, I know quite a few of you, you know I'm all about signs. You know I am, but, and, and when I get in an argument about signs, I'm usually on their side, but we have to deal with historical, and I understand that, and I also understand why there's a lot of different sign codes for different areas in Nashville, and this is a perfect example. Moving forward in the future, when a permit is issued for a sign, you've got to make sure you're not creating an episode of Kramer here, where the light is shining in the window and people can't sleep or, or whatever. But this is a huge sign. You've seen some pictures from, from the nighttime. This is a big sign. It's huge. So I think there was some, maybe some overzealousness in allowing the sign in the first place. Viridian residents, I, speaking for myself, I'm one. I'd love to go, I'd love for that sign on that side to go away. That would be my first choice. Does anyone have any questions yeah. for me? Questions. So we have a lot of letters from your residents and many of them shared views of this <coughs> sign from their various floors and it does seem very close and bright, I guess. Talk Some of them probably weren't as nice as I was <laughs> right now. Talk to us about the brightness of this sign because your basis on this is the downtown code restricts signs that are going to impact residential, but talk about the brightness. Well. And some of the others may want to mention that as well. Fortunately, I have some pretty thick blackout curtains on our bedroom, our personal bedroom window. But a lot of them, it's not just the bedroom. I mean, it's in your living room, it's in your kitchen. You know, from our terrace, we have a terrace, and it's and it's like having street lights on your terrace. But um, it's not. It's it's very bright. It's like sort of like having an airport runway light shining in your window. Questions? Okay, thank you. Um, we are, is there anybody else that briefly wants to speak? Uh, I know Mr. Murphy wants some time left for rebuttal. So. Uh, thank you. Thank you. Is there anyone else on this side that is going to speak? Seeing none, I know that we have Mr. Calvin Lee, who is the attorney uh, who is on the opposite side of this. Mr. Lee, would you like to come forward? Yes. Please state your name for the record, your address, and who you're representing. Sure, my name is Calvin Lee. Um, I'm from 15050 Avenue, uh, Long Island City, New York. I am corporate counsel for WeWork. I have Scotty Coleman with me, who is our community, community director for Nashville. He's relocating to Nashville currently but he's working out of our offices, our temporary offices in one Nashville place where the sign is located. So why is Mr. Herbert, um, I guess, his decision, you actually think that your sign should stay up there? Why do you believe that? Well, Mr. Murphy said that this is all about size, and if that is the case, then I agree with Mr. Herbert what he said that this is not the venue or the forum to discuss that. The Design Review Committee was the uh, authority that looked at that and- But let me stop you there, because you went to law school as I went to law school, 
and I said earlier, it's kind of Mad Marbury versus Madison. It's here, you're here, you shouldn't assume that we don't have jurisdiction. We understand, and we stand by the MDHA Review Committee's interpretation that this is a four-sided building. They, I have their approval of our sign right here. It was conditioned that there are no other signs to be put up on that building. They're only allowing four signs because they are finding that as a four-sided building. I guess that, the, but the, the opposition is, I don't think they're contesting that at all. I mean, they, they said, is in terms of, um, in terms of the percentage of the facade that can be covered, uh, they're they're saying that this is 60 percent. I mean, they they are they they're not contesting that. Is what he said. So, I mean, their their only argument to us was that it exceeds the maximum allowed square footage of signage for that building, which I think deals with uh, Printer's Alley and whether that's a street or not. So, uh, they're not contesting the four sidedness of in terms of the 60 percent. The zoning administrator had a different opinion that he expressed when he first denied it, but that argument was his and uh, not the, the folks that are bringing the appeal. I understand, and the design review committee considered that fact also, and we made a presentation in that um, meeting, and uh, they decided that it was um, a, that they accepted the, our argument that it was a three, that there were three streets uh, to calculate the amount of signage on that building. Um, we, um, uh, I'm sorry, so, so what are you basing the, the three streets on? Why, yeah, that, that, that's how, how are you back what is, what is your argument on it being three streets? I don't have that information in front of us. That was um, a presentation that our signage consultant um, and our designers sat with um, the design review, review committee um, to work out. We, um, we know that we are new to your neighborhood um, and we don't want to be intrusive. We, um, in early December, reached out to um, the different planning um, departments here. We were working with Mr. Herbert's department very closely. They advised us on the process. We went through the process uh, in good faith. Um, we understand that there has been some uh, complaints about the brightness of the sign. Uh, there was a recent uh, newspaper article that came out. Since then, we've been trying to address that and finding solutions. Um, you know, let's, that let's talk about the brightness. How many foot candles is that sign? Uh, <clears throat> that I am not sure as well. You don't know? I mean, that's a big issue because if you've heard Ms. Sanderson talk about our code, the brightness is part of the downtown code. And you can't tell me how many foot candles that sign is? I was told by our consultants that there is no luminosity um, uh, code that, that our sign falls under. <coughs> But that wasn't the question I asked. The question is, you know, foot candles is a measured brightness standard in the sign industry, and you don't even know what that number is. So how do you know if it's, how do we know if it's too bright or not? We have testimony that you can't really, you have to have super blackout curtains or you see this all the time. We were, when we designed the sign, we were not aware of how obtrusive it would be. Um, and we apologize if it is. Uh, we are willing to come to the table and, and speak with the residents of Viridian. We have spoken to some. We've met with Councilman O'Connell, who was quoted in the newspaper. He's willing to facil facilitate meetings with the HOA um, to come, with, come up with the solution. Our designers have looked into putting a dimmer onto that sign and a timer so that we can turn it off after a certain time. Um, Would you be willing to remove the sign that faces the Viridian? That is not an option that we uh, are considering right now. Why not? Um, we, I mean, we truly believe that we, uh, were, we followed all the processes necessary to put the sign up. We expended significant um, amounts of money to put that sign up, to fabricate it. Um, 
we obviously want to be good neighbors and we want to find a solution. And if luminosity is the issue at night, then um, I think taking the sign down doesn't, isn't the only way to fix that. I, I guess, you know, and I, I understand, I appreciate the options you're looking at, but you know, and, and <clears throat> I, I don't know that, that this board has the, uh, the authority to say you're gonna have to take a sign down, but we definitely have, well, it sounds we, like the authority to say that if we that overturn the zoning administrator's permit, then the, right, right, the effective right. then, if, then if they both no come permit. down. Yep. Um, you know, and and so it's a little frustrating and, and to not have a an argument about the the street, which is apparently what uh, allows um, the building to have the amount of signage that it does. Um, and, and so I, I, I'm not sure, you know, other than we can ask uh, if there's to, to read the code or something to, to help us understand it better. But uh, well, I mean, this it, board, I, I'm pretty frustrated uh, with the lack of information uh -huh. in defense of that you guys yeah. have. I mean, this board operates often on what's put in front of us and we have to, both sides are, are represented by lawyers. So sometimes we have to go based on what that is. I mean, I, I, you know, you, I look at the building and, and, and there's a sense of equity in terms of the signage that says, well, you know, Regents has a big sign, you have a big sign, they are all each on each facade. That seems uh, fair on the surface, but the code says, which the appellants have, or the, uh, I'll say the opposition because in the item A cases, I'm never really sure who the appellant is. But, um, but the other side is saying that no, this is this is the MDHA folks misinterpreted the law and said something was a street and, it, and we don't think it is. And you guys have to decide if it's a street because that's what gives you the square footage to do that. Um, and and I, I need I need something from y'all to tell me they're wrong because I, that's all I got is <laughs> what they're telling me. No, on that or, or, what? Yeah. Uh, all I would add is, I think in response to what you were saying, is that this is an item A appeal of Mr. Herbert's decision to grant the permit um, as approved by the MDHA. So if you all think that he erred in granting the permit, as approved by, MB, you know, it, I'm sorry, by the D Design Review Committee. The Design, Design Review Committee directed him to uh, grant the permit, which is what he did. So um, that's the issue we're here on is whether or not he erred in granting the right. permit based on the Design Review Committee. Right, and, and, so, and, and well, we since, he, since he testified that he wasn't, he didn't think it was eligible for a permit anyway, that's why I'm, I, I, I kind of say we're overriding the MDHA Design Review Committee because just to be clear of whose opinion it is that, I mean, they're the ones that directed him to do the permit, which he had to do. I, I don't know, maybe semantics, but I, I just wanna keep, but that's, yes. What you said is so, what I, what, I, what you said is what I'm thinking. So getting back to our party in front of us, any, any questions for? Well, I, I had asked earlier, uh, I think I asked, or maybe I thought it and someone else asked it, but it, you said that you agreed with MDHA's assessment of the classification of the streets, specifically which part of Printer's Alley was the street and which what wasn't. But I mean, I, I, if, if I'm understanding the previous presentation correctly, I mean, that's codified. I mean, that's, I don't know that that's something that's up for interpretation. Do you? I know that our signage consultants had multiple meetings with the design re review committee. I know this question came up and I knew that they were satisfied with our um, explanation on why that should be that should be considered the street and part of the calculation. What was that explanation? I unfortunately do not have that in front of me. Any other questions? Do you have anything else to add? I 
do not. Thank you for your time. Okay. Let's hear from the other side. Unless you have anything else to add. Mr. Murphy, come back. I have a brief comment and rebuttal, and I promise it'll be brief. And I'm going to hand up this this graphic is actually attached to our letter, but I'm going to hand it back up because this one is a much better copy, maybe, of the downtown code, page 107. And if you look, there's one portion of Turner's Alley that's highlighted in green and is identified as a street, and that's the portion between uh, church and union, and the portion between church and commerce is not. So as I think Mr. Ewing might have said, or one of you, if I'm giving it, somebody said this, it was probably one of the Davids, but I'm not sure exactly which one. There's no always a safe guess. Yes, I was gonna say, that's a pretty good guess here in this group. Uh, there's really nothing to interpret here on whether the portion of Printer's Alley between um, commerce and church is a street. It's not shown as part of the street designation on the map. So for that reason, we think the permit was issued in error because this, these, the total signs exceed the permitted signage on this building. So, um, the, the I guess the question I have about the signage is, you know, we're, we're saying the maximum signage that's actually already been applied to the building is too much, and right. I mean, you, you're saying that that your building is in violation of the code because, or your client's building is in violation of the actually, code. Actually, actually, I represent regions. We're a right. tenant, so. Who, who represents the owner? Because the owner was. I a, don't think the owner is. But the owner is named in the appeal. What? I didn't. I filed the appeal. I didn't file it for the owner. I filed okay. it for regions. So we're not sure how that, that happened. Yeah. But okay. I, I suspect just because they were the landowner, they were. Okay. They, they just always it's just labeled yes, that way. I okay. think that's. That I makes think, sense. I think y'all asked that question earlier, and I forgot to answer it. But I think that's the case. Okay. So all right. Um, and so and so it's your contention that that. When that sign went up, it became in violation, and that's why it goes down instead of any other sign. Craig. Okay. A little bit of historical background on Printer's Alley, I think, is relevant for why these two districts are the same way. Um, the district between Union Street and Church Street was the more popular part. Uh, if you remember the Brass Stables and Skull's Rainbow Room and all the Embers and all these other um, Captain's Table. So to me, that was the more touristy part. The area between Church Street and Commerce Street did not have as many places like that. So I could see the city calling the Printer's Alley one, which had a lot of foot traffic, a lot of restaurants, a lot of popularity, um, and the other one less. Printer's Alley actually historically used to start in Dedrick Street and go went down all the way to Broadway. Um, but so to me, that makes sense. and. I think for that reason, that's why we're probably here too. Mr. Murphy, you didn't talk much about brightness and some of your people did. Um, Ob obviously we're concerned about that as well, although it affects it, my clients in the building so they don't have the brightness okay. problem as the Viridian yeah. folks do. The sure. Viridian folks really have the brightness impact more so yeah, So than your my client, client the bank, yeah, that's not as big a deal. Okay, gotcha. But you still think that's an issue, though? Uh, it, obviously it is, because it's having an impact on, it, it's too much signage, and have, in, in, in addition to being too much, it's also having an adverse impact on the surrounding neighborhood. So I think those are both issues. <coughs> okay. Thank you. The presentation materials are very good and helpful. So printer, as I'm looking at this code, the printer's alley and you're saying it's highlighted in green, and I understand what you're marking there. And is the remainder what goes the rest of the way to Commerce Street, it d has no highlighting. So That's it's, correct. It's, it's just a, an alley. It's that's just why like it would any be other alley. Under the code. That's right. Okay. And so th there's no dispute that the Printer's Alley street type itself, <coughs> under the code, does allow for a sign, but it's your position only in the portion that is highlighted in green. Would that apply? That is correct. Okay. Yeah, I mean, Mr. Murphy, you probably remember when you were Metro Legal Director that the city wanted to regulate exotic dancing in Printer's Alley, and the council basically carved out a nice little exception for that area only in town. So that area has always been kind of treated differently in the code, right? 
I am extremely familiar with our history of regulating adult establishments in Nashville. In fact, I was involved in several litigation matters over my tenure. But in fact, issue. wasn't that particular area? You know, it was down? at one point. Ultimately, what they ended up doing was everything basically within the inner loop was designated as the area. But originally, I know the Printer Valley people At one time, it was, the, it, was the, it was designated, and then they, we, we had an issue as to whether we had designated enough area in the sure. county to provide those kinds of establishments, and that's one of the issues under the First Amendment is do you have enough to sure. provide areas of opportunity, and so the area was eventually changed to the area within the interval. So, Mr. Murphy, you're saying that these rules kind of dividing Printer's Alley into two places, that's not arbitrary. There's just, there's a real logic behind yeah, this. I think exactly the the logic you described, There, the uses of the streets are different. The portion between commerce and um, and uh, church really is, it, 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 there's not any pedestrian, there's very little pedestrian traffic there. It's more of a vehicle, vehicular ingress and egress. And so again, if you read the rationale in the code for treating Printer's Alley as a street, it talks about just exactly what you talked about, the fact that it had pedestrian traffic because of its ground floor uh, retail, restaurant, bar, nightclub use. So, I mean, your client is a big tenant, obviously, in the building. They didn't know that this was going to go up until it kind of went up? Uh, they were aware that the permit had been denied, but they didn't find out until after the permit had been granted that it had occurred. So, Any other questions for Mr. Murphy? <coughs> Okay. Thank you. Mr. Herbert, um, one last shot. Why did you um, issue this permit? So let me just say this. Um, I do not believe that I have the authority to review or override the decision of the Design Review Committee. And I guess the the question I have is to you is based on the testimony that we've heard from Mr. Murphy about um, Printer's Alley and that section of it being a street. Is it your understanding that the section he's talking about uh, that touches this property is an alley and not technically a street? Is that your belief too? Or I have no understanding of any of it. And the reason is, I didn't review it on that right. basis. Okay. I was not part of the design review committee. I was not at that table. Okay. I was not part of that decision. And I don't believe that I've got the authority to review their decision or override it. Okay. And to follow up on that, um, I think it's important to clarify that on this item A appeal, the decision before you is not whether or not the design review committee made a an incorrect decision. That would go, in yes. fact, to a different board. It's Mr. Um, Herbert. This is right. typical I mean, item A. Didn't that decision would go, not? per the downtown code, that would go to a different board. The decision you're here today is to make today is whether or not he acted in error in granting the permit based on what they did, not whether or not they made a mistake. Being an error of Mr. Herbert when he's essentially ordered to issue a permit. I think the, the board would have to determine that he does have the authority to review the downtown, I'm sorry, the MDHA Design Review Committee's ruling. Um, I, mean, I, think the, I think the code is clear that if, if the, an appeal of the uh, MDHA DRC's decision, it, it says it may be appealed to the Planning Commission by the applicant or the Planning Department. So, so if you all are going to determine that the zoning administrator acted in error, you would have to determine that he does, in fact, have the authority to um, over override the design I'm not review necessarily committee. sure if that's true. I think we can it's in the code. Read, read the part of the code there that says that. Any determination made about the DTC DRC or the MDHA DRC regarding standards of the DTC may be appealed to the planning commission by the applicant or the planning department. No, what I'm saying is, 
if we said Mr. Herbert is in error, I don't think we have to say he doesn't have the authority to do, that's what I was saying. Well, then you would have to say what error he made. Like, yes, you know, okay. why, why did he make an error? What is the sure. legal error he made? Right. That's what I was saying. And, and I, I was saying, based on his statement that he didn't have the authority to do that, y'all, that was just- But I think we can rule that he's an error without getting into whether he has the authority. He issued the permit, we're deciding whether he was an error or not. I think that's correct. I think you need, if you're clear what the error is. Yep. okay. I think the public hearing is closed, but can we ask Mr. Murphy why he didn't go to the planning commission with the appeal? Did we? Did we? I don't know. Him? He's sitting yeah, back I'm, I'm down. Okay, Mr. Murphy, come. Why are you here? <laughs> you could have been oh. sitting here the second and fourth he, Thursday, and he did. He did answer earlier uh, uh, because. Well, I'll just let him answer. Yeah, there's, there, it's a multi-layered uh, answer. This, Mr. Herbert and I had long discussion about this because it's not the model of clarity how you proceed in this matter. Uh, the language that was cited to you provides that the appellant, I mean the applicant, which would be WeWorks, or the planning department can appeal to the planning commission. I don't represent either of those people, so I don't have any basis to appeal to the Planning Commission because I'm not the applicant and I'm not the Planning Commission staff. So for that reason, that's the first problem I have. The second problem I have is that's not the final decision. The final decision here is the issuance of the permit, and that's the decision that we're appealing. Okay, does that answer the question? And, and the error, with the specific error that you're citing is the square footage of the signage and that made it ineligible for a permit. Correct. Regardless of how it was determined in the codes department. Correct, or, that it, or the design review committee. Or who, who However the process occurred, the permit is an issued in error. Okay, thank, thank you. you. Close the public hearing again. Discussion? It's, it's a very, uh, I think it's a very clever argument that Mr. Murphy's making because he's, uh, he's, he's sort of washing away all the, the who told whom to do what to whom. And he's saying, uh, forget all that. Uh, there's one specific piece in the code that was in his presentation and it's a calculation. How much signage is allowed on a building? I don't care from where it's calculated or how you calculate what a facade is, what isn't a facade, there's a total number, they're over it. And when that number was surpassed, they, that's when the error occurred. When, when that number added up to be more than the minimum or the maximum number, an error occurred. So speaking of error, did the zoning administrator make an I, error? I believe uh, using that, and we have the image on our screens now, I, I believe that is where an error occurred. I do believe the zoning administrator erred in that matter. Does anyone want to make a motion? Uh, I will move that we find uh, for the appellant that the uh, zoning administrator did err in issuing the permit uh, for the reasons I mentioned, the square footage calculations. I will. I mean, I'm just like discussion. Do we need to do it specifically and say that once the calculation was over, they can have a sign. They just can't have as much sign yes. as they have. Yes. Yes. So yeah, that, that, that is exactly what I'm And saying. I would like to add um, that the it is also an error, the downtown sign code with the brightness as it reflects to a close by residential building. Is that acceptable? I'll accept that. Okay, then I'll second it. Uh, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion uh, signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. Overturning the zoning administrator. The next case is case 2017-233.
Oman Gibson Associates Appellant and 2932 Foster Creighton, owner of the property located at 2932 Foster Creighton Drive, requesting variances from the sidewalk and queuing requirements in the IR district to construct a new 1,533 square foot addition. It's referred to the board under section 17.20.060F6, 1720.120C1A, 1724.030, 1720.150B. The appellant has alleged that the board would have jurisdiction under 1740.180B. And do we have opposition to this case? Seeing no opposition, we have 10 minutes. Mr. Applicant. Mr. Fulmer. Uh, thank you, members of the board. I'm Jay Fulmer, 2002 Richard Jones Road, uh, and I'm here with Charles Watkins. Charles Watkins, uh, 2932 Foster Creighton Drive. Uh, so we're, we're here for two purposes. Uh, they are adding an expansion out the rear of their building. Uh, currently, they've been operating in that building since they bought it up, I think, about eight years ago. And um, the same number of people just need a little more space. And so there's the existing parking lot that currently uh, violates the queuing distance. And so when we renovate the building, um, yeah, we'd like that asphalt area to remain. Yeah, it just helps with their, their parking and circulation. Uh, it's how they've been using it the last eight years, and uh, there hasn't been any negative impact. Um, you know, we've been in communication with the neighbors, and, and nobody has any opposition. <clears throat> I've, uh, I've also talked to Mike Freeman about the, uh, about the request, and he didn't have any opposition either. Um, I did fail to get him to, to write an email uh, or anything documented, but... Um, but we have discussed this. The, the secondary request is within the last two years, Metro built sidewalks from Thompson Lane uh, all the way down to the south, down Foster Creighton for, I think about a mile. Those do not have a grass strip, so they are substandard. Uh, and, and therefore to leave them in place, it requires a variance and approval by the board. Uh, and so we are requesting a variance. Uh, the planning or the public works department um, has been supportive and the planning department was supportive. Uh, they did make the recommendation that there's the condition for us to pay the in lieu of fee. Um, you know, we, we understand the in lieu of uh, perspective, but I think this is a little bit of a unique case uh, where taxpayers paid for this sidewalk within the last two years. And so we, at the end of the day, we would like approval for the variance, but um, you know, we're, we're also would like your opinion on whether or not the Lua fee is appropriate. And so if, if you feel that it is, then you know, we'd be happy to oblige, but uh, you know, given that it was a publicly funded project in the last two years, uh, I'm not sure if it's fair to the owner to then pay again. Okay. Questions? Mr. Chairman, yes, I think I need to recuse myself. Okay, I'm, I'm employed to appellant for personal pro property. So, I mean, okay, that's fine. So, to remind the board of recusals, and it's a personal decision, you recuse yourself and then I guess leave the okay. area. Um, if you feel that you have some conflict, usually it's a family member, maybe uh, someone you work with, or you have a financial interest in that property. So, but it's up to the person. Yes. This is two properties down. Mm -hmm. They uh, have a similar condition, uh, but those, I'm just letting everybody know, those are not pictures of uh, the, the 2932. Okay. Questions? Let's hear from planning and our sidewalk guru. He'll tell us why. So we've Metro built some very beautiful sidewalks out here near Hundred Oaks, and uh, you're telling them they should what? Uh, so our recommendation so please is, identify to pay, yourself for the is, is to approve the variance, but to pay the in lieu fee. Um, it, it is correct. Metro has recently built sidewalks in this area. Um, we did a little bit of research to look back um, to see if they were actually brand new sidewalks um, to where there, there wasn't any along the street in this case. Um, 
we, we look back several years of Google Street View photos and there were sidewalks there. So the, the project more than likely in this area was simply a, a rehab or a replacement of the existing sidewalk. So in those instances, public works usually, um, if they can get improvements to it within the existing right of way, they will. Um, but if, if it's not achievable, um, they usually put back the same design that's there. Questions? Oh, thanks for being here. Anything else to add? No, sir. Okay, let's close the public hearing discussion. So ever since, I guess it's been now about six months now that the new sidewalk ordinance passed, this is triggering a lot of these kind of cases. And the question here, and we've had a couple cases like this, that there's a fairly new sidewalk. We had one in Councilman Sledge District. Obviously, even planning is not saying rip up this brand new sidewalk, but they're just saying pay in the in lieu fund. So what do you think? Uh, I, I tend to agree with the recommendation from planning. Um, I mean, we're, we're going to run into this for a while. We're sidewalks, but I mean, uh, mm -hmm. public works didn't stop, you know, doing sidewalks for a period of time in case legislation was passed. So I, I think, uh, well, I, I know I'm in favor of uh, granting the the variance uh, with them paying the lieu fee. Uh, Is that a motion? No, because I do have a question about the the queuing part, which uh, there's no opposition, but I, I'm. Uh, I don't know about the hardship, what, what we need to find for a hardship, yeah. or if indeed we can find a hardship. About the hardship for the utility lines, overhead utility lines. I don't it, think that's related <coughs> to the queuing. Okay. Yeah, I, I, would, I would be interested in somebody's input on that. I think the, the practicality of it is, is, I mean, it's something that is, you know, we, we've granted queuing variances before. I can think of a Green Hills case, which, you know, we get granted those because they needed to that to basically achieve their parking goals. Well, I, I'm, I'm no, I don't mean to suggest I'm opposed to it, I, yeah. but, we, but I think we do have to find. Oh, I think like with queuing, it's just kind of almost out of necessity of using their lot in the way that, you know, it's laid out. Yeah, I mean, it, it, or, just, or just that they've met all the requirements, but uh, I, I think that the actual use of the current sidewalk or current whether there's a line painted there or not it's going to be used exactly like it's been used for the last eight years so I mean I, I'm I'm comfortable with um, with whatever motion you were about to get I mean I, I go back and forth on the in lieu fee I know it's something new it does feel like it's a different a new tax on somebody um, and yet I appreciate the benefit to the city that that will bring, and that's what the legislation allows us to do. It would, but uh, I understand the appellant's frustration with the brand new sidewalk, essentially, uh, and then still having to pay for a sidewalk. <laughs> Does anyone have a motion? We almost have one. I make a move. We grant the variance based upon the demonstrated hardship. I believe it to be, just as planning said, the overhead utilities located at the back of the existing sidewalk, uh, and that we approve with conditions and that we require the in lieu contribution. Okay, the motion's been made. Is there a second? I will second. The motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. I opposed, passes six to nothing, one abstention. Mr. Herbert. <coughs> Thank you all. Thank you. The next case, the next case is case 2017-234. It's Mr. Barry Cleveland, appellant, and Pamela Poe, owner of the property. Mr. Herbert. 
I thought we were going to take Mr. White's case when he came back. I just spoke with Mr. White, and he asked if he could have a few minutes to okay. group with his clients, and Very asked good. that I please call okay. him after this case. Let's go. Mr. Barry Cleveland, appellant, and Pamela Poe, owner of the property located at 929 Southside Place, requesting a variance from the sidewalk requirements in the R6 district to construct a duplex. This referred to the board under 172120. The appellant has alleged that the board would have jurisdiction under 174180B. Is there opposition to this case? Is the applicant here? Applicants here seeing no opposition. Mr. Applicant, you will have 10 minutes. And please proceed. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Parnell. Please press the button. Ah, thank you. Good afternoon. My name is Jeff Parnell with DBS and Associates Engineering Company. Uh, address is 95 White Bridge Road in Nashville. We are here to seek a variance to the sidewalk requirements. And why do you need that? Need is a strong word, I suppose. Why are you uh, requesting it? There is an existing sidewalk there. Uh, it is in good condition. There is a grass strip already, and the sidewalk already exists. The, the Planning Commission has recommended that uh, we approve this with the condition that you pay into the in-loop fund. Is that acceptable to you? Yes, sir. Good. Okay. Any other questions? Thank you. Let's close the public hearing. Um, I'll move that we approve this variance uh, with the condition uh, of the recommendation of the Planning Commission that the applicant uh, pay the in lieu contribution. Okay. I'll second it. Uh, motion's been made properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed. Passes unanimously. Thank you. Yes, uh, Bill, yep. give me a five minute break. Okay, five minutes. Informed by the applicant that Councilman Sledge has reviewed it and is now in favor of it. I have an email here that was just sent to me from Councilman Sledge asking that it be approved. Uh, perhaps we okay. should consider well, rolling it back on the consent. That's an easy one. I move that we put case two, um, is it 250, 250. back on consent. Second. Motion's been made properly. Seconded. Any more discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Case number 250 passes on the consent agenda. Okay, moving forward to the next case. Uh, case, we're going to go back on the docket to case 2017-202. This is Russell Morris, the appellant in Marathon Properties, owner of the property located at 5805 Nolensville Road requesting a variance from sidewalk requirements in the SCR zoning district to construct a new restaurant. This is referred to the board under se section 1720-070-1712-020. The applicant has alleged that the board would have jurisdiction under 174180B. And Mr. White is now here for the appellant. Uh, is there any opposition here to this case? Seeing no opposition, Mr. White, you have 10 minutes. Mr. Chairman, members of the commission, my name is Tom White with Tony Hendrick and White, 315 Dedrick Street. I represent the applicant in this case. Appreciate your courtesies in allowing us to move forward at this time. Uh, sitting next to me is Alan Wiley, who is the engineer for this Chick-fil-A project, and next to him is Russ Morris, who is the uh, representative for the Chick-fil-A project, not officially with them, but certainly for the project. He has had all the contacts with Metro agencies as we have come through. Uh, I'll start by saying that uh, it's clear the planning department has recognized
recommended a variance. It's our position that uh, although they've suggested a variance, they still think a sidewalk may in part be able to be built there. It's our opinion it cannot be, it cannot be ADA compliant, uh, and it basically is a total safety risk. Uh, in addition to that, I wanted to publicly thank Councilman Robert Swope. It's his councilmanic district. He's incredibly familiar with this site. Uh, he's been there on many, many occasions, both on his own and at my request. Uh, he has written a communication which we forwarded, and I want to thank him because he was committed enough that when I contacted him to do this letter uh, in his final form, uh, he answered the phone a little groggy and said, Tom, it's 4.30 in China. Uh, and so despite that, he received the communication, felt committed enough to forward it to the council staff offices, and then it was forwarded here uh, thanks to Barbara and Roseanne. Uh, so you've got that. He, as the councilman, has strongly recommended that not only the variance be granted uh, in the form that we're talking about, but that there be no requirement for a fee to be paid, which is the board's prerogative. With respect to other council members, when I knew Robert Swope was not able to be here, I contacted Councilman Glover, uh, whose district is in at least the same part of the community. He's already come, so my understanding is, and addressed the commission, uh, the board, and asked them uh, for the variance request in the same format that Mr. Swope did. So without reading the letter from Mr. Swope, which is uh, contains a lot of the engineering terms. I think you all know that Robert Swope is a businessman, travels a lot. Uh, he's very familiar with construction. But rather than read that letter, which all of you have received, I'm going to ask Mr. Wiley, sitting here to my right, to articulate very simply why a sidewalk cannot and should not be done at the site. So, I'm sorry, you're, you're asking for no sidewalk at all, right? That's correct. No sidewalk. No sidewalk. And in so, also. help me understand that the planning staff had, had said appro you know, approve the variance with the condition of a sidewalk with an alternative design as shown on the site plan approved by Metro Planning Commission. What is, was there a site plan shown to them with a sidewalk? What we, is, tell me what that means. And We contacted the planning department and said we were clearly gonna ask for a variance. And they said, well, just to get it considered by us, you need to show it on the plan. We're going to recommend a variance at the Planning Commission level, but you need to show it on the plan that you turn in for us. You just can't turn in a proposal for a site without at least complying. We're going to put the sidewalk in along those the pike. Right. If I, if I might, that's my understanding. Mr. Morris, uh, to my immediate right, can also answer that. You need yes, your mic on there. Uh, Russ Morris, 4434 East Brookfield Drive. Thank you very much for your time. We are we are installing the sidewalk as recommended per the code along Knowlesville Pike. So we're we're asking for a variance on the sidewalk that would go up Brentwood East Drive. But again, it was required to demonstrate that when we turned in the plan for planning. They fully understood that we were coming here. We were asking for a variance and not to pay for it. So, with the permission of the uh, BZA board, I'd like to ask Alan Wiley to explain our position about the sidewalk. Alan Wiley, uh, 565 White Pond Drive, Akron, Ohio, 44320. Yes, the, there's quite a bit of grade difference from Nolansville Pike up Brentwood East Drive, uh, roughly 26 feet. It would be relatively impossible to build an ADA compliant sidewalk uh, with that much grade change and have it be all within the city's right of way. Uh, you're talking uh, ramp the entire way, retaining walls. Uh, you've got uh, handrails on both sides. And at the deepest point of the sidewalk below the existing grade of the road, someone walking on that sidewalk would actually be looking at the tires of the car driving adjacent to them. That's how much grade difference there is, about four and a half feet. So if the property has that steep, how are you, I mean, how, how, how's the building fit and how you? For the building, we are putting a retaining wall around. There's a there's a solid black line on the plan shown there. All right. That kind of wraps the, the whole site. So you're digging down. We're actually building it up. Uh, building it up. Okay. Yes. Okay, because it goes down. Yeah. I got you. It went, it went the other way. Right, there we go. Thank you. Yep. <coughs> Chick-fil-A um, requires us to design, and they only build ADA-compliant sidewalks, both on their site and in the public right-of-way. There are safety issues mentioned in the councilman's letter. What kind of safety issue is presented by building the sidewalk? 
as, as mentioned, uh, they only build ADA compliant sidewalks. An ADA a compliant sidewalk cannot be built here. Um, it's just too steep. We would it would be an entire ramp the whole way up there. Uh, the picture that Tom handed out kind of shows where you would have to be four four and a half feet below grade. You'd actually be looking at the cars or the tires of the car adjacent to you as you walk up there. So and that's we, a safety issue. I'm not hearing it. I, I wouldn't want to walk with my head next to a car tire. And then, so if we left the existing grade as it is and just build a sidewalk on the grade that's there, that's not ADA compliant. And it's, uh, there's a, get an exact number here. Uh, coming up off of Brentwood Drive East, there's an 11.7% grade. An ADA ramp is 8.3. That's the steepest we can build it for ADA requirements. I would like to also ask Mr. Wiley to reference the lack of sidewalks that it might tie into in the area behind them. Yeah, Brentwood Drive East does not have any sidewalks to the north and west of it, of the Chick-fil-A site. The only sidewalks are along Nolensville Pike and along uh, Old Hickory Boulevard. Okay. That, Mr. Chairman, basically concludes our presentation. We'll answer any questions, but we wanted to appreciate the input from the staff of planning uh, as we dealt with them. They realized that the standard sidewalk could not be done. They approved the variance, but they said they still felt like maybe a five-foot sidewalk could be done, which we think still renders it very unsafe uh, based on ADA compliance. And if I have understood the engineer's testimony correctly as I met with him in here today, it can't be ADA compliant. I heard the percentages. I think it's self-evident it cannot be. That's our request. Okay. Well, let's hear from planning. Come forward. Um, it, it, they're correct that they have come to us to, to look at the sidewalk issue. And so we recognize that the four foot grass strip, five foot sidewalk would, would be difficult to achieve here. Um, they did bring up the ADA concerns. Um, we've consulted with Public Works um, and confirmed that as long as it meets the center line grade, so if the grades are, are comparable um, between the road center line and the sidewalk, it's still meeting ADA. Um, so our recommendation had been, instead of doing the full local f street standard, to do a six foot sidewalk, which would help um, accommodate utilities and about a one foot buffer and then give you that five foot uh, clear for ADA compliance. Um, and they've shown that on their site plan that was approved uh, by the Planning Commission last Thursday as part of their PUD revision. So there's hills all over Nashville, and so there's conceivably other areas in the city where it would be difficult to build ADA-compliant sidewalks. What is Metro's opinion of that, and what happens in those instances? What if you can't build an ADA-compliant sidewalk? Do you just not build a sidewalk? Um, so you will see in, in areas of town where uh, maybe ramps are leading up to the entrance of a building to get to tie back into um, the public sidewalk. Um, they haven't proposed that in this case. Um, we didn't require it as part of the PUD revision. So it's just simply to get the sidewalk in um, along the public street here. Is there any, I mean, the drawing that's been made part of the record, did you see this? I have not. Here we go. As Hand it to you. If, if they have a copy. I mean, I, I sort of do. Is it your position that that is not what a sidewalk would, would look like if it were built there? <coughs> Um, our understanding was would be that the sidewalk would be at the same level or a little above where the street is, so where the car is shown on the diagram, the pedestrian would be um, at that same level or a little bit higher, you know, given the fact that it would need a curb. But your understanding is based on what was relayed to you from Public Works? Correct. Okay. And, and as my colleague asked you, I mean, the, we are going to be running into this problem. Are there any, is there any sort of recommendation in place by how we are to handle this? 
Um, our first step is to look at what the ideal sidewalk would be. Um, they obviously, you know, have, I think, a case to where they can't meet that four-foot grass strip, five-foot sidewalk, and so we try to come up with an alternative design, and we think that the, the six-foot sidewalk is an appropriate alternative. I just want to be sure I understood. So you think, so Public Works thinks this sidewalk should be up here more? Do you, do you want to come up and look at this? We were just handed this, so I didn't have time to study it myself. So I see here, you know what they're saying? They're, um, it's a little bit below there. Right. But Public Works thinks it's can, it can be up there? Right. Okay. Yeah, our understanding was that it would okay. be at the... Uh, Back to the microphone, please. <clears throat> We want everyone on the national, Metro Nashville Network to hear. That's right. Our understanding would be that it would be at a similar plane as the, the grade of the street. Any other questions of planning? Mr. Mr. Chairman, we normally reserve the two minutes for rebuttal. I'd like to ask um, from my client, the engineer, if he could put something out there that would require some response from Metro based upon what we saw. I apologize. Michael, that we didn't get this to you. I came here late to the hearing. We normally would exchange all these things, but uh, if we could have the consent of the chairman for my client to address one issue. Sure. And my question, I guess, would be, is Metro okay with having a non-ADA compliant sidewalk that is over 11% within their right-of-way that the city is responsible for? Thank you. I think what Metro has said, and we've read the report, that they still feel that you could build the ADA for sidewalk, but you could respond to that. I, get, I, I just had a question. I want to understand this retaining wall, because you said you were building up the site, but I think you also said that, that the slope went down 20-something feet. Yes. But, um, but now, why is, the, why is the retaining wall only four feet? It's four feet as you start, because it's going to... It's going to go from zero feet up to, I don't have the number in front of me, but say 12, 12 to 14 feet okay. around the building. This is just the, the one point in time that we picked along Brentwood Drive East. That's the, low, the lowest point in time? Yes. Okay. I just, want to, I just want to make sure I understood. Yeah, that the wall, as you go down, the wall will get higher relative. In closing, Chairman, our, our argument is that Metro has recognized that a variance should be granted. It's a question of what's the form of it. Uh, and my client, frankly, does not want to be involved as a national company with a sidewalk that may not be ADA compliant, and it's not. Some of that's Metro's call because some of it's on them, but we respectfully submit that the predicate for a variance is already there. It's what's the relief, and we'd request the relief is there be no sidewalk. We think without any payment, but that's the discretion of this board. So we appreciate your courtesies. We'll answer any questions? Okay. Any more questions for Mr. White? Well, I do. Um, you know, we just got this exhibit, so we haven't had a lot of time to process it. But it seems that, from what I understand, you're building up the site for your building. Why can't you build up the area where the sidewalk is to be? On the exhibit that Mr. White just hand out, handed out, um, we have shown as a, a dashed line the existing grade of Brentwood Drive East, where the sidewalk is going is being proposed to be, and then a darker line on the bottom, and that is the grade that our ADA compliant sidewalk would need to be. On the left-hand side of that sheet, we actually have hatched the proposed Chick-fil-A Drive entrance over there, which meets the current grades of Brentwood Drive East, and you can see how much lower an ADA-compliant sidewalk would be, roughly four feet at that point, which means you can't build an ADA-compliant sidewalk from one end up to meet that grade at the driveway without some issues of construction. It's, it's, it, I don't believe it can be done. 
That's why we're asking for the variance. So where's the person in the cow suit stand? What was that? Never mind. <laughs> <laughs> okay, any other questions? Okay, anything else to add? Okay, we're gonna close the public hearing. So we have a letter of support from Councilman Swope and dueling uh, sidewalk uh, issues, but it seems like the applicant has really shown us a lot of detail about their sidewalk concerns. And I, th I think it's, it seems a, a very legitimate concern, and I think the council person knows his district. Um, it is a extremely steep slope, and I'm personally not opposed to, they're gonna build a sidewalk on Owensville Road, they're not asking for a variance on that. Uh, from what I understand, but I'd be willing to, you know, have a sidewalk on the other street. I can't remember the name of uh, Brentwood East uh, Drive, and uh, would assume that that would be a payment into the NLU fund for a variance of the sidewalk. Okay. Is there a motion? I, I will make that a motion. Okay, this motion's been made. Is there a second? I'll second. Motion's been made and seconded. Um, any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes. Good luck. Mr. Herbert. The next case is case 2017-235. Linda Demeth, appellant, and Linda Demeth, owner of the property located at 442 Ezell Pike, requesting an item A appeal challenging the zoning Ms. administrator. Demeth here, come forward. Yes. Mm -hmm. Challenging the zoning administrator's denial of a short-term rental permit. Applicant operated prior to obtaining the legally required permit. It's referred to the board under section 1716-250E. The appellant has alleged that the board would have jurisdiction under 174180A. Is there opposition? Seeing no opposition, ma'am, you have 10 minutes. Okay. Uh, my name is Linda Dumas, property owner 442 Ezell Pike. I just want to say a quick thing. I Mostly with reading the papers and I have sympathy for some of the people who are opposing it and not all structures are the same I realize that I've always got permits I've, I've built 3,000 square feet of the new Vanderbilt Plaza and I did the whole build out on it all pull permits I also did a destruction of 17 and Broadway the old subway I tore it down and rebuilt a two-story house there I made 444 uh, Ezel Pike zone commercial. Since the, the Harding Place Extension Road was supposed to be coming through there, so that people could enjoy the benefits of making a little bit more money on uh, on the property. And uh, I got a sign permit for my business after it was zone commercial, and I built a parking lot. And all these were under code. So I I just don't want you to think that I'm not. Uh, coy to it. So I, so I have two houses on there. I just sold one, and I, uh, and it took me a year because I had to quit claim it deed back from the guy that bought it, who was a tenant of mine. Right before he did that, he filed his bankruptcy filed a uh, IRS lien on his money. So anyway, but getting back to that. So anyway. I took a year to do that, but and it got it finished, and I had it sold, and the guy needed three months to close. So I called, I went, call, kept calling the codes and asking for Airbnb <laughs> until I sold it, you know. And he uh, never answered, so I went down there directly and got a permit from them. And I have it, but the thing of it is, I got a wrong permit. It's a business license instead. I had it under Wait a minute. You got a Business license? You went down there and said... That's what they gave I me. I told them what I was going to use the property for. And Did you read? What does it say on it? It doesn't. It just says that uh, DeMeth Reynolds, and it's a business license, receipt number, classification. Did you fill out the... Did you do the little drawing she of your house? She didn't ask me to. And, okay. I, I'm, I mean, I'm, 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 I'm telling the truth. She didn't ask me to. But any, anyway... Um, and I, I, I didn't put it up. I mean, yeah. I'm were you sorry. were you at the coach department? Where where did you go to? I do this? went to the where you come here in this building. You go to go past the driver's license. Right to the county clerk's office. That, that's where I went. 
So I guess I made all these mistakes, that I did make mistakes. <laughs> but so anyway, how did you find out that you didn't have a permit then? Okay, um, I, um, I, 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 uh, I got this two days before I closed the property, and it took me two months to get, get the property ready. You got what two days before you got the uh, before I sold uh, my other property. I but you got a letter, or what'd you get? No, I just did it on my own. I knew oh, but I how knew. did you find out you were in violation of the law? Oh, uh, the guy came after we, after we uh, ran an ad at Airbnb, mm -hmm. uh, he came and, and uh, we had like a client coming in within an, uh, an hour, and he gave me the stop order. Had thing. you rented it before to anyone during no. this time? No, that we'd been working on it because, you know, it just, it just a second and, house. And, and do you live in, you don't live in this house, right? No, I don't. My grandson, he just graduated. He lives downstairs. Okay. So anyway, so he came by. It's very nice. I, said, I have a license. He said, no, you don't. It's not, we don't have a copy of it. And he told me the Airbnb people uh, 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 called and looked it up, and I didn't have a license. And I, I really, we kind of talked for about a half an hour, because thinking, I think, I mean, I didn't know. I've never had an Airbnb license. Yeah. So are you applying, is this a, an owner-occupied home uh, license you're applying for, or non owner No, I don't live there. My grandson. Okay, let's, uh, Mr. Osborne, enforcer, come forward. So this is a new one for us. Um, doesn't sound like they ever got to you or your office, right? Um, it, it sounds like there was some miscommunication somewhere along the line. So sounds how, like she did try and she did obtain a business license, but that unfortunately isn't what she needed. Um, we did discuss that whenever I made my site visit, um, but she was actually there at the time they were working on the property. Um, and that was on August 4th, um, to my so knowledge. So just so everyone watching on the Metro Nashville Network knows that, you know, we do have people out looking for postings and then we'll cross check it with actual <laughs> permits. And here this person just posted and almost immediately you all found out that she didn't have a license. Correct. Um, so I made my site visit, talked with her, discussed that she did need to uh, apply for a permit. Um, the property is zoned commercial, so um, I believe that that would be eligible to apply for a non-owner occupied permit. I don't think that's affected by the uh, pending legislation. Okay, questions of the enforcer? Okay, thank you. Okay, so help us out here. You, you started off with your resume, you've done a lot of things in construction. Mm -hmm. When you, when did, you, you obviously knew that there was a, a way that if you had an Airbnb or short-term permit that you needed a permit, right? You never, you always knew that that was a law and legislation, right? I real, I, well, I, that's why I went down there. And that's why I called before there. I mean, I didn't know that I was in the wrong department, apparently, because I told her that I wanted an Airbnb, plus I'm going to do other in, like uh, events there. Eventually. So for those watching on Metro Nashville Network, we have a website, nashville.gov. You go to, I guess, which side of the website? You go to the, the codes department, and there's, or if you just Google Nashville, short-term okay. rental permit, you could come to the site. Well, so this is there's a process that's all explained online, and you, what they, you know, you got to get your insurance and your proof of ownership and all this. So you didn't see, you didn't go online and look. No, just, because I, I mean, I just thought you had to go down there, and then they would. Can I, mean, I see that piece of paper that you have? This one here. Yes. Let me give it to you. Thank you. Oh, you could go back there and see. So this is from the Davidson County Clerk's Office, and it is a National Davidson County Business Tax License from our county clerk, Brenda Wynn, who's right across the hall. So that's what you got. Um, so. Sir? Yes. Go ahead. One question. Uh, when I, I did call up the codes there, uh, mm -hmm. the telephone number where they told me to call up before, uh, and he told me that I could let my other place mm -hmm. go until I sold it and I wouldn't have to get a permit. That's what he, he said I could do that for four months. I don't know who it was. I went down there. And then when I, after I sold my place, I. I went down there and I went to, that's where they told me to go, that place, you know, back this way, okay. past the driver's license. 
The, the, yes. So, any questions for the applicant? Do you have anything else to add? Well, sir, the, I mean, I've spent all my money getting this ready to rent, and I did, I did cancel all my the people that had booked. How it. many did you cancel? Why? How many? I only, well, I only had the one for two thousand dollars for the solar eclipse. Two thousand dollars? It was two thousand dollars a night. I mean, I thought five hundred dollars a night. But we spent all the money getting this house all up, all up to everything we needed to do, and. Um, but I tell you what, I have to say this, I thank God that y'all did stop me. And you know why? Mm -hmm. My son and his wife, three month old baby, two little kids, two dogs, one cat, a mother-in-law, and another older grandson evacuated from the storm. They had a place to live for 10 days. So to me, I think sometimes things work out for what, what's thank best. Thank you for being a good citizen of Nashville. Okay, we're going to close the public hearing discussion. So this is a new one. I didn't think we'd still consider. <laughs> well, and, yeah, new and, and, and I'll, I will I'll just say from from you know personal experience, not in Nashville, but in other places, navigating the system is not always easy. And there are many times that you think you're doing the right thing, um, and and yet there's hoops and hoops and hoops that you have to jump through. And I think there's clear evidence in this case that. Uh, that you know, she just she came down to try to do the right thing. Got a business license instead of a STRP permit, and oh, I, I, and and can, did all the right things. Canceled her rentals. Um, is eligible according to uh, our codes uh, enforcer, and so I'm I'm happy to make a motion that that we find the zoning administrator did not err in denying the permit, but she is eligible to apply for a permit uh, tomorrow. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed. Passes unanimously. Here's what we did. We decided that even though you had a short-term rental without the proper permit, since you tried, and since you came to us today and told us your story, and um, Mr. Harper, I mean, Mr. Taylor thought that um, the appropriate um, thing to do is to make you eligible to apply again. So go online, look to see the process, and then come back, they'll tell you the actual office, which is next door to this building yeah. and the Fulton oh, complex. No, it's in the orange building, not it's this one. It's to the, as, yeah. you, as you go out, as you go out the door here, it's the building to the right. Yes. And in fact, if you talk to the fellow that came up uh, and, and yeah. that you talked with before, he can tell you exactly where to go. Yes. Um, so good luck. Thank you for again, exemplifying what Nashville is about of helping people in times of need to with your uh, house. And, yeah, and to make sure you don't ever advertise or do any rentals until you get that until permit. Until you get the permit, yes. Or you'll be back here again. Thank you so good much. Good luck. Thank you. Mr. Mr. Chairman, Herbert. the next case would have been case 236. It is deferred to October the 5th, so our next case is case 237. It is Dan Hewitt, appellant and Native American Indian Associations of Tennessee, owner of the property located at 1466 Bell Road, requesting a special exception and variance from the sidewalk requirements in the AR2A district to construct a new cultural center and storage building. Referred to the board under 171670A, 172120. The appellant alleged that the board would have jurisdiction under 174180 B and C. Is there opposition here to this case? Seeing no opposition, sir, you have 10 minutes. Thank you. I'm Dan Jewett, uh, 121369 New South. Oh. Press the button so we get here oh. and repeat that again. Okay. Dan Hewitt, uh, 121316 Avenue South. And I appreciate you all taking the time to Before to you today. start, we have a um, letter from Councilman Fabian Bedney, former mm -hmm. member of this board, in support. Um, you had a public meeting about this? Yes. Okay. How did that go? And Well, I was not actually there, but I, I understand it went well. Mm -hmm. so okay. We, uh, this is actually a renewal of a special ex uh, exception that we did been almost four years now, I guess, um, and that went very well. It's a, a cultural center that the Native American Indian people were hoping uh, hoping to build, and are still hoping to build, of course. Uh, they're pending and soliciting funds, so, and they also want to build a storage building behind the cultural center. 
So, um, what did people say? Or you know, obviously you have your support of the council person, but mm -hmm. so this seems to be a unique institution in our city. Are there any others? And why did you all decide to do this and to do this where you're located? Well, uh, Ray Emanuel, who's here today, uh, director of the Native American Indian Association, uh, basically had a dream that it's a group that uh, works with the federal government. They're funded with the federal government and help Indians to help themselves. They do educational job training uh, and general aid for the Indian population. And he had a, basically had a dream that he wanted to do a building that represented the um, Native Americans and would also serve as their function. They'd have a museum and a hmm? library. And, um, We've been pushing this uh, dream for years and hoping that uh, one of these days they'll be able to uh, make it a reality. So <laughs> wh why no sidewalk? Why are you asking not to build sidewalks? Okay, well, there is an existing sidewalk. Um, and it just seems odd to me to, you know, there's a residential uh, property on either side and I suspect it will be uh, this. So this that's the picture of the existing sidewalks there. Correct. Those uh, look very narrow compared to. Well, I don't wide feel is. that narrow when I'm there. Those I think it's either. a five footer. Okay. Um, and anyway, it seemed choppy to me. I guess it's disorient when you're walking down and you've got to angle off to uh, another piece of the sidewalk. It just seems like it might be disoriented in that situation because either it's side of the property will be probably remain this way for years, I suspect. So why are you, I mean, what's the real reason that, you, that they're just existing sidewalks? Is that what you're saying? Yes, sir. Okay. Uh, questions for the applicant? We're gonna hear from planning. He wrote us a nice little letter about sidewalks and their recommendation is actually for disapproval of this. So talk to us about this. Uh, first of all, how wide are those sidewalks, do you think? Those look more narrow. They're, they're probably five foot sidewalks. That's from, right. from our the picture just makes it a little narrow. Yeah. Um, so what's wrong with his five, five, five foot sidewalks? I know I'm gonna get a lecture about the new sidewalk law and Councilman Lady Henderson worked so hard for it, but. Yes. So uh, we look at this area um, from the perspective that we, we see this as an evolving area. Uh, so there'll be a uh, change of uses over time to more suburban uses. Um, so it's not completely built out. Um, and the standard would be an eight foot grass strip, six foot sidewalk. So that is quite a bit so wider than what's there grass today. Grass strip, six foot sidewalk. That's much different than Correct. Um, and the way we're approaching it is consistency with some other developments that have occurred along this portion of Bell Road. Um, so um, at 1430 Bell Road, the Whetstone Flats Apartments, it's about 500 feet from this property. Um, they were required to build the sidewalks to the major and collector street plan standards. They had significant topo issues um, and were able to do that. Um, and with this being a connector between both Nolansville and Murfreesboro Road, MTA, um, is planning to establish crosstown service. So we envision that more people as it develops out would potentially be walking along uh, portions of Bell Road to access transit. Um, so our position is that even though this uh, is built with a five foot sidewalk, it's uh, inadequate for, for future needs as the area continues to develop. Okay. Is the eight foot grass strip, is that based upon the type of road that the sidewalk is adjacent to? Um, it's the type of road and the uh, future land use policy in the area. So typically arterials will have a wider grass strip buffer because we envision higher speed traffic and more traffic volume on that. And then in a residential setting, we try to get a little bit wider grass strip to allow for a more significant buffer. Questions? Do you have anything else to add? Well, one thing I could add is uh, 
the, usually the, probably the first step in this uh, construction process would be the storage building. And I'm worried that the expense of the sidewalks is onerous compared to the scale of that building, but that'd be my only other uh, consideration. Okay. Thank you, we're gonna close the public hearing. Discussion. <coughs> Well, I think the special exception is when we passed four years ago, and I don't think there's any issue with that, again, especially with no opposition in the recommendations we've gotten. Sidewalk, I think it's a question we got to decide, and, you know, it... I, I, yeah, I, I can go with uh, the stronger thoughts of the group. Well, I actually think they should build it because um, of the road it's adjacent to. I think it's a, I mean, that's what Metro is trying to promote is safety. Um, and this is a busy road. You can make one. You had the sidewalk opinion. Well, here's the no sidewalk opinion, right? Okay, I'll do it. No, 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 I don't, I'm, I'm fine. fine. I said I'd go either way. I, I really do think, I mean, there is a point in time when you, and I think that's what planning has tried to convey, is there is a point in time when you transfer these things over, and there is, uh, to some extent, a wastefulness or a, a, a sense that, hey, there's already a sidewalk there. Why are we making them do it uh, again? You know, I mean, that's that thing that, that we're looking at in almost every single one of these cases. Um, there just isn't so, the... Yeah. Yeah. No, I, try, I mean, I agree. I think, I mean, I'd, I know. would like to hear from our Southeast Davis County expert about this site and this area of town. What are your thoughts, Ms. Sanford? I have to admit that I'm very biased toward anything Council Member Fabian Bedney would request us to do. He's a very hardworking council member, and I read his letter with interest that he mm -hmm. asked us to approve this variance. And as a former member of this board, he doesn't write that many long letters to us, so, you know, obviously it's a project that he cares about. Do you have anything to say related to a motion, Ms. Sanford? Um, in keeping with Fabian Bedney's request, I would request that we approve this uh, variance, or I would move that we approve this variance. Okay, and I will second that. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. Is this very so not including omitting the sidewalk? That, Ms. Sanford? I'm, oh, I'm your, your request was to allow them to have their special exceptions. There was nothing related to building new sidewalks or putting money in the sidewalk Correct. fund. Correct. Okay, that's the motion. Okay, any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? No. Opposed. So five to two, I mean, yeah, five to two passes. Good luck. Thank you. Appreciate it. Mr. Chairman, the next case is case 2017-238, Jeffrey Siddiqui, appellant and owner of the property located at 1210 Avondale Circle, requesting an item A appeal, challenging the zoning administrator's denial of a short-term rental permit. The applicant operated prior to obtaining the legally required permit, referred to the board under 1716-250E. The appellant has alleged the board would have jurisdiction under 1740-180A. Is there anybody here in opposition to this case on 1210 Avondale Circle. Seeing no opposition, sir, you have 10 minutes. Thanks. So I'm Jeff Siddiqui, I'm the owner uh, at 1210 Avondale Circle. Um, first, I wanna thank the board for your hearing my case in regard to the short-term rental. Um, so I tried to follow the short-term rental process appropriately to gain the owner-occupied permit. I went down to the codes office, the correct codes office, and on June 2nd, that happened um, with all my necessary information and was asked by the codes department to publish my listing um, so we could approve my permit. The listing was not published at the time of 
the meeting, um, I was asked by personnel at the codes office to publish it so we could review and approve my um, improve my permit. On June 20, on June 2nd, I was approved for the zoning review and license. When I left, I scheduled the fire marshal inspection and passed that. When the fire marshal went to sign me off for the permit, it flagged me for having it published already. Um, as soon as I received that notice, I pulled down the listing immediately and the property wasn't ever booked or rented. Clearly, I take responsibility for the lack of experience and knowledge in understanding this long process. Um, now that's four months later, I have a lot of knowledge of this process and just ask that you continue to um, allow me to continue with the process to gain my permit. Okay, so you had filled out everything and that last piece of the short-term rental is getting the fire, scheduling and getting the fire marshal to sign off. So in between bringing your application down here and it being accepted and getting the fire marshal, you posted it, right? Is that well, right? it was posted, so it wasn't posted going into the meeting with the codes and then in order to, I think, look at my posting and approve it, he asked me to publish it. Who did? Um, Clint. Harper. Um, so he was who I was working with at the zoning department. And so when I published it, he could review my listing and stuff. And then when I left the department, I never unpublished it because I thought that that was the process. I didn't understand that I was supposed to not publish it <laughs> oh. or take it back down, I guess you could say. Um, and then I was notified by the fire, fire marshal. She was like, you're good, you're signed off, but you already published it. So it flagged the, the system. Okay, and then <laughs> Mr. Osborne, the enforcer. This is also a new one. It's like, okay. So when you go down with an application, why do they even need to see a listing? Is that uh, My normal? understanding of that is so that a lot of people use the insurance from those uh, websites, Airbnb or VRBO. Sometimes they offer that. So that's my understanding that you'd have to talk to Clint for more specifics on that. So do you have any opinions on this? Um, I, did, I did post a stop work order on it on... 619. So once again, you all are on it, right? I do my best. I know you do. Um, so I posted a stop worker on 619, um, issued a citation, which came back unserved. Um, the following month, it was still posted. Um, I did talk to Mr. Siddiqui, um, I believe, once or twice and told him that he needed to pull the advertisement down, which he finally did do by the time we got so to So you were the expert of looking on websites and things like this. You didn't see any reviews or any evidence that anyone ever stayed there? No, sir. Okay. Thank you. Any questions for our enforcer? Okay. You heard all that. So mm -hmm. anything else to add? No, it's been a long process. <laughs> so, so um, what have you learned from this process? Um, that you not to, to post it until I have my permit. <laughs> I knew about the permit and tried to go through the right process to get it to get it approved, but clearly. Is that I, why you posted so you could prove that you had insurance? or is that Yeah, that sounds right, actually, now that I think about the meeting, because he asked me um, if I had insurance on the property, and I said yes, and he said, well, it, there's Airbnb insurance. So I think they cover up to like a million dollars in Airbnb, okay. so gotcha. it shows on the site. I want to ask, do you live in this house? Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Okay. Any other questions? Okay, let's close the public hearing. Discussion. Like I said, I cannot believe we've had three new cases that we haven't heard these kind of scenarios before today. Yeah, although, although we have had, we have had cases where people said the insurance, you know, the insurance thing kind of screwed them up because, you know, they. Yeah, but to go down to Code's department and just kind of say, "Hey, let's show this yeah, online," show me, and then they didn't show me take the it insurance. Down. Yeah, yeah it, it, this kind of screams technicality to me, and it's un, you know unoccupied with no reviews and no evidence that there was actual rentals. So I don't have an issue with this applicant uh, okay. being eligible. Care to make a motion? Yes, I will move that the zoning administrator did not err in denying the the uh, permit uh, based on the evidence. Um, that this applicant should be eligible to apply for a permit uh, tomorrow. Okay, motions have been made. Is there a second? second? Okay, motions have been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor of the motion signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Passes unanimously. <coughs> this is what we basically ruled. We ruled that you are now you don't now normally you have to wait out a year for violating our short-term rental permit. Mm -hmm. You came here and we are allowing you to apply immediately 
It's not giving you a permit. Right. It's you are eligible to apply. Okay. Considering you have all the paperwork, it sounds like, mm -hmm. it should be much easier yeah. and don't post until you Absolutely. have the permit. Yeah. Okay. Thank, Thank you, you, Chairman. Appreciate it. Mr. Herbert. The next case is case 2017-240, Murray Mays and Catherine Mays, appellant and owner of the property located at 208 Queens Lane Court, requesting an item A appeal, a challenge to challenging the zoning administrator's denial of a short-term rental permit. The applicant operated prior to obtaining the legally required permit. Referred to the board under 1716-250E. The appellant has alleged that the board would have jurisdiction under 1740-180A. Is there opposition here to this case? Seeing lots of opposition to this case. Uh, Ma'am, you will have 15 minutes to make your presentation. If you would like, on the front end, you can reserve some portion of that for rebuttal. Okay. My name is um, Catherine Murray Mays, M Y A S, M A Y S. Okay. M A Y S. And um, that's my property, this is my house, this is where I live. This is where I raise my kids, this is where my mother, um, Anna Himes, moved in several years before she passed. We added on. Um, once she passed, I was, my daughter had gone to college, I started Ubering and I started seeing people that I was picking up from the same house. I didn't know anything about it. I teach school. And so I asked them, it was in the summer, and I asked them, I said, what are you all doing? They said, well, we rent these houses. I'm like, oh, okay. So once my mother passed, which at that point she had passed, I decided to look into it. Now, I initial, initial, initially, applied for a um, permit, got all my stuff together, went down, did whatever I was supposed to do, and um, the uh, lady from the um, um, fire department, I guess, I can't remember, she came and she said that we didn't have enough um, smoke detectors. So I'm like, okay, because I didn't know. I really didn't know. I was new to this, and I was just trying to help my kids. My daughter in college paying for that. My son is um, autistic and on the USA Paralympic team. We trying to get to meets out of the country, trying just trying to get some extra money. So um, once she told me that I needed smoke detectors, she said that to call her back and that she would come back. And when I first saw the notice on my door, I was like, I have, and I know I called, and I don't know who I talked to, but I was fussing. I said, I have a permit. And they, I, really, I thought they were talking about taxes. And he said, no, you don't have a permit. And I'm like, okay. So I was trying to think about what was going on that I did not finish this process. And um, I started thinking about it, and it was during the time where my son, we, we had to go out of the country with my son. My daughter had a little um, breast cancer scare while she was in college. So I kind of really just dropped everything and diverted my attention. And yes, I was wrong, I forgot. And once I got the notice on the door, I went immediately down there. They said, take the stuff off the site. That's what I did. And that was it. So, so you went down to get a permit and you thought, basically you kind of thought you had a permit, right? I, I, um, the lady from the uh, fire department said that she needed to come back. I need to right. add some, some, some things. And I just forgot. I got started doing other things. But you were aware of the process. You tried to do the process. And, and so, I mean, there the rules for renting in terms of number of people or that stuff that yeah, you knew about. Let me about ask or you this. Um, how many people are you allowed to rent? What's the maximum? 
I think 12. Rule. Okay, so why did you rent to more than 12? Let me read one of the many reviews that we have here. Okay. This is from Matt from Ontario. We went for my bachelor party with 13 other buddies, which implies he's counting himself, so that's 14. We were hosted beyond well. We played some lawn games on this beautiful property, played basketball on the court, uh, even in the rain. The hosts were extremely nice, had to deal with us staying up until 6 a.m. every night because how much fun Nashville has to offer and never complained once actually complimented us on our partying ability. Anyone else in the world would have kicked out our blank. Thank you so much for the best weekend of our lives. Some Matt from Ontario. Well, I was, 6 I was trying to be polite to Matt. I was trying to be nice. They were from Canada. Um, I understand that, but you're in a... I, let, and, me, and, let me read another letter to you that okay. I think describes what's going on here. Um, this letter says, the house is, is, a, is a very nice, quiet neighborhood mm -hmm. and very easy to get to other parts of Nashville. Beautiful home. We had a great weekend. Quiet neighborhood. You had people partying till 6 a.m. every night outside? Can I approach that picture? What, what, do, you mean to, what do you need to approach? I just want to point at something. Because I, I don't have one here. What would you like to show us? Okay, you see where that little red house yes, is? I do. That's my deck. Okay. Okay, right to the right of that, mm -hmm. that's my deck. Mm -hmm. If you are back, all of that property behind me is my property. The only way to get to the other side is to either cross the creek. Mm -hmm. Or um, go through the man's yard back there, but so what's your point? My point is that as a family, we have stuff all the time. To and six a.m. as a family. It might be to two or three. But there's a big difference. I mean, two or three is bad enough. But, but if they're sitting on on the deck and they're in the house and. I mean, these people behind me Which are, I'm sure live in some of these houses near you. And you know what? I don't recognize any of them because I don't think they do. Well, they'll give their addresses when they come here. And, but my, my but, point but is... It's, my, my point is, this little cul-de-sac right here... Quiet neighborhood is described. Yes. Um, Mr. Bender lives across the street. The Smiths live there. The Bowers live here. This house was vacant. And the Bowers live on this side. And no one has ever said to me, your people are loud. They stay in the backyard. They I'm, not in the front. But Matt from Ontario, with his 14 bachelor party, party until 6 a.m., we had the best time of his life. But Our 6 a.m. Anyone else in the world would have kicked us out. That's six, what Matt said. You know what Matt did to 6 a.m. on the Saturday? They sat on my deck, and they played this guitar. And I know none of these people heard them because they don't stay on my street. They were on my deck. If they disturbed anybody, it was me and my husband. So, okay. I've, I've got a, a, I do have a question relating to, to what Mr. the chairman has asked. And that, you, you know, you, you, you said that you knew the rules that, the, the most you could have is 12, and so, I mean, I'm just curious to why on, the, on your website you have, there's a $50 per person fee for groups over 12. Why are you advertising for more than 12 if you... I just putting, I was just putting what everybody else was putting, really, to be honest. I was just sort of following along with, when I did this, I did this based on what I saw other websites have. And not in compliance with our laws that we regulate. Well, I, 
was just being new to it. I didn't under, I mean, I was doing the best that but I could. But the reason it's interesting, and I've never seen a scenario, I've seen people ever, uh, have more than 12 people, but I've never seen a surcharge for additional people over 12 people. Well, I mean, I got that from another website, just what the normal people do. Mm -hmm. So we're going to hear from these comp opposition, and you've said that they don't live around here, but they still have a I voice. mean, they, li they probably live in the neighborhood. Okay, so. But um, if they're saying that cars are parked way by their house, that's, that's, they park in my driveway in front of my house so or you, on the side. Did you, do you care to respond to what the council person for your district said on the way? Oh, absolutely. Here? Okay, let's Absolutely. Hear it. Because the ones that he is referring to that was playing basketball in the rain on my basketball court um, were the guys from Canada. Now, they were your people that you had rented the house to, right? Yes, yes. And were they now, when I first drove, uh, that is absolute. I teach school. Mm -hmm. I teach school. Mm -hmm. I mean, I'm, I'm going to have somebody at my house smoking weed, and I teach school, and I'm fussing well, my kids all, all know, the time. All I know, no, well, this the is answer what, to the question is all, no. All I know, this is what Matt said. Anybody else in the world would have kicked us out. We had the times of our best weekend of our lives. That's what Matt said. I okay. don't know what the best weekend of his life meant and anybody else would have kicked us out. But to me, if he's saying that anybody else would have kicked us out based on what they did, when I drove that's not up, very neighborly. When I drove up, I asked my husband, I said, are, are those swimming trunks or what are they doing? He said, they're out there playing basketball in their underwear. So I called them over and told them to put, you know, they can't be doing that. But that was the only issue that I had and the weed smoking is not true that's not true okay. any other questions for the applicant before we hear from the opposition okay let's hear from the neighbors in the opposition you will have nine minutes and 37 seconds to come back and respond to the neighbors let's, oh yeah let's hear from the enforcer mr. Osborne so, how did you hear about this case and what do you know about it? We did receive a complaint on it. Um, I posted a stop work order on August 10th and she called me right away to see what was going on. Um, I told her she didn't have a permit. She wasn't aware that she needed one. Um, it looks like she did apply for one back in 2015, but just never completed the process. Now, you spend more time looking at short-term rental sites than, I guess, most people that live here as opposed to the ones that want to come here. Have you ever seen this kind of surcharge for more people, and how frequent is that? Um, it, or more people over the requi required limit, shall I say, too. There's numerous that uh, advertise over the limit, and we are looking to crack down on those. Um, no, but I'm talking, people advertise over the limit, but say per, if you're over 12 people, every extra person is another $50. Have you ever seen that? Uh, I've seen it before. It's not very often, but I do see it. Okay. Let's hear from the opposition. So here you go. <laughs> Let them come up and go back into the audience. We're going oh, to let them come up. Yes. I'm sorry. Mm -hmm. And this is the period, so we'll have 15 minutes total for opposition. So if anybody wants to speak out and against this, this is your time. Thank you. My name is Sylvester Armour. I reside at 104 Queens Lane. Mm -hmm. I'm um, the vice president of the Neighborhood Association in the area. I'm also a real estate broker here in Nashville for the past 19 years. Uh, I, got info I got an email from uh, Councilman Leonardo <coughs> basically stating that he had this coming up on referendum today. And so I took the approach to go ask neighbors how they felt about what was going on uh, with the uh, short-term rental. I got an overwhelmingly 100% no, we don't want it. Mainly because this is a large baby boomer area. I think the average age in her immediate area is about 70, 65 years old, which are a lot of seniors that are used to peace and quiet. 
And it also, as a realtor and real estate broker, I've observed a lot of realtors recently haven't been able to sell homes due to short-term rentals, being next door or across the street, which in the long run will lower property value in those particular areas. And I've noticed also from previous short-term rentals today, from being a realtor, the reason why those don't have any opposition because those are mainly rental areas. And so this is basically residence. We are peace and quiet. You know, but dog bark, two streets over, we hear everything. I myself didn't see anything as far as her short-term rental, but I've heard from a lot of neighbors over the past months in particular stating that they didn't want it, they've heard different things, they might have heard gunshots, I don't know if it came from her house or not, but from that area. And we'd like to keep the area peace and quiet, just exactly the way it is. We already end day right now with um, group homes. We need anything else to help lower value or basically break our peace and quiet up in our neighborhood. And, uh, please identify yourself for the record and your address, please. Uh, my name is Verinda Orr. And I live at 40, my mailing address is 4201 Eaton's Creek Road. Um, on the map here, uh, my address is 201 Queens Lane Court. So you have to turn by my house to get there. And uh, it's right there in the square line. Anyway, um, my, uh, of course, well, my, I'm coming because um, the neighbors, we do not want this in our neighborhood. I know you've heard we don't want a hotel or motel, but I'm going a little further than that. I'm saying we do not want it because we have like Reverend Bender, he's like 90 years old, he's there by himself, and uh, and, you know, he can't even sit on his porch or anything because he's afraid. Uh, and he does not want to go to a nursing home because he's not nursing home material. He needs to stay in his house where he's comfortable. And, I mean, you had a parent and your parents could get around and do for themselves. Why would you want to move them someplace okay. else? So what have you witnessed or heard related to anything related to this? Uh, witness, uh, gun, I, I can't say it's gunshot, but it's a lot of, like, um, what's called firecrackers back there, and then parking area. And we don't, I mean, I know this other one's not, not right here right now concerning a, we don't have uh, Miss Mace, we have another one right there across from her. Now that's where the pot, uh, uh, pot smoking was, right there, because that is in my back door. And they were back there smoking on August, uh, around August the 11th. Yes, she has cars all around and everything, and uh, we just don't need this. We are too old, uh, like he said, the average age is like 65. Well, I'm 70. Are we gonna put me in the nursing home soon? I want to, I want to stay around. I want to stay in my house, and I want to be comfortable, and if my husband passed before me, I still want to be there. I don't want to move. I want to be there, and I want to be able to go to bed at night and go to sleep and be at peace. And I don't want anyone coming from out of town, I don't know. And it was one gentleman told me one time, he said, look girl, I don't know you. He said, but I know that car. Now we know people cause the thing, mm -hmm. and we're gonna take care of these people. Yeah. You don't have to worry that. We're gonna take care of our neighbor. This is a family that we have. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you for being here. Please identify yourself in your My name is Carl Turnbow. I stay on uh, 144 Queens Lane. That's, you come in off of uh, Eden Creek, you make a right on the second right. Mm -hmm. You go down about seven or eight houses there, I stay right there. And I've been there ever since 1982. Now, <clears throat> this community is a respectable community. We don't have drugs running around in there. We don't have nothing. We watch everything. Mm -hmm. Maybe she don't know that we know her, but we know her. We know what she, we know what this lady do and what she been doing or know what she up to. Look, we got deer, we got little dogs, we got foxes, <laughs> we got everything <laughs> running through the place. And it's, it's real peaceful. Mm. That's how peaceful it is. But with this uh, with this uh, well this this thing that don't nobody want a bed and breakfast? No, no, no. We can't have that short term that short term thing. 
period. Because number one, I'm 72. My wife is 71. She just had her birthday day for yesterday. But the thing about it is my neighbor is 85 and I got another mm -hmm. one, 86. I mean 76. So how Over would there. you describe your neighborhood? One of the, her reviewers said it was a quiet neighborhood. It is a quiet. Right. Mm -hmm. It is quiet. It's quiet enough for a deer to walk through. <laughs> it's quiet enough for a turkey to walk through. It's quiet enough for me to stay out there. Hey, look, I'm not looking for no gunshot. Anything, anything come up there with shots, we looking. Yeah. We look. I got another uh, partner of mine. Hey, we talk to the police all the time on anything suspicious mm. in, the, in on our street. Hey, when's the last time you stayed up till 6 a.m.? <laughs> oh man, I ain't gonna stay up till 6 a.m. You know, you're up at 6 a.m. probably. Right? <laughs> well, yeah, you know, I mean, I go to bed early, but I get up. Early <laughs> you know, but I'm not just not gonna stay up and party like. That, you know, no. So, what do you want us to do here today? We want you to deny this uh, bit, this short-term rent thing, or whatever she's trying to get a permit, or doing whatever she's doing around there. This is a residential. This is not no business place for nothing. Okay. We come there to live, and we and, and that's the way it is. That's okay. the way I see. Any questions for the opposition? Is there? I oh. just want to make sure I understand. Did one person? Can you get back one picture frame? <clears throat> Now, ma'am, did you say you live on this little cul-de-sac? Is one of those houses yours? Do you, which one of yours? Do you live in this picture? Yeah. Can you see your house? I live on the corner. In that yeah. corner. Can you, you see your house? In. Can you see your house on this picture? It's barely outside that picture. Yeah. Okay. Barely. Yeah. It's on this road, but outside this picture. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you. Is there anybody else here in opposition that wishes to speak? This would be the only time you can. Please come forward. <laughs> And identify yourself and your address for the record. My name is Jonathan Hall. I live at 100 Queens Lane. Um, I'm also the homeowner association president for Enchanted Hills Estates. Um, also beautification commissioner and a bunch of other stuff. But um, this has been a widely discussed topic. We've followed it very closely from its inception. We are the number one voting district in the city. And we frequent every council meeting, every planning meeting, every zoning meeting that you'll always see one of us or someone from You're that area. You're welcome to be meetings. here and watch us on Metro National Network <laughs> too. Absolutely. This meeting will Look, be archived. We, and then we get on next door and talk about it immediately after watching. And somebody, you can share this on social media. There's a social media page of the National uh, Metro National Network on Facebook. They do these live. So. so you'd be surprised at how informed the overall community is and how intent we followed it. Um, to echo the extremely quiet community, 97% um, single family brick home, the entire district. There's not even one single apartment complex in the entire district, which is the largest in the city. We know every car, every neighbor. We are three and four generations. My parents built their house there early 80s, just after he did. Um, and so it's, it's exactly the way it's been described. So anything out of the ordinary not only stands out, but is amplified. So um, again, it's one of those things where it's, for us, it's not a, a matter of what to do or how to do it because you can pretty much go to anybody on any one of those blocks and ask them a random question about something like this or this in particular, and you can have a conversation about it because of how we follow it. So um, we're aware of requirements and recommendations for Airbnbs, um, for short-term rentals, and we would ask that this also be denied um, based on that criteria. Any questions for the opposition? Well, I would ask, you are aware that there are, we do have regulations that allow short-term rentals and yes. they're allowed in your district. Have you had specific complaints about this property? I understand completely the opposition to short-term terminals as a whole, but. In, in particular, um, and it was lightly touched on, because of the median age, there have been complaints, but 60, 65, 70, 80 year olds don't like to be on record complaining, don't like to be vocal, um, 
I'm going to ask Mr. Osborne later on in this meeting, but I'm pretty sure you can call or email or write the codes department and it's <coughs> anonymous. Mr. Osborne came up here earlier and said he had a complaint about this property. He didn't say who. We don't see that, you know, so. Right, and, and it's even been a topic of discussion because we work so closely with North Precinct and, and Sergeant Kornberg, the public layouts in there. He's been awesome about it. Um, and so it's come up in homeowner association meetings also. So, and that's something we are encouraging people not to just, you know, turn away or to complain to one another, but to actually make an on-record complaint. Yes, thank you. Any other questions? Is there anybody else that wants to speak in opposition before we hear from the applicant again? Okay, thank Excuse you. Excuse me, I have a petition to. Oh yes, we want that, bring that over here. Thank you. And another thing, uh, we do not sell our homes there, we do not move, we just die. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah, it's not soon. Wow, okay. Ms. Mays, come back up. So, this is rebuttal period. I wanted to ask you about it. Miss May? Okay. I'm sorry. I want to ask you about how your house is marketed. So, this is one of these sites that you basically tell people that um, we live in a quiet neighborhood called Enchanted Estates. All the homes around us have huge yards, at least an acre. You will have plenty of room to spread out, perfect for your bachelor or bachelorette trip. Are you trying to bring all these large groups of partying people into your place? Well, I have, is this on? I have four bedrooms. Actually, the house has five bedrooms, but we stay in the back section of the house. So I have four bedrooms. Um, the way mine is different from the others that just don't have anybody staying there, we stay there. I understand that. And, but it's not like you stay and, up with um, these people till 6 a.m. too. That was one instance that those guys stayed up to 6. But they stayed up and they weren't disturbing anybody but us singing um, with the guitar. But um, my husband and I don't mind the large groups. I mean, we have the room. We have the room. And the reason why we, if, when we first started doing it, we rented out the back section, which was one bedroom, a bath, and a little living area. And then a family from Florida um, planned on coming back three or four weeks later and wanted to know if they could rent the main part of the house. Well, you know, we had never thought about doing that. And we were reluctant. And so my husband said, well, we'll try it. And then, but we we never have had any problems. Everybody has been respectful. Everybody has been respectful, with the exception of that one group. They've been, and after I stopped them, they were still okay. They've been respectful of my neighbors. Um, so, how many times did you rent this house out before now? Um, we. On the weekends, um, maybe eight times. But a lot of times it's just, it's hard to rent when you have family that comes in. When you, we always, I, we have a big family. So they come in town. When they come in town, they stay with us. Okay. Like during Tennessee Stay Homecoming, we know the house is going to be packed. All through Christmas, the house is going to be packed. When the kids, when my daughter come home from college, okay. she comes with friends. So, anything else to add, or do we have any other questions for the applicant? Do you have anything else to add? Okay. Yes, the parking, my driveway is big enough for cars to park in my driveway. 12 cars? Or down, excuse me? Can 12 cars park in your driveway? 12 cars are not going to park in my driveway because people come in groups or they, they fly in. Okay. We have more cars when we have something just with our family than when guests would come. Mr. King. 
Do you understand why the neighbors seem to be against what you're doing there? They, they uh, yes, because I don't know what they think's gonna happen, but we live there, so can't we live there? It's like I'm looking right through the door at the people that's there. We interact, we speak, we talk. So any kind of nonsense that might go on, like strippers or whatever, whatever they might be thinking about doing, smoking weed, that's not going to happen. For one, my husband and I both work for Metro Schools. Why would we jeopardize our jobs? I'm a school teacher. I teach math, high school math. Are you know, I'm not going to jeopardize my job. I'm two and a half years away from retirement. I'm not going to mess up my job. I'm just trying to help my child get through school. Okay. Any, any other questions of the applicant? Okay. Anything else? No. Okay. We're going to close the public hearing. Discussion. Well, I'll start us off. And I know I said this earlier, the Metro Council gave us the leeway to give less than a year on these cases. And we have probably heard maybe 70 or 80 appeals to this board. And there are a lot of cases that, you know, hey, I didn't know, and hey, I didn't even rent, I just posted, and that was illegal. But this house has been advertised as a party house. It's advertised to bring your bachelor and bachelorette party, use our basketball courts, and people from out of this country saying that they would have been kicked out anywhere else, and they had the time of their life, the best weekend ever. Council person spoke out against this house and basically said, we passed rules and laws to regulate these. We've heard from lots of neighbors who have sat through four hours of us talking about variances and setbacks and other things. And so to me, this is a textbook example of someone that deserves a year. Is that a motion? I will move that we uphold the zoning administrators that he did not air and that this person not be eligible to have a short-term permit for a year. I'll second that. Okay, motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? Passes unanimously. Mr. Herbert. <coughs> Mr. Chairman, the next case is case 2017-241. This is John and Marie Golden, appellants and owners of the property located at 804 Cerrito Landing, requesting a variance from front setback requirements in the RS5 district to construct a single family residence referred to the board under 1712030C3. The appellant alleged that the board is jurisdiction under 1741AD-B. I know that we have opposition. This was originally on consent and then pulled off. Is the opposition still here? Yes, it is. Okay, so uh, you all, the applicants, you all have 15 minutes to make your presentation. Go ahead. Okay, I'm Marie Golden. My husband, John Golden, and I are the owners of the lot that we're talking about. Bradley Point, Lot 2. The mailing address would be 804 Cerrito Landing. My husband, John, is working on an engineering project in Colorado. He knows a lot more detail than I do, but I'll do the best I can to represent him. <clears throat> we bought lots one and two, and it's on a street that has five lots. All those lots back up to the lake. This, my husband and I live on Old Hickory Lake. So this is our, our second personal home for living on the lake. So we decided to build this home, build a home on lot one, and then um, we are here with the owner, with the buyer, Jim and Penny Cruz. There's a little background that's relevant. <coughs> The plot for the lot, the plat for the lots did not stipulate any setback requirements. The HOA covenants just request 
homeowners to position their homes for minimal interference so that everyone can enjoy the view. So John built the house on lot one with the specific intention of being sure that they would have a good view of the lake. So that house is closer to the water. The owners for, the buyers for lot two are desiring to build their home closer to the road, which we thought was a great positive because it would protect the view for the owners of 804, 800 Cerrito. So, Jim Cruz will explain what he has in mind for the house, and we would like to have an opportunity to respond to concerns. You will have rebuttal time, so reserve some rebuttal time uh, in your minute. James Cruz is my name, 4936 Greenbrier, Old Hickory. Uh, we are in escrow right now to buy this beautiful lot, and uh, we uh, totally understand the city requirements, although, uh, John Golden, who built lot uh, number one, he did not understand that he was going to set precedence. The city requirement basically says is 20 foot. We're not asking to, to, to come inside the 20 foot setback as a, re, as a requirement. What happened here is uh, Gary Cerrito, who developed the property, the, the street is after his name, Cerrito Landing. He's in the very far top lot right there. You can see that his house has the best view, 180 degree view of the, of the lake. It's a hundred and I believe 80 foot setback. And so when John built lot number one, because it's at the end of, you can see the waterway, it's at the end of the waterway, he knew if he only went 20 foot back or 30 foot back, that the house would potentially be blocked by lot two and three and four when that gets built. Three of those lots aren't built yet, and so they're vacant. They're all sold, and within a, one or two years, they will all be built. And so when, when, when I came up with my design and went to the city, they said, well, you have to take an average of the setback. So the average of the setback pushed my house 81 feet off the street, which pushes my master bedroom in the water. And so I went back to the city and they said, well, we'll let you go without asking for a variance, we'll let you go exactly 55, which is lot one. I said, well, that still messes them up because now that's gonna push me down the slope. And as you can see, the waterway, Cerrito Landing is not parallel with the water. So the deeper you get, so lot one has a deep lot, Lot two, which is the one I'm buying, begins to get shorter. Lot three, if you do not give us this variance today, then lot three, you'll pretty, pretty much take them out of the game as far as building a house because if you make them, all of us have a 55 foot setback. If you took a straight line and paralleled it with, Cer with Cerrito Landing, then lot three will, you'll take about two thirds of his lot away. So we're, we're kind of, setting precedence here today of what happens. So what we want to do uh, simply is just is come with the 20 foot setback, standard setback. I have a turn in garage, I already have a design if you'd like to see it. And um, we feel that, that it's a single story element. So we feel that uh, the, the design of the house will, uh, will be appealing to the lot. I have a letter from the Homeowners Association president and the developer saying he is in favor of the house being allowed to have this variance today. If you could share that, that'd be great. I want to hear from, what do you think, hear from the opposition? Yeah, I just, I said, since this was proposed on the consent agenda, yeah. probably be good. I mean, since I, I think you've made yeah. your case. And yeah, let's hear from the opposition. Sure, thank you. You'll, you'll come back and you'll have nine <laughs> minutes, 25 seconds. So, opposition, please come forward. This is your time. I know. <laughs> please state your name for the record and your address, why you're in opposition. Thank you. 
My name is Renee Davis, and I am the first lot that is 800. Um, that's below it. Okay. So basically, we purchased this house and love the area. It's If you can see how far back our house is, like he was saying, it was like 70 five feet back. Mm -hmm. So we love, when we went driving into this, one of the things that we loved about it was that the houses were set back a little bit. And if you go to some of the other subdivisions, like if you look down on the right hand side, that's what they're proposing is the people that have their garages coming all the way up to the street, which to me really changes the look of when you're driving into it. Um, that was one of the reasons why we wanted to buy in that area was because it, it did look more beautiful. With what they're proposing, and I want to make the point that the people that are, are putting the letters out there are the gentlemen that they develop the land and then the builder. And I understand that they want to sell the, the lot, but we would like it to not take away from when we're coming into it and the area that we have. Um, it To me, they're changing it or asking for a change in a variance for one person that just doesn't like the way that everybody already said that would look the best and what the city ordinance is. So we like it the way that it is and we would rather it not be changed for one person. I think it would be easier for them to change their plans rather than having a garage coming all the way out to the street and, and destroying that area in the way that it looks. And yeah, on this I, picture, which is your house? The only one, the one that's built right there with the red, with the red mark on it. So you, you live in lot one? Correct. Well, we do. Yeah, and, and I guess, I mean, I understand that, and, and lake, lake properties are strange in that the front of the house is facing the lake, right? Is that, or is the front of the house facing the street? The front of the house is... So it truly is a front setback. That's right. But everybody's got a nice deck or something like that on the back that no, maybe correct. looks like the, you know... Built into it. All right. And so... Yeah, I mean, all right, I, I guess I, I, I see. When you enter the neighbor, and I'm Gary King, okay, and, and we're partners, and this is our home, okay? So, but when you enter the neighborhood, and that's one thing that sold us when we just bought this, okay? And all of a sudden, we're going to have one house with a two-car garage sitting out in front of all of it. Uh, we, we would hope y'all would consider something if they could leave the garage off, okay? It's just the garage is going to be sticking out. Where is the garage on your lot? It's into the house. In it's, the back or the front? No, in the front. It's a front loaded. And that was one thing too, when we were approached to sign a paper to go ahead and do it, we weren't really, we didn't know even the information. They said, you know, can you just sign this so that it can come up farther and it, it will protect your view and things like that. But we could never really get information on how far back they were going, where we were. So like they said, I think we're <coughs> 75 feet back. So their variance is supposed to be 50 feet, which to me is maybe acceptable, but when they want to start going 40 feet, 35 feet, you know, th if they say that they can go up to 20 feet, we just didn't want to sign it because we didn't know how much it was going to change. The neighborhood. Mm -hmm. Yes. Yeah. I mean, according to their survey, you're, you guys are 55 feet, relative to their 20 that okay. they're asking. Okay. And I don't know how sometimes the road's a little further because, you know, it's, if you go from the setback, not from the... Uh, you, you may have heard already today, some people say, well, it's so much from the road, but it's so much from the, the, the setback. But they've yeah. got their survey uh, shows them requesting 20 feet to their garage, and it looks like it's 55 feet to your existing. Yeah, garage. and I, I believe the other house is 110 feet. They're pretty far back. If you can kind of picture that right there, okay, when you pull in right there, you're going to see that garage, okay? It's, it's going to be the first thing you notice. It's kind of a quaint little street, just not much else to go to, but you're not going to see much after that down through there. And Anything else to add? Is there any, oh, yes. Who else wants to speak in opposition? Good evening. Um, I'm exactly opposite these guys. So, so yeah, state your name and address. I'm Michael Flanders, and I'm at 501 Sandy Cove. Um, so are you across the water? I'm exactly across the water, so my confusion okay. is I'm, I'm in support of these people, and, and, you know, we've also, you know, the Goldens have asked, uh, asked us to move our dock and all sorts of kind of things, and I'm always confused because 
we moved into this neighbourhood prior to anything being developed over there, and we were told by the Corps of Engineers there will be no more docks, and if so, there will be a community dock. So, as you can see, there's been uh, major disruptions, and I never would have spent the money I spent on a property knowing what was about to happen in the neighbourhood. So. Uh, so, yeah, I'm here to support these guys, and uh, I, I agree. I, I didn't go to a hearing um, a couple of years ago, and they built a home opposite us on the other street and changed... It was, it's now the only house in the street that doesn't follow the codes. And it, not only that, they have chickens and they have boats in their front yard, and so who, <laughs> who knows what's next? So that's, that's my five cents worth. Yes. Okay. I live in the house across the street on the corner over there. I, I've lived there for many years. I don't even want to tell you how many. And I've seen all of all this developed. His developed, hers developed, all of them. You take where I'm sitting and you move a house straight out to the road and then another one to the back and, and the way they go around there, that's going to be kind of an eyesore. And that's not, if you could actually see that, that's not a very big yeah. road through there. And Did you state your name? Oh, excuse me. My name is Linda Calvin Ray. Mm -hmm. I live at 3004 Lake Shore Drive. Thank you. So and why are you in opposition to this? Well, I think that the way, when they first came up here, they was asking for six homes in there, and they just said that there would be five. They give him the zoning for five. And they all were supposed to kind of went, he, he said, as they around like this. That's why his house is back there, and this one's up here. They come around to meet one another, not set out on the street. If you have one setting out on the street, and the others in the back. Can you imagine how that's going to look when you look across the street or any of us on the other side, gonna, what we're going to see? We can't, can't see the lake no more, but <laughs> we, we're going to see that. Okay. Any I'm questions gonna... from the opposition? Sir? Can I say one other thing? Of course, of course. I didn't know we should call a councilman, or I probably would have approached our councilman. I don't even know who he is. Okay, I'm, I'm, I'm from a small town in Shelbyville, Tennessee, uh, coming to Nashville. Right, so <laughs> it's new for me, but I didn't know that would make a big difference or we would have done it. I just had no clue, and the man might have his mind changed if we did go approach him, but we did not, so I didn't know to do that. Sir? Well, I guess, I'm sorry. Oh, no good. So your complaint is really the design. You don't like the garage in the front of what you've seen. Right. It will stick out past. It's going to really stick out. When you make that little turn, you're going to see that garage, two-car garage sitting out. Okay. And so you'd rather have him come back as far as he can go? I think he's going to be as far as he can go from what I looked. He's got a porch going on the back that I didn't see on there, but I did see out here when I looked at a plan that was going to be that it's a a roofed porch. Uh, they're going to be very close to whatever the core and everybody's going to let them be. I mean, that's that's what everybody's kind of threatened us with. Oh, if you don't let us get this front, then we're going to build all the way out the back. And right. and so I, I don't know. And, you know, we may be hurting ourselves, but at least when you pull up, it's going to all kind of look uniform a little bit. It won't be, you know, one way out, one way in, and then you won't ever see these other people's lots when they get there. Okay. So you're definitely more concerned about your view from the street than you might be of the lake because it sounds like if they do what, if they do go past or closer to the water, then you may they not. They can only go a, so far. My understanding right. is that yeah, you may end up with no view of the lake except for across the way. Well, and that, that's what. But that, you you understand that? And that's yes. What you're yes, here and, to say and, you'd and, rather have that. Then, then scooting up the 20. Yeah, we're, we're going to okay. take our okay. chances on that because I, I think uh, there's a big nice tree right there. I don't think the core is going to let them take down, okay? So yeah. we're going, there, somebody's got to build around some stuff. If you'll see that great big tree right there. Okay, uh, you did mention about your council person, Councilman Hager. I know you're busy. I don't even know him. I never met him. Celebrating 100 years of the beautiful area of Old Hickory. We have a letter from him. Or email. Okay. Um, this is on the agenda today. I was in, I inform them as long as the neighbors agree, I do not have a problem with it. This is a small five lot subdivision and unique being on the lake. They are trying to do this without blocking the view of the lake to each homeowner as well. I told them they will have to talk 
to the utility apartments. If it encroaches on those easements in the front, Brandywine Harbor behind me was a hodgepodge of setbacks and it blocked a lot of views of the lake for them. So he's basically saying, well, if nobody opposes it, I'm for it, but obviously that's not the case. Mm -hmm. You all are in opposition. So, any other questions for the opposition? I think you got one more opposition out here. Okay, come forward please. Can someone give up their seat so they can come? Please state your name and your address for the record. Hi, my name is Suki mm -hmm. Smith and I live at 3008 Lakeshore Drive, <coughs> directly across the street from her house. Okay. Why, and, um, why are you opposed to this? When I first moved into my house, there was nothing there in front of me. And then I was told that the house that was going to be built in front of me would be further up. Instead, it's blocked every piece of anything that I can see, it, uh, even a, unless I put a glass of water on the road, that's all, I don't see any water. The only place I can see it is on the sec, there's this deck above, well, that's my house, but you can't tell. But there's a deck above on the second story. And um, from there is the only place you can see the lake at all. And once there's, once, and right below a little bit, and once something covers that, then there will be nothing. That's it. It's just gone forever. And um, at 67, I don't think I'm going to be buying another house. I think I'm kind of with that woman. Well, I just die. <laughs> so um, I loved her. Uh, and, and also, that house was not built to be a second home. That house was built and told to me by John Golden that he was going to buy that lot and the one, that one next to it, and he was going to flip those homes, not live in them ever, ever. And he made a lot of promises to me that he didn't keep a lot, and to the architect, and he didn't keep. And I feel like, darn it, I, I wasn't going to say anything today, and I wasn't even going to raise my hand. But you know what, I just feel like I want to do the right thing. And I love the idea, even though I can't see it, I love the idea of a cohesive street from the back and the front. And if there's a, a, a the setback, you know, whether it's 50 or 40 feet, that, that's not that much. But when one, one is so much closer, I think it upsets the balance. And as an artist, I can tell you, um, I would have to be erasing that really quickly because I would want that cohesion and also the same thing at the water because it makes for a more attractive neighborhood when, you know, when you, you've seen neighborhoods where everything is like Victorian and then there's like this metal house with glass going up four stories, you know what I'm saying, where it's just, I just think um, it'd be nice to stay with what um, the setback should be and what the setback from the water should be. I think it's a really nice idea. And, I Any. need to say that. It doesn't even affect me much except for upstairs where I can see the water. What? I'm sorry? She's across the street. Right across. The see that tiny little, one. See that little white house that was built in 1830? Oh, no, 1930, sorry. It's older than I am, thank God. Um, anyway, it was built in 1930. It's very old, and but I did have a magnificent view. And, um, and I know... So, any other questions? And what, who, who said that? You don't always get what you want. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Any other questions? Okay. We're going to hear from the applicant again. So thank, thank you. Thank you. We have about nine minutes and 20 some seconds okay. for rebuttal. So it's rebuttal time. So okay. So, uh, it, you know, I, I totally get it. I appreciate it. I, well, let I, me I, ask you this. Yeah. Okay. We had a former chairman of this board named Chris Whitson, former council person, and he's always as council person trying to find a middle ground. Okay. Seems to me that you all are here and everybody else is over here. It doesn't seem like you've really talked to each other. Would meeting and getting together and deferring this case actually help, or are you all so far apart that nothing will help? Well, the, the question that I have is when they say they had moved into a quaint neighborhood, there's three houses to be built out of five lots. So it's very quaint right now, but <laughs> lot three is gonna get built, that could be a 10,000 square foot house. Lot four is gonna get built, that could be a huge house, just just staying in these, in these guidelines, so. So the answer is no. I'm sorry? The answer is no. 
As far as talking to the council person, talking to your neighbor, well, no, so I, finding I, middle ground. I'm ready to do middle ground right now, and I, I, I believe this would so be great. So your right. proposal is middle ground, yeah. you're saying? Well, so I've got a proposal that I think you guys would agree that the water line, the way the water line is angling, if we kept every house back 55 feet on that street, then you agree that you're, ta you're, you're, you're encroaching to where a house is, it can't hardly even be built there if we have to stay 55 foot back. But you're almost 55 feet in without the garage. Well, yeah, but a house has to have a garage. I'm going to well, have no, a garage. The massing, I mean, the square massing, you're just adding a, you know, you're basically building a house and then pop, there's the garage. So, I mean, I mean, it, it, it's right, but the setback, the 55 is going to be to the garage. So then I'm going to have to, so that 600 square feet or 400 square feet is going to have to go in, into that house, that footprint. That's, that's the problem. So, and then lot three, so if I may uh, show you this, lot three uh, would be really, uh, is going to be, going to be in trouble because if, if you make me stay with 55 foot, then lot three is going to have to be 55 But today we, we have one case in front of us. I know this affects all these other lots, but you know, we're here to have one case. We cannot be worried about lot three or four down the road. Okay. That's so what we're so my, my proposal is I, there is 20, I have 21 less feet from the water. If you, if you, here's, here's the, the, the math right here. I have 21 feet less from the, the curb to the waterway running parallel with the property lines. So then, then I, I guess what I'm saying is I'm willing to go, and I think that would help lot three, is if- Everyone has waited through four and a half hours of BZA cases, which weren't theirs, to say that they're opposed to you. That is, when you're saying I'm here kind of reaching out, they obviously don't like your proposed plan, right? Who, who's they? I'm sorry. You've been sitting here. Have you changed your proposal since you've been sitting here? No, I, I'm just. No, I didn't think so. No, okay. So, okay. so, so what I'm saying is <coughs> the code says the setbacks are here. You're asking us to push that back. And you have lots of opposition, and you don't have the council person supporting it either. So, may you, I offer something? Yes. The. Um, setbacks were not specified on the plat. So that's how the first house got built back so far. We're not here talking about the first, we're talking about- But there are circumstances. But once you built the first house, then that that has some in implication on where the rest of the setbacks But we go. did not know that. We well, had I, no idea. Well, I understand idea. that, but I mean, that's- It's you know, what it the, is. The, what I heard you all say, though, was that you'd worked with codes to, you know, we, we, we see, we've seen cases like this before where you have empty lots and you have a wide variance in, in the end pieces and, and you end up with two what, two houses that determine that setback and the, and the average is, is kind of nutty for the lot you're talking about. But what I hear is that you've gone to codes and they've said, you know, hey, it's supposed to be, I don't think you all said 80 something feet or something, it was some, a really long distance. 86 feet. But hey, we'll, we'll compromise and we'll let you build in line with the house, you know, next door. And so, you know, it sounds like codes is already working with you. And, you know, in a case like this, there there is, a case for a variance. It obviously was something that had there not been any opposition, uh, this board probably wouldn't have a problem with it. But you do have opposition. As the council person, <laughs> basically the council person said, as long as everybody's happy with it, I'm for it. And but so if it's no agreement, I'm not for it. And so I mean, I I think that what the chairman is offering is an opportunity to go back and, and rethink it and and come up with a compromise, uh, or you can have us vote and. I think you may have seen that, and I can't speak for my fellow commissioners, but when the council member says, you know, I, I, I'll defer to the neighbors, and, and you have the immediate neighbor and two people that say they live, I, I, I know they, I live, they live where they say, but they, they consider themselves across the street neighbors, so they consider themselves part of the neighborhood saying they have a real problem with it, then I, I think it may be tough to get your votes, and that's why the, count, the chairman has said, maybe you should 
take a two week deferral, go back and look at this thing, talk to the neighbors. Maybe you can come up with something different and maybe you just come back and say, no, I really want but to. But if it's up to this. you and if that's the plan, you don't want to change, you have a right to an upper. No, no, I'm, I'm willing to change, but so, so I just have to get agreement from my neighbor and then if they say that they're okay with it, then we come back. Well, or I mean, how do you're we not going to get probably total agreement, but there's probably middle ground mm -hmm. from what you have. I think they're reasonable people. They like the lake. They're looking kind of. They're also interested in the houses on three and four too. So I think you could all work together. You could actually. Do you own three or four? Do you own. Okay. But, Except owners. Okay, but you know, you could bring them in the picture too, and everyone said this is what we agreed to, and you could record it, mm -hmm. and this is where we're going to build. And I think that would be best for this very small, very close-knit street. So would you like a deferral to get to talk to the people around you and involve Councilman Hager to see if you come to them? No, you're not going to make everybody happy. I get that. But there's some negotiation. And as Mr. Taylor said, you're talking about your garage. That could be maybe incorporated a little bit better. You know, I think aesthetically they don't like that either. So that would be my recommendation, but it's up to you what you want to do. Well, again, I'm willing to, to, to work with the design. And uh, I, you so know, would you I, be willing to defer this uh, two weeks or two meetings? Or do, We have meetings every first and third uh, Thursday. Same place, same time. If you, feel like, yeah, if you feel like you need a month, we can defer it two meetings. If yeah. you feel like you can do it in two weeks or, or yeah, two three weeks meetings. Yeah, two weeks is tight, particularly if you want to involve well, the Well, if we can do it in two weeks, that'd be great. Yeah, and, but and you may not be able to. That's what I'm saying. Okay. Well, so. the sooner the better, sure. I know. Are you, are you agree with that? I am. Okay. Opposition, that's... You'll work with them, maybe? Yes, yes. Okay. I, I think absolutely. Out. Okay, good. Okay, so let's defer this. Two meetings. And Two I meetings. think we should let's bring lots three yeah. and four to the table as yes, well. Yes, and I, th I think you can't have this in a vacuum without right. them. And if you could come with some sort of, and you've hired architects and planners, and that if you could come with, this is where all the remaining lots are going to go because that will keep this from happening again. <coughs> and I think some of the opposition, they're kind of, they may not be as hard against you, but they're worried about the other lot. So if every piece can be put together, I think that will help. So yeah, that's tough when it's when they're custom lots, custom homes, and there's, there's not a master plan. So but Chairman, may, maybe we tell them to, uh, you know, if you can't get everybody together, if you get rushed for the next meeting, just But I think they contact. should probably do two meetings. Just yeah, contact staff, and if you can't do you it, you could get on the next agenda. You can get on the yeah. next agenda. Right. So, so I'll move that we defer this two meetings. Yeah. Okay. I'll All second right. it. Um, motion has been made to defer two meetings. Is there any discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. 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 Opposed? Okay. Work with your neighbors. Thank you. Please call Councilman Hager immediately okay. and get everyone in the same room. Yeah, okay? And maybe at one of these lot number one house, can you host them? I'm sorry. Okay. Host the meeting. Get to know your neighbors. Discussion. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. I we need your break? patience. Yeah. Oh, no, but we, do we need a break? I think we might. Mr. Harper. Do we need Okay, we just three minutes. Three minutes? We lost, yeah. Okay, three minutes. Three minute break. To the neighborhood. Uh, do we? Yeah, I think you probably do. Okay, doke. The next case, or which is the last case on the agenda, actually, case 2017-256, is asking. For, it's located at 131 Express Drive. Is asking for a deferral also to October the 5th for the same purpose of consulting with the council person trying to get their support. Do we have a motion? Is there a second? Second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Pass. That passes. You may go ahead.
ahead and call the next case. Okay. Okay. The next case we're going to hear is case number 2017-247. It is Norman S. Harper, appellant, and the Church of Christ at Broadmoor Avenue, owner of the property located at 264 Broadmoor Avenue, requesting special exception and variance from the sidewalk requirements in the RS-10 district to construct additions to the nursery and classroom spaces. It's been referred to the board under 1716-175-E1, 1720-125. The appellant alleged the board has jurisdiction under 1740. 180 B and C. Do we have opposition to case 247 on Broadmoor Drive? Seeing no opposition, sir, you have 10 minutes. Do we want to? Do we want to wait for David to get back just to, to start the case? We, whatever the board. Yeah, I, I think we wait just a minute or two to. Then we're ready. That way, we know as soon as it's here to back. All right. Uh, yeah, the chairman's here. And just in in your absence, two cases requested a deferral, and we took a, a okay. quick vote to defer those two. Very good. And the next case is called, but waiting for your leadership. Let's go. Here we go. My name is Norm Harbor, 1303 Springfield Highway, Goodlettsville. I've been a member of this church since 1988. I'm also an architect, so I'm doing the design for the building. Um, I understand that we have to go through special exception uh, for a church addition in RS-10 zoning. I understand that. But I am um, uh, challenging the, the sidewalk ruling, the new sidewalk, uh, for several reasons. Uh, first of all, we do have a sidewalk along Broadmoor. It is a, uh, a five-foot wide sidewalk, and the new requirement is a six-foot wide sidewalk. The, we also have a four-and-a-half-foot wide grass strip. The new grass strip requirement is six feet. So there's just not much difference. Uh, also, the sidewalk going in the westward direction it ends abruptly just past our property. So don't really see the need to, to, to upgrade the sidewalk if it's a sidewalk to nowhere already. Um, also wanted to appeal on uh, some hardship issues, basically financial, and that's uh, because of flooding issues we've had at our building. Can I ask S you before you go yep. into all that, how was your meeting? Did you, you had a meeting, right? Early Nobody time? showed. Nobody showed? Okay. Nobody showed. Council person didn't even show up? N and she couldn't make it. Okay, so it was just... We, we just couldn't. Okay. We couldn't find a time. Very good. Um, we, we've had some flooding issues at this property uh, going back to 2010. In the May 2010 flooding, we understand that was a thousand-year flood, so a lot of that couldn't be avoided. But there were some stormwater issues <coughs> around our building that uh, we, we think the stormwater uh, piping was inadequate. So we've had flooding issues since 2010. Um, and, and until uh, 2015, when stormwater was improved along Dickerson downstream from us, uh, that it seems like the flooding issues ha have gone away. But we've paid over $60,000 in damages and repairs to our building since 2010. So just based on some financial hardship, we just don't feel like any other uh, financial hardships being placed on us to build a sidewalk uh, are, are necessary. Um, I, I would also say, though, if, if we're going to be, be required to build a sidewalk, we would rather build the sidewalk according to your, your uh, designs uh, instead of paying the in lieu amount, because the in lieu amount that I've been told uh, I think is uh, above uh, what's normal, and I think we can bid it out and, and get it done for less. Okay. But first of all, I'd, I'd like to just be exempt from having to build it at all. Okay. Questions? Oh, I do have a question. Um, planning staff um, one it recommended we approve the special exception with conditions, and one was that any additional parking be um, located beside or behind buildings. Are you willing to accept that condition? Can you repeat that? Mm -hmm, sure. They said um, the requesting parking shall meet the requirements of the Metro Zoning Code and any additional parking required should be located beside or behind buildings. That's what we're showing now on the site plan. So okay, yes. but you accept their... We accept that. Okay. Any other questions? 
you know you're there very close to the school, Maplewood School, correct? Just across the street. And the sidewalk upgrades are being done for safety primarily. I, I understand that, but if they came across the street to use the sidewalk on our side of the street, it would lead nowhere. I mean, they, it would end just past our property going west, and that's where most, well, no, I, well, I wouldn't say most of the residential, but some residential is. But I, I, I understand your point. I understand from planning that there's already a four foot, uh, six inch wide grass strip Correct. between the sidewalk. Correct. The concrete sidewalk and the road, okay. Any other questions? Anything else to add? I'll, I'll just add that I see this, the sidewalk seldom used now. Even with the school across the street? Right. Now, I'm not there when school lets out, but um, when I am there, which is often enough, um, I do see the sidewalk on the other side of the street being used uh, quite a bit, but not on our side so much. Okay. Is that business, business 615 <coughs> next door to you there? 615, yes, that's the building next door. And they, have, they just got a... SP, they're doing a whole lot of development all around through there. I understand it's um, it's being put forward uh, to do some development behind, south of them. Yes. Yes. So I see a whole lot of foot traffic down there. Must have. I understand. Anything else to add? No. Okay, we're going to close the public hearing discussion. Lots of sidewalks today, too. Yeah, I mean, I, I tend to be empathetic with the sure, I have, have no issue with the special exception for the classroom space in the nursery. Um, on the sidewalk, um, you know, I mean, it's, it, I think there is a case where it's just so close. You know, I mean, you already have a four and a half foot grass strip is um, is substantive. So, I mean, I, I, I don't uh, I, I don't have a real problem with the request. I, I agree with you. <coughs> and especially because planning staff um, deemed it adequate as well. I mean, I'd, I'd have a real, I'd, I'd have an issue if it were two feet, especially right. with the mm -hmm. development in the, in the neighborhood, but four and a half is mm -hmm. Uh, is four and a half more feet of grass space than you have on West End. <laughs> so, <laughs> so uh, anyone have a motion? How, how does everyone feel about the in lieu fee? I read his note that the $60,000 they've incurred to repair their building was in part because of the city's failure to provide for stormwater runoff. So, and he also I, I, said, I take that into account. you know, it would be cheaper, he says, to just build the sidewalk than to pay the in lieu fee. I'm, I'm happy to at least throw out a motion that we approve the special exception uh, and the variance from sidewalk requirements. Uh, to construct the additions to the nursery and classroom space. I'll Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any discussion? Seeing none. I support the special exception, but I cannot go, go with the sidewalk. Okay. All those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. Okay. Passes. Uh, Mr. King dissents. <coughs> Six to one. Can I speak? Yes. Can you clarify what you've just passed? Uh, so we approved yes. your... No, yeah, yeah go ahead. Yeah, no, we approved the uh, special exception to do the addition, and you are not required to do anything with your sidewalk. Thank you or very much. Or pay into the fund. Thank you very much. The next case is case 2017-252, Brady O'Rourke, appellant and owner of the property located at 2420 Little Avenue, requesting an item A appeal, challenging the zoning administrator's denial of a short-term rental permit. The applicant operated prior to obtaining the legally required permit in the R6 district, referred to the board under 1716-250E. The appellant has alleged the board has jurisdiction under 1740-180A. Do we have opposition here to this case? Seeing opposition, sir, you have 15 minutes. 
Uh, good evening. Um, I did a, prepare a statement for you guys, just I've, I've never done this, so. Um, first, I do want to apologize for the confusion caused through this, through this application process while setting up our first and only owner-occupied residence as an Airbnb host. It was never our intention to fly under the radar or to not comply with any of the city ordinances. Um, my partner and I bought the home early in April after we moved in. Um, we realized that we might be able to temporarily supplement some of our income uh, with one of the bedrooms on the first floor. Um, it was, uh, it's got its private entrance. Um, it's a small master bedroom, so it was perfect for one to two people. Um, at this time, I was also really eager to uh, leave the job that I was at so I could start my own small business. Um, and so one night I was actually researching how to make an Airbnb listing and the process was so easy that I already had the pictures on my phone since we had just bought the, the home um, that uh, I made the profile within just seconds. I mean, it was, it was that easy. Um, and I thought to myself, well, it, it can't be that easy and it can't be that busy. Uh, and so, um, Following that, I never got a follow-up list from Airbnb. I did wake up the next morning to several actual reservations um, within a couple days. And uh, panicked, I, I canceled them all and because we weren't prepared and I didn't really know a whole lot about Airbnb at that point. Um, and when I went to go cancel, obviously Airbnb, or not so obvious, I guess, Airbnb uh, started to penalize us for these cancellations, not knowing their process or the city's process. I was, I was also shocked by that. Um, and so uh, we, our first guest came in on April 27th. Uh, we just kind of took it as like a trial, like, well, maybe we're gonna hate this, maybe it's gonna be something we can do. Um, and so we were scrambling at that point to continue to research and, and figure out what are the next steps if we wanted to do this. Um, and at that time I had a very, very busy work schedule um, and uh, I did, it took about three weeks for me to actually get, uh, you know, time off from my job to come down and, and uh, deal with the permit. Um, so at this point, uh, I think we had probably three or four people that had stayed at the house when we went down to go get our permit. Um, we gathered all the necessary paperwork, we sent out the certified letters, um, and the, the gentleman that we presented all the documentation to um, had stated that we had everything that we needed to move forward, however, the certified mail needed to be in the mail for an additional 10 hours. Um, it didn't seem to be at that time more than a, you know, come back and, and we'll get you fixed up type of situation. There was also no denial at that time, um, and uh, he also prompted us to make sure that it was uh, available online so that we could have the insurance. Um, so obviously there's a misunderstanding on our part because um, nothing was ever mentioned that it was illegal or that uh, you know, we we're having, gonna have some potential issues to come back and, and get this permit. Um, had we known that this was you know, the severity of the situation, we wouldn't have even continued at that point. Um, I just assumed that the permit was more of just a registration piece for the city. Um, so again, I was uh, at, with my prior job. Um, it was hard for me to you know, ask for additional time off, especially coordinating you know, with the, the long lines that are, are there and coordinating with the app and, and it's just a, a very unpredictable uh, environment that um, is set up to, to go get these permits. So eventually I had to give power of attorney to my partner Chase um, and he was able to make it down on 8-17, uh, which is when we were rejected. Uh, we had been gone for uh, about 20 days prior to that. I ha was in Minnesota trying to dig up some, some business. He was with me, um, so we weren't operating really at that time either. Um, and so now uh, I have quit my job. I have um, literally banked that this was gonna be you know, a temporary income for us. We have paid the city our taxes. We have paid Metro their codes. Um, we paid all the, the additional expenses that went along with the appeals. Um, and so again, I, I, with the cancellations, it was another you know, $2,000. Um, and we didn't really have the ability to book any additional ones. This isn't an Airbnb that people are coming in and partying. This is, you know, business people. This is couples. This is this is like a, a small thing. 
Um, and so, you know, I, I am requesting that the board understands that um, while it is online and there are things out there, it is not an easy process. Airbnb makes it really easy to sign up. It is not really easy to go through all of your, uh, you know, due diligence with the, with the city. Um, m my professional background is, is in web, web design and development, and I can tell you I called the city three times to try to figure out where to get that stuff on uh, the government's website. So um, again, this wasn't like a, a malicious thing or, or something that we were uh, not aware of that we needed to go through the motions. It was just, it was, just, it was really difficult. And we, this is the third time now that we're trying to get a permit. And the first time it wasn't even told to us that we were doing something illegal. I mean, he pulled it right up there on the computer and said, you know, come back and, and we'll get it taken care of. Okay. Um, yeah, let's hear from our enforcer. No, before we hear from the opposition, Bob, come back. And you can start making your way up too, so you'll have some rebuttal time after. Okay, tell us about this case. And I want to ask you the question that came up, you know, can you anonymously <coughs> complain about a uh, short-term rental and not have anyone know who it, who it is? You sure can. There's How do actually, you do that? There's actually a new short-term rental hotline, and its number is 435-787-4357. Can you repeat that again? 435-787-4357. You can just call a phone. It's like there's ticked off here. in the Green Hills News. Just rant. Right. Sure can. Okay, so tell us about this case. Um, I haven't uh, been able to work this case. It wasn't reported to me. Um, it is still listed online. However, the calendar is blocked. There are 32 reviews. It's listed for one bedroom. So tell me out here, because this has come up in the past. It's listed online. How is it still listed online, but you said this is a calendar blocked means you can't book it? Um, not in the conventional, conventional way. So you could do the more than 30 days? Uh, well, it's still listed for two-night minimum. So the only way to uh, be able to rent it is to contact the host and work out some sort of agreement uh, via that way. How often? I mean, so I want my person come, yeah, come back, come back. Why is your listing still up? Honestly, I didn't even know it was. <laughs> I, I contacted Airbnb and just said we're having you issues with that. You're a web that. professional. I, I understand that, but I don't. I'm not searching for my my home. I contacted Airbnb and told them that and we're having we're issues. We're talking about how Betro's website is. You know, Airbnb. I'm sure spent tens of millions of dollars. I'm just telling website. you, under under my understanding, we were we were doing exactly what we were told. Uh, that's the bottom line. I, I wasn't trying to avoid anything. I'm not trying to advertise anything. Have you had any inquiries during this period of time? No, we, can, we can't. What do you mean you can't? It's blocked out. There's no, Okay. there's nothing there. So anything else? I believe that's all I have. Any questions for anybody? Okay, we'll hear from the opposition and come back. Okay. Please state your name, your address for the record, and why you're here. Uh, my name is Kyle Weber. I live at uh, 1510 Ward Avenue. Uh, I've lived in the neighborhood for uh, two years. My house is, uh, if you look So we at, see Ward Avenue, it's like Tiny Street. Uh, yes, correct. It's a dead end. It's a very quiet street. Um, up till the last year, I was the newest residence on that street. Everyone there was older and had lived there for 15 to 20 years. Um, and then all the new construction came into the neighborhood and the, uh, these houses were built and then the other four that are next to my house. Um, the neighbors in my neighborhood are very quiet. They were concerned when uh, new people started moving in that uh, their voices would not be heard and that their concerns would not be uh, uh, resonated throughout the city council and through the city. I understood that. and. Uh, I, I, I don't like hearing that, so I took it upon myself to come in and speak today. Um, so far, that house, uh, there's only two small entrances off of Little into Ward, and when there are individuals at that house, the driveway is already full all the time, and the other cars spill out onto the street. When that happens, there's parking on both sides of the road. 
you can't get in and out of that street when cars are on both sides. So Ward is up in the top left-hand corner. Correct, sir. And Little runs right in front of there. So we have to go back around uh, the other side and come back up, which was is an inconvenience because the uh, street on the other side, which is Chester, is even but, narrow. But they're not renting out their whole house. It's just you know <laughs> parts of it. So how do you know it's from them and not someone else? Well, because the out-of-town plates that are there, um, the Section 8 houses on the other side and low-income houses there, uh, it's the same vehicles all the time. Uh, there are a lot of out-of-state cars in that area, and also it has brought crime because there has been before. Wait a minute. I mean, that's not fair to say that air short-term rentals have brought crime to an area. Well, there's been cars vandalized and uh, tires flattened. Um, well, it's not, I mean, they just happened. They were victims of crime. They were victims brought. of crime in the area. Um, I guess what really brought it to a head um, was, other than the parking, is two weeks ago, uh, Sunday morning, 7.30 a.m., wife and I were going to church and then breakfast, and as we drove by their house, front doors open, there's a man peeing in the front yard. There is a Eastland Park right there that a lot of the neighborhood kids play at, um, which is, that's awfully disturbing to me and my wife and I don't want to see that. I know the lady on the corner in one of the low-income houses raises her grandchildren there. Um, I don't know if it was a rental at that time, if it was friends, I, that doesn't concern me. What I know is myself and the neighbors have heard loud parties from there. There's been coming and going late in the evening and then that, that uh, that urinating incident was was the icing on the cake for me. And all I would ask is that, you know, th there is a punishment for not having the proper permits, and that's a year, and that, that's what I would ask for, the proper punishment. Okay. Questions for the opposition? Okay. Thank you. We're going to hear from the applicant again. This is rebuttal. So uh, you heard what the applicant talked about Sunday morning. Do you know anything about that? I don't have a clue what he's talking about. Um, I'm not even sure that I was here last Sunday, to be honest with you. Um, Did you rent it out? No, we don't rent the entire house out. It is a single bedroom on the very first floor, one to two people, period. Uh, it's businessmen, it's couples. Um, I mean, it is a, a quiet thing. Um, is when you rent the house out, what's the clue? Obviously you have bathrooms in this house. How many bathrooms do you have in this house? Uh, th three and a half. Okay. And how many do they have access to if I'm renting out? Just one. one. Okay. Yeah. Where's I mean, that? it's like a sectioned off part of the house that's got okay. its own private patio piece gotcha. in there. As far as the parking goes, I'm not, this is a, this neighborhood is, is being built left and right. I mean, I have no idea whose cars are there either. Um, and if we want to park in our driveway, rather than in the garage because it's convenient for us and we do have a small garage. I don't see why that's anybody's business either. Okay. Um, the, the, what I'm trying to reiterate is, is we, we've, we've gone through the process um, and we've, we've attempted to do it the right way. It's just, it's so difficult to get through um, all these different loopholes and with Airbnb arguing with Metro and things are constantly changing. I try to keep up on it. Um, like I said, there is nothing malicious about it. Um, and if, if uh, 1510 has a, a problem with people having social lives, this is, I mean, this is a, an up and coming neighborhood. You can see there's, I don't know, six or seven houses that are, that look just like mine. All of them have rooftops. All of them have millennials living in them and all of them are respectful of each other. So I'm not, I'm not really sure that any of the points that he made are really valid to what we're actually asking and, and talking about today. Um, the, the road is narrow. There's not even a sidewalk on, on our side of the street. Um, in fact, our neighbor in the backyard, he's trying to grow grass. Um, he's been trying to grow grass for six or seven months. Um, but we're respectful of that. I mean, like, it's not a, it's not a thing where this is like some big, you know, uh, Airbnb, the, like the 14 person thing that uh, you, you guys had to hear about today. Um, so yeah, let me you, ask you a question. Do you have a permission permit now to do that? Really? 
No, we, we canceled everything, and I thought it was off of online. I, all I did was call Airbnb and tell but you, them to. But you've, been, but you've been renting it, correct? We did, and we we've, we That's came. You said you had not. Hmm. He rented it, but he had rented it since he got. So, so, so the timeline is, is, is uh, I signed up. Uh, the next morning I had reservations. I canceled them all. Um, because of the penalties that Airbnb was giving us, we were like, well, let's just try it this one night. And we had probably two or three people that stayed there, came in to come get our permit. The, we had all of our paperwork done. Uh, the gentleman there said, you have everything done correctly except for the certified mail needs to be in the mail for another 10 hours. Come back and we'll get you fixed up. He didn't say at that time you're denied. He didn't say this was illegal. He just said, just come back and we'll get you fixed up. Um, and between then and, and now, um, I have been busy trying to you know, get my business up and running. I have spent probably the last 30 to 40 days in a car driving around trying to talk to clients. Um, and so that's why I'm not, I don't even think I was there last Sunday, to be honest with you. Um, and there are, on the, like he said, uh, low income homes on the other side of that. In fact, that whole block is. So if there's crime and there's uh, somebody peeing in, in yards, it's not coming from our house. So. Um, so do you live there? I'm, yeah, I do live there. Yeah. Okay. Any other questions of the applicant? Okay. We're going to, anything else to add? No, just that, I, we, like I said, we weren't trying to avoid anything, and, and I think um, just like there's a hotline for complaints, there should, for the benefit of everybody, for you guys, so you guys can save your time, there should be a, a better portal or some automation piece where you can submit all of your documentation and get your acceptance or approval there. This process has been hard, and uh, with people that are, you know, full-time jobs, it just, it's very difficult. Um, and I think that uh, both sides should be considered if you're gonna complain, make it easy. If you're gonna, you know, be responsible and come get your permits, make it easy. Okay, thank you. We're gonna close the public hearing. Discussion. Yeah. Uh, two of the uh, large condos there have uh, permitted Airbnbs and I have not had issues with that. Okay, that's fine. We're gonna close the public hearing. Let me respond to what the applicant just said about the Metro website. I think we have, where's our enforcer? How many short-term rental permits are there right now in Nashville? Um, I don't have that. Ballpark. Uh, Is it 800? Is it 2,000? <coughs> In the 3,000 range. Okay, so there are over 3,000 people that have navigated this site, figured out how to send us money and fire marshal reports and things like that. You know, and people, because Nashville is doing very well, people that rent out Airbnbs are doing very well. I don't really have any sympathy for complaining about our process because 3,000 people have done it and they're doing very well, the ones that have this. So to me, that doesn't wash. You know, Airbnb, everyone's trying to do it. Codes get some queries about it all the time. People have figured out how to do it. So discussion. Mr. Chairman, if I may, our website has a complete question and answer. It has the entire process on it. All you have to do is go to the code's website, mm -hmm. and it has a link to all the questions you could ever want to know about Airbnp, yeah. what you have to do, what you have to do to get a permit, yeah. frequently asked questions. Yeah. I know we all. haven't spent tens of millions of dollars like Airbnb and VRBRO and all these other sites, but it's pretty good, and 3,000-plus people have figured it out. So, discussion. I'm opposed. Any other comments? I don't know how this one is so different from the others we've heard today and in the past. Uh, it's a typical case, somebody's running out without an actual legal permit, but 
is making an effort to get one and has, if, and I suppose we can, can check on it and make sure that he's sure. not continuing you, to currently rent. But as you know, the council set the bar at a year and then gave us discretion to do that differently. We've heard from a couple council people, not about this case, to basically enforce the rules. So, yeah, I think it's similar to the, the earlier case that, and I think it probably may be in the in the penalty range of the case that that you had uh, commented on earlier that had 30 reviews. Mm -hmm. I think this one has about 30 reviews. I think you were. Uh, I wanted three months. You wanted you three months. We settled, go on. we settled for 30, and, and maybe since the process was in place, this is a you know 30 to 45. But it, it feels like it's in in that uh, okay. well, in that of, in that type of range to me. But I don't know what other folks think. Mr. King says no here. <laughs> I'll, I'll agree with you. So someone needs to make a motion, not me. Um, I'll move that we. Uh, find in favor of the zoning administrator that he uh, did not err in finding that they rented without a, a permit and that this uh, applicant will be eligible for a permit in 45 days. Okay. Motion's been made. Is there a second? second. Motion's been made and properly seconded. Any more discussion? Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Opposed? No. no. Five to two. So what we did, you were eligible, you should not rent, post, or anything until 45 days, and in 45 days you will be eligible to apply. Not that you will have a permit, you will only be eligible to apply. So talk to codes. All right, I appreciate it. Thanks. Mr. Herbert. Mr. Chairman, based upon deferrals yeah. and yeah. et cetera, this is the last case we're getting ready to hear on today's agenda. Uh, case number 2017-255, Clay Curtis, appellant and JG Tennessee Realty LP owner of the property located at 2400 Gallatin Pike requesting a variance from the rear retaining wall in the CS district to add a sign to the retaining wall. Referred to the board under section 1704060, the appellant is alleged that the board would have jurisdiction under 1740-180B. In short, this one, retaining walls and fences, signs are not allowed on retaining walls and, and fences. Um, beyond that, we don't have a position on this, just stating the basis. Sir, seeing no one else out there, I assume that there's no opposition I'm to in. your case. I'm uh, in. You got 10 minutes. I'll be quick. Uh, Clay Curtis, 1720 Ed Temple Boulevard. And uh, we have a client, uh, and maybe you guys have seen the new beautiful building of Toyota there off of Vietnam Veterans. Um, of course, that there is no exit to Vietnam Veterans or to the Toyota from that Vietnam Veterans. But what I've got is my client, Toyota Corporate, has seen Mercedes put up a sign on a retaining wall and they feel as if that's going to be the most beautiful way for them to get the same type of advertising. I'm not sure if that's on well, a retaining wall. It's, a, it's above the roof line, but maybe not on a retaining wall. No, sir. Wall. It's a retaining wall. I have a picture of it if you'd like. You're talking about the one? Off of 40. There's a retaining wall with Mercedes-Benz, big as life. Oh, I know awesome. what you're talking about now, the words Mercedes-Benz. Yes, sir. But that didn't come in front of us. Well, the, sign, the, 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 the symbol did, but not the words. Huh. Yes. Well, that's what we're dealing with here today, uh, okay. is they don't allow it on retaining walls. Uh, so the variance is basically what we've got is on that piece of property. This, well, I this think uh, Nick Saban will be here this weekend playing my Commodore's uh, sure. code department. <laughs> can you uh, talk can to him we while can send a message. Down? We can send a message. Uh, the Mercedes dealership. We have uh, on, on the on the property, that's the photo of the front of the building. On the back of the property, there is a very large, the, the first proposal was to put a pylon sign in the back of the property. Sure. There you go. Um, that uh, to the right of this property, there is a big uh, billboard sign, um, and it just would almost kind of muck it up, really. So what uh, Toyota is asking and, and uh, for us to look at is just going with a very small, quaint little... Uh, How small is this sign? It's... it's and I know the foot candles of it, by the way. Oh, see, Found there's that out a for sign you, Just person. in case. 
And of course, if somebody jumped off the bridge, the other person has <laughs> That's to right. jump off a bridge. Opens can of worms. However, we are looking at 25 feet by 4 feet, 100 square feet total. Okay. Um, and so, basically, the the proposal that they're making for for your consideration is giving them some way to indicate what that building is. Um, if you going down Vietnam veterans, you'll see other people's signs all the way down there, and and this is just the the, the cleaner, nicer looking way of doing it, really, without putting a bill or a uh, pylon sign back there. And uh, mucking out the How property. far off the ground is this going to be? Uh, roughly about eight to ten feet. There's there's actually quite a bit of grass uh, that's not illustrated except in those black and whites in the, at the bottom. There's actually this will quite be a bit lit, like you said, obviously kennel. Yes, sir. Okay. So are are you allowed by right to put a pylon sign <coughs> back there? No. Yes. Sir. Well. Yes, sir. You can't. Well, why why are they here, Mr. Herbert? It's my understanding that the request is to, to put it on the put a sign on the retaining wall. So there's an, and so under the sign code, it, it says that you can have building signs and you can have monument signs and ground signs, but there's no there's no sign category for a sign on a, a retaining wall or, or, or a fence. We're not taking a position on this at all. It's just something that's not it's not spelled out specifically in the in the oh, code. So it's just kind of silent. So they're like, okay, yeah. give it to the B. Yeah, so it's where right. the code is silent to a sign on a retaining wall. So just somebody tell me what it is we have to find to allow it or not allow it. I mean, so, there's so got to be some finding of fact, surely. So we we denied it because it's not in the code. Exactly. So it'd be a, That's a finding. Cool. So it'd be a variance. So it would just it would be a variance. So there has to be a hardship. See, I could, I could say Nick Saban's name because John Michael isn't here today. He would be very mad at I mean, I'm, I'm not trying to be difficult. I just want to know what it is we have to find. It seems to me that if, if there was going to be a, a hardship, it might be that that it, it is a preferable solution in terms of to a billboard. however you want to to do that. So it's a topographic issue? Great. And it, All right. I actually had two different hardships, one being visibility, but beautification, too. It, oh. you're, you're really, if you're stacking up a bunch of uh, pylon signs and, and billboards right there, it's just a let, me, let me ask a question of uh, zoning. Did you say before, and I apologize, I'm really tired here, so yeah. hopefully this <laughs> comes out right. Sugar fresh. Yeah. As are we. Yeah. Did you say that they could, they can have a monument sign, and a monument sign can be on a brick wall that's freestanding. Is that right? No. No? No. Still not right. No. Uh, so we've got building signs, and we've got ground signs. Okay, so what do you say? what's a ground sign to you? Like a monument sign. Yeah. That could be a, a brick wall. Or a but to, to, I think what he's saying here is this is aesthetically better. It's I, I, okay, keep going. I, just okay. you're, I cut you off. I'm sorry. So if for us in applying the sign code, mm -hmm. there's no provision for a sign to go on a retaining wall. Mm -hmm. But a monument sign sometimes is on a brick <coughs> Brick wall that's freestanding. I've Sorry. seen this. Right? Yeah, so if you were on a building, just one really, really, really long monument. Yes, <laughs> it's. It, we do it all the time. So yes. Okay. Well. But haven't you all seen brick walls with? Yes, that's, a wall, that's, not a that's a wall on a building. No, no, no. But I've seen you know brick. I don't know what to call it. Um, Brick little, like eight feet wide, yeah. eight feet long brick little walls with signage on it. What do you mean by a, a monument sign? Well, probably a lot like what Ms. Karpenick is oh. describing. Okay. So, okay, so you've made your case. Any other questions for the applicant? Well, if he proposed a eight foot long <laughs> little brick wall with a but sign on it. Not the same exposure. With, with, that sat in front of this retaining wall. Would that have been accepted? 
I don't know, but the concept, it probably would be acceptable. No, but the, the whole issue is this technically is just, we're code silent about it. So we're not saying you could do this or you can't do it. There's no law one way or the other about this, so that's why it's here. They punted it to us. Well, I think the point was, was that it, it was a, with a very minor modification, it would be, it would even be here, and so why, well, it, it, it's like those cases where we make people build, or we've said people don't have to build a wall behind their cement wall that, you know, I'm I mean, just, it, it seems like a, it's a no-brainer. I'm just, okay. We just I, have to find a hardship. So. I'll say, you want me to try? Yeah. Okay. Ahead. I'll move that the hardship is that this type of. Topography. No, it's not topography, really. It's just this um, type of way of having the signage done <laughs> is uh, not defined in the building code, in the zoning code. I am so tired. <laughs> and this is on TV. Oh, my gosh. But <laughs> did that make any sense? Um, some. Do you want to, Mr. Taylor? Well, I'm, it, I'm Microphone. Yeah, yeah sorry, thanks. Yeah, I'll, I mean, I'll move that, that um, we approve the variance for the rear retaining wall because uh, the conditions under section 17.04.060 have been met and uh, specifically relating to the topography of the site. Ah, excellent, I will second that. Any more discussion? I'll go with it. Yes. Not. <laughs> Seeing none, all those in favor signify by saying aye. Aye. Oppose. <laughs> Passes unanimously. Thank you for Thank having you. a car dealership in Davidson County, not across the county line in Andersonville. Sell a bunch of expensive cars. Bring us some tax dollars. Thank you for being here. We'll Good see night. you all soon. <laughs> this concludes the Board of Zoning Appeals. <laughs> 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 this has been a service of the Metro National Network. If you would like to see this presentation again, or for more information about this and other programs, visit Nashville.gov.